this recording has started uh, and over to you Balihar to start the meeting. Okay, great. Thank you, uh, Montu. Uh, well, welcome colleagues. Um, um, can I just say that uh, it is wonderful to have uh, uh, people joining us from uh, across across the uh, across the world here uh, for what I should be what should be a really exciting day of uh, workshop around some really critical issues. Uh, worth mentioning that this is a, a, a collaboration of Cambridge and Kent uh, to, to in, in presenting this workshop. Um, and we've got uh, some really great colleagues, uh, speakers, uh, on to talking on issues around uh, the post-Soviet space on uh, political economy, looking at issues around uh, neoliberalism, inequality, uh, the nature of capitalism and uh, labour transformation. And I think this workshop is a timely intervention uh, after almost 30 years of, uh, uh, of independence and neoliberal reforms that have taken place in the region. It's a time for us to reflect on the nature of those changes, to assess whether uh, what, uh, 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 what benefits they have produced, but also what have been some of the harms that they have generated. And I think there will be space for, to have a dialogue around those issues. Um, our speakers are varied and they will uh, address specific issues around the nature of political economy from their particular perspectives. And I think this workshop will provide that kind of engagement and interaction by which we can further interrogate those key issues. Um, and just in terms of the uh, format um, of the uh, of, of the each, each each of the presentations, uh, the way it will occur is that each speaker will uh, will present their work for thirty minutes, and then there will be an opportunity to discuss uh, uh, and ask questions for a further fifteen minutes. Um, I, th I hope that this is the start of a conversation and not the end. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope that this is one of many opportunities that we will get to interrogate the nature of capitalism, neoliberalism, inequalities that have, uh, uh, that have taken place in Central Asia. All too often, Sadly, these issues are sadly uh, are neglected, and uh, as I said, I think this workshop, kindly hosted by Cambridge, is a wonderful opportunity for us to to have this more informed and critical dialogue that's much needed. So, with that, I will hand over to Wantu, uh, and um, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Balihar. And we are uh, we from Cambridge and Asia Forum. We're delighted to host this this particular and very timely meeting. And and the uh, as as uh, Balihar has already kind of highlighted uh, the fact that this is a um, opportune <laughs> moment to start a dialogue. Uh, but uh, as as the title states, it's a it's a critical uh, assessment of things, and and then I think. Uh, there has already been a discussion, uh, uh, or, or how to say, a, a um, noise about the fact that why 30 years? <laughs> uh, what is so special about the 30 years? And, and so, so, so just want to reflect on that, that it's actually, uh, you know, how the anniversaries are part of a neoliberal <laughs> reform and, and, and a Hallmark card company generated <laughs> uh, template in some sense. So we, we, we're not falling for that, despite the fact that... They, they, Despite the fact that there, we are titling it 30 years, what is important to note is that, that these 30 years have had very specific, uh, you know, time periods where specific changes have occurred, and and enough time has passed from certain events to be able to evaluate them critically. Rather than, so so we tend to stay away from uh, doing events which are how to say, um, 
uh, has re uh, current events. We are not a current affairs kind of a uh, group of people. We, we prefer to to do things which are uh, um, uh, have been had a time to to uh, you know uh, think through. Uh, one of the things from our perspective, uh, uh, from my actually rather perspective than ours, is that the this particular workshop. Uh, this launch of this year's, in a sense, events, this academic year's events. Uh, uh, we teach a paper uh, um, on Central Asia and Caucasus and, and development in the region. Uh, so some of our, our PhD students and, and, and MPhil students, those who were here in the past, but also those who might be starting or joining in, so it, it's kind of a, uh, it has an introductory nature uh, in that sense. Uh, at the research level, what I like to say is that the, the, we are in Center for Development Studies, which, which kind of is a foundation is, is political economy uh, as part of the course. However, we engage very strongly with both the, the historical past and, and, uh, and, and in, in many ways, the culture, economics, science and technology, industry, all are the things that we look at. And within that, my particular interest uh, uh, today is also, and, and you will hear a little bit about uh, this from, uh, or, or in fact a lot about this from Jokan uh, uh that the idea of production uh, uh, is something that we really like to focus on. So the economic discussion often uh, uh, kind of leaves that aspect alone and, and, and resides in ideology and, and critical nature of the ideology. We want to see that how these ideologies emerge and how within the region this uh, notion of uh, in the last 30 years how the ex extractive essence has kind of set in and and how that is fueled and uh, is something we want to see how how it came to be and i hope that will be the beginning uh, in in many ways today uh, of that conversation of course the phd students and masters students who have heard me talk about this a lot uh, and i really like to dig into that so you'll hear uh, my voice a lot uh, today because I like to learn uh, and, and question the speakers and engage in debate. So uh, with this, we'd like to more or less bring Kuwait in, who's our, our, our first speaker. Uh, um, and uh, Baliha, would you like to, to kind of uh, say a couple of words about him and, and then we get started? Yeah, I mean, Kuwait is, uh, is, a, is, a, is what I would call a, a new talented scholar. Uh, uh, who just recently, well, a couple of years ago, uh, completed his, uh, his PhD here in the UK. And he's doing some exciting work around financialization and neoliberalism. And uh, I had the privilege of meeting him a couple of years ago. And, uh, and when we were first uh, devising this uh, workshop, uh, he, was, he was one of the first people that I wanted to bring on board. So with that, Quad, I'll leave it to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Balihar and uh, uh, Sidhart, for very kind words. Indeed, I am really excited uh, to take part in this uh, presentation, uh, in this workshop, and to present. Uh, so let me uh, share my screen, first of all. Um, so as our speakers mentioned already, 30 years, well, it's not only about neoliberal reforms in our area, in um, Post-Soviet, almost all post-Soviet countries now uh, celebrate this year the 30 years anniversary of the collapse of Soviet Union and gaining and regaining independence. So this is a, indeed a special uh, number for us. Okay, so I will talk about uh, neoliberal governance in Kazakhstan. Uh, I will mention some uh, versions of how it originated, the neoliberal, neo, uh, neoliberal governance, the processes itself, and some results probably. Okay, this is the yeah, quick overview. As I said, uh, some uh, hypothesis, how it was originated and there is nothing. What could you project your presentation so it can? Oh, sorry, yeah. Good. Okay. Uh, I will describe as an example, some examples of neoliberal history. I, I will particularly uh, focus on three cases which are uh, over emphasis on economic growth, microcrediting, and competitiveness. So, uh, do you see the screen properly? Yeah? Okay. So, uh, neoliberal ideology dominance Kazakhstan is nothing new. 
it has happened in many countries, uh, not only in post-Soviet countries, beginning from the late 1980s and early 1990s. And they all mostly uh, included things like deregulation, privatization, financial liberalization, and withdrawal of the state from social protection. That was uh, indeed very different from what has happened in many, uh, what had happened in many countries during the so-called golden age of capitalism, when the Brit Britain Woods uh, financial institutions uh, were in place with the Keynes in micro uh, demand management and where welfare distributive mechanisms. So uh, I will not go into the details, but uh, most of the uh, scholars would agree that uh, neoliberal ideology and its dominance is a kind of uh, promotion of class interest um, in the new areas, especially. So in case of Kazakhstan, I have to highlight that uh, what, has, what has happened that uh, in especially, especially in the early 1990s as the wave from late 1980s as a, some kind of a continuation of the uh, you know, politics of Glasnost and Perestroika, uh, the turn into capitalist market dynamics was uh, associated with democratization. And democratization, democratization, democratization wave was pretty much strong in countries like Kazakhstan and Russia. Uh, but as it happened in some countries, especially in South Korea, at least when I compared it, uh, we can argue that uh, to some extent, uh, democratization was hijacked by uh, neoliberal restructuring. So somewhere in the early 1990s, uh, you can see, for example, countries like Kazakhstan and Russia in many uh, senses, you know, uh, followed the same politics and, and, and policy making. So in Russia, for example, Boris Yeltsin uh, dissolved parliament in October, 1993. And just in a few months, uh, a little bit uh, in another way, there was a dissolution of the parliament of self dissolution because it was MPs themselves who declared that they need to dissolve parliament in order to give away as an official uh, explanation for the more progressive reforms. So, but uh, even this new parliament, when the elections took place in March 1994, uh, it existed only for, for, more than, for less than a year. And then uh, again, in that case, in, back in 1995, the parliament was dissolved by the decision of a court because uh, 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 MP or to be MP, uh, uh, someone called um, Tatiana Kvetkovska filed a suit case in a in a court, uh, basically that was some kind of a judicial equilibrium, equilibristic uh, that uh, her rights uh, uh, were not protected during you know because of some uh, uh, structural cases in the election law. So the most competent and professional courts, you know, declared that you know the whole world may be uh, ruined, but the truth should come into into force. And so, yes, the, the parliament was dissolved, but uh, again, the new parliament in 1995 uh, already, yeah, so during this year, there was a kind of, again, this is, this is a context, but the main idea is that uh, this first uh, uh, years of 1990s, there was a kind of change in the mood for the population that there was a lot of arg arguments that, you know, uh, for, for, the, for countries like Kazakhstan, for example, and Russia or in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan, what we need is a strong hand because there's so many reforms, you know, there are so many uh, structural reforms and, and we need to change the country and especially to, to, to implement the, those uh, market-oriented reforms. And there were propaganda-style stories about uh, apparently uh, progressive reforms implemented by people like Pinochet uh, very, you know, uh, nice stories about Chicago boys, uh, people who do not talk in parliament, but they do things, you know. So gradually there was epistemological shift towards, you know, that all we need to do is to implement these market-oriented reforms and then everything will be fine. Uh, I remember professors, uh, you know, running and screaming that, that it, it is all about, you know, in, invisible hand. So another important thing to remember as a context and a historical context is that the a new constitution was uh, implemented uh, at the referendum, was accepted at the referendum in 1995, with a very strong presidential powers, okay? And, and so what has happened is that, you know, we can say that gradually there was a kind of uh, depolitization employed as a fundamental approach to implement those reforms. 
so uh, as you can see, for example, th this is the very first book of our uh, first president, Ruslan Nazarbayev. It, it is translated literally as uh, without the rights and the left. So basically the whole context and atmosphere was that, you know, we need reforms, we need progressive reforms and it's, it's not, it's time not for talking, it's time for doing something. So there's no time for problem, problematizing something about, you know, politicizing, let's do it. And so this depolitization has, has been, uh, you know, has been lasting for the last 20, 25, 30 years, okay, to help to, you know, to legitimize, first of all, those uh, free market ideas and neoliberal regime, and especially in case of Kazakhstan, uh, foreign direct uh, foreign direct investment driving development when it was all about attracting foreign investment and foreign capital. But basically it was to legitimize again to, and to uh, accept this scheme of global capital markets. Okay, um, so in, in Kazakhstan, uh, again, like in many, in dozens of other countries, uh, the neoliberal reforms include privatization of state-owned industries, trade and price liberalization, shock therapy and in 2015 we joined WTO which was declared as a as a great victory uh as a, again as i mentioned for the last more than 20 years we practice uh, extreme case of monetarism there is a constant case uh, for pension privatization uh Kazakhstan in some cases as some experts says have implemented even more radical neoliberal reforms than some countries. For example, for the last 20 years already, we have a flat, uh, a flat tax rate in Kazakhstan, uh, a nominal corporate tax rate. In, uh, the, 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 uh, the taxation rate in Kazakhstan is 10%, and the same is about uh, corporate tax rates. So in Kazakhstan, it's 10% compared with uh, uh, something like 20 and 38% in other countries. Okay, so you see it's a very much, uh, uh, market friendly and market uh, and uh, foreign investment, foreign investors friendly. Sorry, I can't move my next page. Why is that? What happened, Kurt? I can't. Uh, ah, no. I can move the next page. Okay. So the some outcomes of these market oriented policies is that unfortunately we can argue that before, at least before oil booms, before 2000 and 2008, the so-called, uh, you know, uh, prosperous years, uh, which took place in Kazakhstan and Russia, when prices for, for oil were high, those reforms did not bring stability and prosperity, at least for the majority. Yeah, we experienced a very harsh shock therapy with devastating effects, uh, for, the, for example, for uh, human development index, we dropped in, uh, tremendously compared with, for example, resource poor countries such as Belarus, the life expectancy declined, uh, mortality rate increased, and things like that. So uh, we will also can say that this mass privatization uh, weakened the state capabilities to, you know, to, to provide basic services, and uh, which is not the focus of my paper, but to some extent, it's also the basic of uh, neo-patrimonial regimes which originated in the Central Asian region. So to, to mostly we can argue that this is all about reproduction of capitalist new, neoliberal uh, mode of production, which took place in countries like Chile and Argentina in the 1990s and many other Latin American countries and African countries and, and even in Europe. So uh, I, I'm going to provide some examples uh, how this neoliberal global governance is embedded in, in Kazakhstan now. So these in, uh, examples include overemphasis on economic growth, which is constantly uh, implemented in Kazakhstan. It's like a you know it's like a slogan that it's all about economic growth, microcredit, and competitiveness. Okay. No. Problem with slides again? Yeah, it doesn't move. Uh, do you want to unshare and reshare, perhaps? Maybe. I don't know. Uh, sorry. 
let's try it in this mode yeah okay do, do you see it now we see it now yeah okay thank you so over emphasis on economic growth uh, first of all this over emphasis in the time of the so-called uh, uh, sustainable development talks yeah for the last 20 years when some uh, scholars and even politicians now talk about the need for the degrowth yeah that uh, grows and does not mean development not necessarily because uh, unfortunately growth may not be inclusive like in case of Kazakhstan for example and Russia so but this uh, emphasis over emphasis on economic growth justifies a very uh, predatory uh, extraction of mineral resources in Kazakhstan and so uh, the the output uh, in extracting mineral resources in oil and gas increased tremendously so you can see for example uh, the all the talks about resource curse uh, unfortunately the, the the resource curse was has not been avoided yeah uh, all the talks about diverse, diverse, the need for to diversify the economy is just the talks uh, Kazakhstan officially now is a resource based economy because officially uh, there, there is some numbers you know if your uh, total exports uh, from natural resources exceeds 40% uh, and reach about 70% then you are officially a resource based economy so we can say that there is a, a classical deindustrialization concern happening okay so uh, we also have as i already mentioned one of the most investor friendly regulation was low tax rates uh, we did uh, uh, established like in the best cases in Norway, the National Fund, this NFRK, National Fund of, of Kazakhstan, the Republic of Kazakhstan. But uh, you can see, even though we had a special law which stipulated that the, the money should not be used for special cases, but anyway, for example, in 2007, under the so-called stabilization program and the politics and policies of too big, too big to fail, four banks received 9 billion out of 10 billion of the stabilization package. So just four banks, uh, by the way, which were private banks, which are private banks. Uh, microcrediting is another mantra which is used in many countries and Kazakhstan is not exception. Uh, microcrediting is believed to, to help the poor, which is not necessarily the case because it is based on a minimalistic, minimalistic approach, excuse me. Uh, apparently this income generation you know, uh, is based on the idea that people should be self-employed and, and, and there should be self-reliance, you know, that it's your total responsibility, again, legitimizing the withdrawal of the state. Uh, but what we know for sure is that, at least in case of Kazakhstan, uh, uh, first of all, it's growing, yeah? Uh, in, by 2018, the overall indebtedness of the, of the population was about 200 billion tinge. Uh, which is almost like every family would have some kind of debt, you know, to, to be repaid. Uh, another problem is that this uh, microcredit is used in 90, more than 90% for the consumption purposes, yeah, for the everyday use, not to open new business, to create new business, as uh, sometimes it is claimed. And yes, uh, there are investigations, at least in my literature, showing that, you know, behind this microcredit is, are the interests of the uh, global financial um, institutions who you know lend this money uh, so competitiveness is, is another uh, favorable uh, fashionable idea in Kazakhstan which for the last few years uh, was uh, silenced more or less but I remember like in uh, what, how in 2000s it was very popular in the end again I remember to uh, you know 2000 2008 were the years of the booming economy again because of the high prices for oil so basically you can see that the dynamics wasn't too strong. We did reach the so-called 50 top 50th uh, ranking place uh, in uh, according to World Economic Forum's definition. However, uh, what I am showing in my paper is that uh, we have to remember that even this idea to to catch up with uh, to increase your competitiveness actually embed the country even deeper into this global uh, neoliberal. Uh, governance. Why? Because the definition of competitiveness includes such definition as the ability of a national economy to achieve sustained high rates of economic growth. And then the second part of this definition says that it should be, if you want to be in a fourth rate or in the fourth stage, you need to have an innovative economy. So for Kazakhstan, it's not enough 
to have this economic growth due to, for example, uh, high uh, prices for oil. We would, uh, we were condemned to be between uh, stage one and stage two because our economic growth is based on, again, on uh, extracting more and more uh, national resources. Okay, so uh, yes, as I said, Kazakhstan is classified as a factor driving economy. And this factor, unfortunately, is exporting natural resources. And there's little innovation, at, at least. And I'm also claim, uh, Ergen, that the, the report itself, the index does not, uh, would, does not uh, encourage, yeah, for, for countries like Kazakhstan to innovate because, you know, as soon as you have this economic growth, that's okay. Uh, you can be somewhere between 40th and 60th place. Okay, so some results. Uh, the, the main result for, for this neoliberal uh, restructure in Kazakhstan for the last 30 years is that we have a completely different distributional pattern. Of course, it's it, objectively, it should be different because Kazakhstan used to be a socialist country with comparatively egalitarian distribution. Okay, someone would say, yeah, but it was a completely different country. I agree, but uh, market economy doesn't mean uh, you know, having this predatory capitalist mode of governance. So, which we have in Kazakhstan, when 50 richest persons own about 42% of the total wealth of adult population. Yeah, we have 0.001% out of 18 million people who are worth more than 50 million people. And yet, um, as, uh, you know, even as uh, official newspapers admits, the only 3.5% of the adult population, which is less than 400 people, earn more than $10,000 a year, um, which is, you know, very low, uh, you know, income, I would say. For the, for the, as you can see, most of the population do not, are not paid a distant salary. Okay, some concluding remarks. So uh, we should consider this neoliberal governance and its embeddedness into, into the Kazakh, Kazakh political economy system as a social organization of the ruling class uh, in a particular historical moment, yeah? When it was able to mobilize, very often these actions took place on the na national and global levels. So for the sake of time, I do not describe some policies prescribed by World Bank, by IMF, it is, well, it is all well known. Um, uh, the main point is that this neoliberal capitalist mode of production uh, created an, uh, unbelievable opportunities for private profits accumulation, which is still happening in Kazakhstan, like in many examples shows with, uh, for example, with helping these four private banks and many other examples. We have a classical uh, housing booms uh, in Kazakhstan when people do not have anything, uh, you know, to invest into, only those banks invest and are interested in this housing boom. Uh, basically, this is all, and thank you for your attention. I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Should I? Yes, no, no. You you, you can you, you can uh, uh, unshare if you like. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, uh, are are there um, any questions you can raise your hand uh, or uh, let me know through the chat and I will unmute you to ask the question. Uh, there was one, uh, let me see if I can find. So, uh, was begging, would you like to ask a question? So came, we'll ask in the chat first, and then I'll move to other people who have raised their hands. Yeah. No. Okay. So we, the, in this case, we move to uh, to to Hassan, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Kwad. Thanks. I sort of really enjoyed that. Uh, just sort of wondering if you could speak a little bit more on who the international financial advisors were in the early 1990s. I know in Russia it was. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs, Harvard economists, and I believe uh, Singapore leadership was also visiting uh, Kazakhstan. Um, I believe so, at least in the early 1990s. And and you know, if you could, you know, if you have some information on that, if you can tell us a little bit more about um, 
sort of what they were saying, uh, how much traction those ideas had amongst uh, the, the, the elite. I'd be really interested. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Hassan. Yeah, uh, a really interesting question. I should include this point, by the way, this personalities probably. So yeah, um, first of all, uh, I sometimes use the term uh, twin brothers for Kazakhstan and Russia, even though they are uncomparable in terms of size of the economy, but there are so many similarities. So in, in Kazakhstan, we did use some ad advice, uh, you know, advice from Russia. And if we, I do not remember the exact names, but there was a guy, um, I do remember that, for example, in Kyrgyzstan, officially, there was Osland. Uh, what's his name? Uh, I don't remember. I met him once in Washington, D.C. So to me, he was a, like a classical neoliberal who openly said that, you know, you guys shouldn't try to do anything with this industrialization. You are blessed with oil, so keep, keep pumping. It's all about comparative advantage. Yeah, I, I met him and it was very straightforward. Yeah. But I do remember that in 2000, at least, Michael Porter uh, attended, uh, visited Kazakhstan. So our technocrats were fascinated that this guy is coming to Kazakhstan. He was invited, of course, to Kazakhstan officially. And that was the time when we kind of officially declared that one of the economic, uh, our economic ideology would include this, uh, you know, fashionable idea about competitiveness. So for several years, it was all about competitiveness. And of course, uh, Michael Porter came, he said that uh, uh, it was only one day in Kazakhstan, you know, like as a pop star, signed a few books, met some people, officials, but he he did left some marks. Um, the, in, in the newspaper, there was a criticism that he uh, literally uh, repeated the words of some officials of those times saying like, you know, market economy is all about self-reliance, so you people you people in Kazakhstan, you know, should be grateful to your uh, government and just work harder, you know, everything will be fine. <laughs> this kind of, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe from today's uh, perspective is more or less clear and critical. Maybe at that time it was okay to hear that. But again, in terms of, uh, I use this word depolitization and I know that the next speaker, speaker Ilya, would also use. So I do believe that this uh, depolitization notion is very important for, for Kazakhstan and for, uh, for, for Central Asia, uh, for Eurasia in general, because it, it does, it aims for two goals. First, you know, is of emphasis on economic growth, which is not inclusive, for example, or uh, idea of competitiveness, you know, who benefit from this competitiveness, whether we have these reforms just for the sake of reforms or for what. Okay, so these questions have never been asked, I would say, I don't remember them at least. Uh, so I'm not sure if I answered your question. So yes, Oslo and Michael Porter, uh, among pop stars. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think in terms of, uh, uh, um, you know, advice and advisors, so they, they apart from the, the, the highlight ones, you know, you have several other, other uh, uh, ways to look at that, right? So you have, if you look at the whole structure of your particular case, so you have the, the sovereign wealth fund story and number of advisors embedded in that, in, uh, not only at the top level, but at each industry level. And, and whole corporate governance structures that, that were put in place and, and their meaning and who is on, on them. Uh, uh, I mean, one of the names that pops out is Richard Evans, yeah, uh, uh, for example, on, on Samra Kazina and who they bring in. So it's a much more complex story than just a straightforward one, yeah. Uh, sure, and top I, level, should yeah. Mention, yeah. I should mention that back in 1990s, Again, you know, we, we had few people speaking English or graduating from universities. And so people uh, kind of comparatively, like for our region, famous people like uh, Mr. Marchenka, who was a head of National Bank. So whenever you would come across his name, there was also always mentioned that he spent three months in Washington, D.C. <laughs> in some kind of uh, um, think tank. 
uh, back in 1993 or 1992. So it was a kind of, you know, uh, business card showing that, yeah, he is like uh, really equipped with knowledge. He's a technocrat. It's, he's, a, he's a doer, you know, it's not about parliament. It's not about politics, you know. So we have this, you know, right kind of uh, policies. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ilya, uh, please. Thank you. So, hello, Kuat, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, so, it's interesting that uh, Kazakhstan is sometimes presented as a success story to, to Russians because uh, the reforms were carried out more consistently in Kazakhstan than in Russia. So, my question is uh, what is the current situation with economic growth? In Kazakhstan, because uh, in Russia we have uh, stagnation uh, for the last maybe 10 years and the prospects are really bad. So, is Kazakhstan more successful in these purely economic terms? So, how would you assess that? Thank you, Lia. Uh, really brilliant question. I like the word consistently, it has a very kind of progressive con uh, uh, con um, meaning. So yeah, Kazakhstan has been consistent in implementing neoliberal reforms. In, even in Russia, yeah, because of some political context, different political contexts, the ruling class could not and still cannot afford to be as cruel, I would say, because you have a, a bigger a potential voting support from elderly. So I do remember those, uh, you know, and these words were like kind of, we were very proud of the 2000s that look, uh, we all run uh, Russia. And yes, indeed, back in 2014, answering your question about the economic growth and what is the situation. The situation is unstable because it's uh, the, uh, the, the, the political lead is very consistent with those reforms. It's still about privatization, it's still about controlling inflation at any cost. And uh, I remember that back in 2014, so oh, was it 2014 or 2010? So Kazakhstan for the first time, Kazakh GDP per capita officially put by World Bank was higher, a little bit higher than Russia, but it lasted only for a year or two, okay? And then unfortunately this miracle, this um, um, it, it just disappeared, yeah. So this is the answer. It's very unstable. Because we, we are consistent with our reforms, but unfortunately, uh, I would say that, yeah, the Kazakh economy has been stagnating along with the Russian one. Yeah. Thank you. Balihar. Okay. Oh, hi. Yes, thanks, uh, Quat. Um, I wonder, Quat, if you can uh, just say something a bit more about what you think have been the, the consequences of the inequality uh, in, in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm just shocked about the level of the, of the, of the concentration of wealth that you, that you mentioned. Um, I was just wondering, how do you think the, the local population in, in Kazakhstan react to this? Uh, and both in terms of how they see this, in uh, this, this, this huge disparity. And why do you think the state has been fairly successful, I think, in maintaining its critical regime in, 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 uh, over, over, over the population? Uh, thank you, Balihar, for this uh, very important question. Uh, first of all, again, um, to me, it was very eye-opening to discover back in 2015 and in 2014 when I started my research, uh, when I started my doctoral degree, that yes, actually, and that was one of the reasons actually I focused on income and wealth inequality, is that, you know, uh, in the words of um, Professor Atkinson from Great Britain, back in 2000, she said something like, uh, it's time to take inequality out of codes. So this is an acceptance of idea that, you know, because of, I can, we, of course we can argue why on, on the reasons why, but basically 
even I say even in Western countries, this uh, one of these uh, consequences of the neoliberal shift in politics and everywhere was this epistemological shift. And from 1970s, 1980s, there was an idea that there's no such problem as inequality. You know, we shouldn't focus on it. And people, I, I read an interview by um, Milanovic, uh, Branko Milanovic, who is an ethnology expert in Indian inequality. So he recalls that back in 1980s, when he started his uh, research, he couldn't find this official economic uh, journals uh, number, uh, uh, what's this called, code for inequality. inequality. So it, it just didn't exist. He said that, you know, it was officially admitted that there's no such problem as inequality. You could, you know, make your research about poverty, but inequality wasn't considered as a problem. And indeed, politicians such as Margaret Thatcher would even say, like, I remember she said, like, we, we should enjoy inequality, you know, we should glorify it because inequality helps it, it encourage competitiveness and, and, and things. So in Kazakhstan, we have these classical things, unfortunately. I'm surprised that people themselves, uh, maybe it's not that good example, but in the worst uh, style of uh, Soviet Union propaganda, people do not believe in inequality, mostly. As they, they think this is like normal. Because you know, for 30 years you, you've been told that this is how market economy works. This is about capitalism. You know, this is about self-reliance. So some people are happier, or sorry, luckier. Well, of course, people understand why they are like it, but they do not question the roots of whether it is normal, you know, to have this kind of outrageous level of inequality. When back in 1980s, uh, we would be surprised to find out what's going on in Brazil or in in the United States, and yet. Less just in less than one generation, it became something equal. So yes, I would say as answering your question that the Catholic authorities were very successful, maybe undeliberately, maybe deliberately legitimizing the status quo, saying that this is normal, you know, uh, it's just, you know, how things happen. Look everywhere, it's everywhere in equality. So again, uh, I've read this a new, uh, we have a new think tank in Kazakhstan official governmental body, which is responsible for the for the reforms, like back in 1990s, agency for, for reform something. And I read their program and there is no mention income and wealth inequality whatsoever at all, completely. There's, in Russian, there's some uh, word inequality is mentioned once in one paragraph, in one sentence. It's just, you know, reference as usual reference during the pandemic, you know, inequality is something like that. Saying like reference, implying that it's all about pandemic and that's all. And no, any kind of policies and politics about, you know, how to deal with inequality. Because indeed, I believe that that will, if we ask this question, that will shatter the fundamental basis of this economic ideology and probably the political regime. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kua, there is a question uh, uh, from Jan, uh, she, uh, not able to speak uh, for some reason uh, uh, because of Mike. Would, would you like to answer that question? Can you see it or should I read it to you? Yeah. Should I read this question? Yeah, if you uh, like. Yeah. With rise of inequality, there should be counter force such as left political activism into intellectualism, something that happened in late Tsarist Russia. Uh, okay, yet there is no solid or coherent left counter response to current neoliberal dominance in Kazakhstan, at least in the mainstream. Why is it the case? Do local reactionary and identitarian ideologies of conservatism, nationalism prevent the emergence of leftist thinking? Or does the country lack general historical experience with left ideologies like in Western European countries? Then we have the next question by Philip Yeager, who is in the library and can't speak either. So, uh, excellent question about you know. First of all, I would say that again, Kazakhstan kind of overslept this political movements going on <laughs> the global. There, there was a rise of the left, yeah, in in, in two thousands and even now, and o Occupy Wall Street, not but not in Kazakhstan, okay. So yes, I think again. Uh, uh, our churches were pretty much successful in discrediting any ideas of leftist movement. If someone is saying, still, like I remember in 1990s, they would, you know, you would laugh, like if someone would say, I'm socialist, like I'm leftist, they would think he's a crazy, you know, Marxist or something. 
And the still things happening in Kazakhstan. Whereas now, you know, at least the youth in, in, in universities is like, it's most fashionable and very credible idea. Not, but this is not the case in Kazakhstan. And again, the, even the, uh, so, social democratic, social democratic ideas were discredited because one of the so-called uh, dissident, who was a close ally of uh, President Nazarbayev, Zara uh, Mahamdouyakbay, he named his party when he opted out from the power, Social Democratic Party. So probably this again, this because people didn't see any difference. There, there wasn't any kind of moving towards leftist politics. Uh, so yeah, I think, you know, we even have this slogan in Kazakhstan, wake up Kazakhs, you know, it's a slogan, uh, it, it's a slogan first introduced back in 19, uh, in, in Tsarist time, uh, in the late Tsarist time, you know, by Kazakh intellectuals who wanted, you know, people to, to be educated. So I'm afraid, I mean, I, I wouldn't like to have this Tsarist time movements, of course, because it ended up with a very bloody Bolshevik revolution. Uh, but at the time, I don't see, Maybe some individuals. We have one MP Parliament who is pretty much who is pretty much strong kind of leftist um, rhetoric, rhetoric in, in his speeches, uh, but no more. I don't know. Uh, I do I do see it in Russia, but in Russia even uh, you know this they have this uh, communist party which has been in Parliament for for the last twenty years. So people are kind of used to it, but it's still old generation of this Soviet style uh, left, not uh, not the modern one. Thank you. Could I still read the second question? Yes, Philip Yeager's question, please. Uh, could you comment on the 90% spending on consumption in private indebtedness? As I experienced in, in the beginning of 2010s, Kazakh families pool their resources, for example, for life cycle rituals. Would you say that lending money from banks had risen in the recent years? How is this perceived inside the family? Uh, yes, indeed, uh, all estimates shows that uh, microcredit is getting popular, not because people become more entrepreneurial, not because they open more businesses. No, it's because, uh, as Leah mentioned, economy is stagnating, uh, general income is declining. And there's a lot of criticism, again, very um, um, uh, paternalistic, you know, teaching from, from the authority saying, why are you borrowing money to, you know, to celebrate, uh, you, you know, this... Uh, the uh, birthday parties or, you know, the marriage parties. Yes, there is a case of, of this, but at the root of the problem is not because people are so stupid, you know, and get got into the debt trap because they want to celebrate parties. Uh, the root problem is a general, very low income in Kazakhstan. And I believe that for the last time with the new president, there is understanding officially, at least they're trying to do something and increase in salaries of teachers and some university lecturers. Uh, so, but it's very slow, we should say, it's very slow. Uh, Claude, I, I, I had a, um, a not even a question, it's sort of like, if you can reflect on this thing. So, what, one of the things that you brought up in your, in your talk was about Kazakhstan being officially a resource economy, in a sense, right? And uh, that's, that's a thing that, uh, structurally speaking, so when countries set up things like sovereign wealth funds, uh, are these symptoms of a kind of a thinking that they are going to become a resource economy? And, you know, there's a history of how sovereign wealth funds were created and uh, retained globally. And then those who aspire to do that then are thinking or being advised to move in the direction. Do you think that was the case in Kazakhstan and Central Asia and Russia even for that matter? Okay, uh, to be fair, we have to admit that uh, our authorities and technocrats at the very beginning, back in 1990s and still now, um, stated that this is one of the main goals, you know, to diversify the economy. So there were even some accusations because we were, you know, part of the Soviet Union. There were deliberate policies not to diversify economy. But the truth is that, unfortunately, or fortunately, is that back by 19. 1989 or 1991, Kazakh economy was much more diversified. Of course, it was in a very kind of socialist mood, you know, not very competitive, but this is the case at least. So, uh, so the, the official policies uh, in Kazakhstan, economic policies, were very contradictory in terms of, on the one hand, saying we need to diversify the economy, on the other hand, uh, openly 
stating that you know our economic growth is based on the ability to export more and so the whole foreign policy was about attracting more foreign investments and so i mean for uh, economic policies attracting more investment even with understanding that 99 percent of this investment for goes not into new industries or businesses but just to uh, uh from the oil companies you know, like chevron for example. And, and so uh, it was it, it is openly admitted that the whole economic growth is based on extracting more and more and uh hopefully new uh new oil refineries would ah we even by the way we even haven't uh, opened new refinery uh, in Kazakhstan for the last 20 years even though there have been so many folks we even do yeah. not uh, uh pr produce our own uh, gasoline you know uh, petroleum you see so uh the 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 structural forces the class uh, the sectoral interests are so strong that they even cannot overcome uh they, they do not allow you know for this very much obvious things to do to take place in order to diversify the economy yes i mean the the again looking at systematically you have that problem stemming from if you look at specifically the mining area and also also agriculture sector so you effectively have uh, even you know the 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 mono industry cities as we as we call them the combinats and 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 how that has slowly or not even sorry 30 years is not that that, that long a time quite quickly uh, uh it become irrelevant as contributors right so the uh, uh, and that that whole thing in terms of modernization and and reform uh, it's kind of surprising that how the money that has come in from the extractive industry has not been put back into it to modernize it right so that that contradiction also is quite stark yeah. exactly and we have created this a potential very dangerous potential problems as you mentioned from the soviet times we had this uh, a lot of uh, dozens of even more mono mono cities yeah the, the small towns which rely relies on one industry i mean this is not like something unique for kazakhstan but still and so little was done to diversify economy and the, the worst thing is that those industries the local industries or if, um, how do you call this oil um uh, swells or how to go you know they are they are getting uh, depleted now and you know uh, so potentially we have dozens of towns where people just literally don't have place to drop it's like you know when the the uh, mine coal is closed uh, for for the town compared to a big one like timirtau for example or karaganda that is really you know affects the whole country we yeah. do have booming cities three of them uh, nur sultan astana almaty and shimkent to some extent but this is because uh, people keep migrating to these three big cities yeah that's right uh, this, yeah. all right i think uh, we can thank kuat uh, for both a lively talk and discussion and uh, but here over to you to uh, announce our next speaker <laughs> Oh, thank yes. you very much. Thank you very much for your questions and everything. Thank, thank you, Kuat. I know you have to teach. <laughs> we'll see you I later. Yeah, you know. yeah. 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 And then, and, and just to kind of also uh, uh, give my thanks to to Kuat as well for really starting uh, this uh, workshop on a, on a really positive note. So, so, so thank you, Kuat. So our next speaker is uh, is Ilya. Uh, when I asked uh, a, a highly esteemed scholar uh, on on uh, uh, Russia. Uh, who would you recommend to offer a critical analysis of the uh, Russian economy? His immediate reaction was Ilya. Uh, so it's with great pleasure that we have Ilya uh, to kindly offer his analysis of the uh, uh, Russian economy. Um, we're saying here that Ilya is the Associate Professor and a Deputy Dean uh, at the Northwest Institute of Management. Uh, in uh, uh, of the Russian Presidential Academy of National Economy and Public Administration. Thank you, Ilya. Thank you so much. Thank you for the kind words. I will start my presentation. Just a second. Um, okay. Oh. 
All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about one particular aspect of uh, neoliberal governance, uh, rising inequality. And I think that uh, my talk uh, complements uh, Quad's presentation very well. So I will sort of develop certain uh, effects and consequences of neoliberal governance. Uh, uh, and I use Russia as an example. So uh, my first question is, why study inequality in Russia? Is there anything specific uh, to the Russian case? And I believe uh, there is. Russia is objectively one of the most unequal countries in the world. And uh, furthermore, as we will see, uh, Russians are very much in favor of uh, redistributive policies uh, by the state. So they want redistribution. They want uh, uh, a political economic governance that is different from what we have now. And yet uh, such redistributive policies have never materialized. So in the 20 years of Vladimir Putin's rule, uh, there was no change uh, from uh, the new liberal direction. And the question is, uh, how long uh, can this go on? So how long can this situation go on? Because we know that in other countries uh, with uh, high inequality in Latin America, for instance, there were periods of left populist governance and those left governance tried to reduce inequality, but we haven't seen anything like this in Russia where inequality is high and social tensions are very high and uh, people are frustrated and yet the government does not really change its uh, paradigm, its approach to economic governance. So this is the structure of uh, my talk. At first, uh, I, I will start by uh, talking about various estimates of income inequality in Russia. And in fact, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not simple to measure inequality. Uh, in Russia and in general, and there are conflicting uh, estimates of inequality, and we will discuss them. So the second part concerns uh, public perceptions of inequality. So what do people think about inequality in Russia? And uh, do they want redistribution? Do they want a planned economy? And uh, spoiler, spoiler alert, yes, they do want a planned economy instead of a market economy, paradoxically, after 30 years of a market economy. So uh, in the last section, I will cover the political debate on inequality. So uh, what do the official figures, public figures um, say about inequality? So what is their rhetoric on inequality? And how does the opposition reply to uh, what they say about inequality in Russia. So the explosion of income inequality in the early 90s. Uh, this is the point of consensus among all the researchers that inequality has risen dramatically in Russia in the early 90s. And these are official figures by the Russian Statistical Agency. So the income share of the top 20% was 32% uh, of all income in 1990, and it was 46% uh, of all income in 1995. So uh, if we speak about monetary income, the Soviet Union was one of the most equal countries in the world, and post-Soviet Russia very quickly became one of the most unequal countries in the world. So it was a very dramatic uh, transformation. And there are several reasons uh, given in, in the academic literature for this um, uh, rising inequality. So the first reason is more or less uh, benign. So increased returns on education. Uh, supposedly, the wages were compressed in the Soviet Union. So people with different skills uh, received more or less similar wages. And uh, mm, there was this process of decompression of wages uh, because people with higher skills, with higher levels of education, uh, began uh, receiving higher wages in the 90s. So this sort of artificial compressing of wages was eliminated uh, when Russia transitioned to the market economy. Uh, and then there was the gap between different economic sectors. So different sectors of the economy were affected by the transition to the market economy in a different way. 
For instance, finance actually uh, profited from this transition. So compensations and salaries in the financial sector were very high. But sectors like agriculture were completely destroyed by the transition. And, uh, 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 yeah, completely destroyed by uh, the transition and the salaries there were very low. So uh, different regions were also affected differently. Uh, salaries in Moscow, for instance, remained more or less okay, but salaries in many provincial parts of Russia uh, were extremely low in the 90s. So all this affected uh, inequality. Uh, then there is uh, the issue of wage arrears. In fact, uh, the non-payment of wages on time artificially increased uh, inequality levels, right, in, in the surveys because uh, the interviewers, the sociologists, they ask the question, so what was your salary in the last month? And people who did not receive the salary in the last month, they say zero, but some people actually received the salary for several months, right? Because, uh, because they were owed this salary. And so artificially inequality, you know, increased uh, in statistics, even though if we look at annual income, uh, it was more equal than the monthly income income because of this uh, volatility uh, in, uh, in uh, salaries. And finally, perhaps the biggest, the biggest explanation of rising inequality was the emergence of uh, the class of the super rich uh, as a result of uh, this very painful transition uh, to the market economy. So ultimately, if we look at the top 1%, top uh, 0.1 percent of uh, income earners so these were the people who benefited from uh, the emergence of this uh, uh, adventuristic uh, opportunistic type of capitalism uh, speculative uh, capitalism uh, that uh, deprived uh, the real economy of financing and all the money essentially was gained in financial speculation in rent seeking and activities uh, such as that and uh, the new class of very rich people emerged out of these activities. So this was the reason for rising inequality. However, if we look at uh, the subsequent period, the picture is not really clear. So this is uh, the data from the social surveys that I uh, sort of calculated myself. And if we take the raw data from three different surveys, uh, we see that uh, income inequality is actually decreasing. Uh, since the early 2000s. So it is a positive trend, supposedly, right? And uh, this result was rather surprising to me because I thought that inequality uh, has been increasing throughout the post-Soviet period. But again, if we look at the survey data, we don't see this. We see decreasing inequality. Uh, but we know that surveys underrepresent the richest um, um, households, you know, the, the top 1%, the top 0.1%. So in fact, uh, this picture sort of omits uh, the real, the real uh, beneficiaries of the transition. So the oligarchs, the, the super rich, and just simply the rich people, because the surveys obviously do not cover them, right? So we have alternative statistics. This is uh, the number of Russian billionaires that are on the Forbes list. And this is the total wealth of Russian billionaires on the Forbes list. And we see a rather dramatic rise of uh, the number of billionaires. So it is hard to reconcile, you know, this picture. So according to surveys, uh, inequality is decreasing, but according to, um, according to Forbes, this publication, <laughs> inequality should be actually increasing because the number of extremely rich people was increasing uh, throughout the 2000s, throughout Putin's uh, two first terms. So um, I put all the estimates, all the available estimates of inequality in Russia in one chart. And uh, the yellow line is the official Rostat figures. And uh, they use the survey data, but they also transform it in a, using certain mathematical procedures. And uh, according to the official data, inequality is higher, first of all. And also, there is a certain increase in inequality uh, in the 2000s, in these 10 years of strong economic growth. So it seems that 
economic growth generates rising inequality according to Rostat, according to the official statistical agency. But then if we look at the service, we don't see this, right? And this line, the blue line, is uh, um, the figures from uh, research by uh, Tama Pikiti and his team. They actually published um, an article on uh, Russia, on inequality in Russia. And what they did was uh, they combined uh, the survey data on inequality with the tax records that were published by the Russian tax agency. And uh, uh, using this procedure, they arrived at this estimate of inequality, which is very high, in fact. So inequality according to PKT and his team is much higher than according to the official figure or according to the raw survey data. But again, we cannot judge the trend because uh, the tax records uh, were being published since 2008. So this is the real data, let's say, starting in 2008. And uh, these numbers, I, I don't really understand how they arrived at these numbers and uh, they, they do not describe this and they, they have been criticized for it. So, so this part of uh, the chat is not uh, reliable, right? So what is reliable in the, is this part and we see that inequality is slightly decreasing. It's still very high. It's uh, more than um, 0.5, the Gini, it's the Gini coefficient, right? So it's quite high, but it's, it is slightly decreasing. So there are explanations, both possible explanations, both for the rise and for the decline of inequality in the 2000s. So these are the explanations for the decline of inequality. Uh, decreased income volatility. So because wages were paid on time, mostly uh, when Putin came to power, uh, this artificial increase in inequality disappeared from, from, you know, from statistics. Then there is uh, the narrowing gap between different industries. So industries that were hardest hit by the transition, like agriculture, they improved. Um, the situation there was improved and uh, the salaries there also increased, right? So because of this, there might have been a decrease in inequality. And then uh, some uh, researchers uh, point out that there was a pro-poor growth, so-called pro-poor growth, that uh, it was economic growth that actually benefited poor people more than uh, rich people. So uh, this, this is uh, not... Uh, mm, I don't think this was the case in the 2000s, but they tried to make this case using the surveys. But like I said, the surveys do not represent the richest households. So this, um, this conclusion is questionable. Then there are alternative explanations for the rise of inequality in the 2000s, right? Increasing compensations for the top managers in finance and resource extraction sectors. So uh, Russia is not different from um, um, Western capitalist countries in the sense that uh, top management and executives receive uh, huge, huge uh, compensation uh, and bonuses and uh, stock options. So in that sense, the nature of inequality in Russia is quite similar to that in, in the United States, for instance, where the gap between uh, ordinary workers and uh, top management is extremely uh, wide. So the same in Russia. Then there are growing incomes of the business owners. So uh, businesses, especially big business, was very su successful in the 2000s, in recent years. And uh, because of this, the inequality likely increased. And finally, there is corruption and uh, rent seeking. So corruption is also the source of inequality because corrupt politicians and bureaucrats, uh, um, their, their wealth is increasing and the wealth of ordinary people is not increasing uh, to the same extent. So uh, personally, I think that uh, these, these uh, explanations are correct. And I think that inequality uh, continued to increase in the 2000s, but uh, the data is not conclusive on this. So the bottom line is we know that inequality in Russia is very high, but we don't know for sure that it was increasing in the last 30 years. So there was this explosion in the early 90s, but what, what happened next is really unclear according to statistics, according to the data that we have. So uh, 
the second part of the presentation, public perceptions of inequality. Uh, we have the International Social Survey Program, and uh, there were several waves of this survey. And we see that basically Russians uh, agree with the fact that differences in income in Russia are too large. So basically everyone agrees with this statement. And what is interesting is that more even more people agreed with this statement uh, in 1999, in 2009, than in 1993. So in the beginning of the transition to the market economy, people were more positive about uh, inequality than they were several years later, right? Uh, then there is this interesting chat. So, uh, it is the responsibility of the government to reduce differences in income. Again, it's the International Social Survey Program. And we see that uh, a lot of people actually disagreed with this notion in 1993. So in the beginning of the transition, when people only began experiencing market reforms, they were uh, rather optimistic about uh, the market economy and they thought that uh, the government should not reduce differences in income the government should not fight inequality as you can see uh, 20 27 percent of the population these people were actually against redistribution and uh, uh, 15 percent uh, were not sure so uh, slightly more than half totally agreed with the fact that we need uh, to reduce differences in income but what we have now is overwhelming majority of people agree that we need redistribution. So this is clearly the result of the experience of the market economy by the Russian population. So they just experienced a dramatic rise of inequality, a dramatic fall in incomes in the 90s, and the rise of the oligarch class, the rise of big business. And their conclusion was that the government needs to fight inequality. So now it's unambiguous. The overwhelming majority of the people in Russia wants the government to do something, right? But the government does not do anything at the present moment. So this is sort of a paradox. Uh, we have this survey produced by Levada Center, one of the uh, sociological agencies in Russia. And uh, the question is, which economic system seems better to you? So the one based on state planning and distribution, the one based on private property and market relations and not sure. So as you can see in uh, February, 1992, only a minority of people still supported the planned economy. And in fact, the majority, almost, almost half of the people supported the market economy, right? And 24% were not sure. And uh, what is, 30 years later, you see overwhelming majority of people actually supporting the planned economy and a very small minority, only 24%, fully supporting the market economy. And 14% are not sure. So uh, there was this uh, joke in, uh, in the early 90s. Uh, what did uh, the capitalist government do that uh, the Soviet government could not do in 70 years? What could it do in one year? So it made uh, communism look good because, because of the market reforms, right? So in just one year, uh, <laughs> the capitalist government, the, the government of the reformers made uh, communism look good because you can see the growth of support for uh, the planned economy. So at first, more and more people were unsure that uh, private property and market relations are good. And then, then the number of those who were not sure began to decrease and more and more people began to support uh, plans economy. So this is basically the result of uh, the reforms of neoliberal reforms on, and the tradition transition to the market economy. And again, this reflects the experience of the majority of the Russian population. And uh, as we can see, support for state planning is at an all time high currently. So this is August uh, 2021, the most recent uh, poll, the most recent wave of the survey. So the support is at an all time high. And the support for the market economy is very low. Right? Uh, finally, there is the survey from Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of Sociology. So the question was income inequality is a painful problem for the society as a whole, for me personally. 
And uh, this is a rather recent trend in the last 10 years. Again, we see that uh, less than half of the people said that income inequality is a painful problem for me personally. And in 2018, almost 70% of the people said that income inequality is a painful problem for them. So the importance of inequality in the public opinion, not only was it increasing throughout these 30 years uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, but it was also increasing in the last uh, 10 or even five years. So people grow more and more and more frustrated with uh, rising inequality. So we don't, uh, we don't have solid data on the objective situation with inequality. Was it rising in the last 20 years? But we have rather, rather solid data about the public perception of inequality. So people actually think that inequality has been on the rise throughout this whole period. And people are frustrated with uh, inequality. So now uh, the debate. The debate uh, on inequality that we have in Russia. Uh, in order to understand uh, what our president is saying about inequality, I went to his website, Kremlin.ru, and basically I looked for all the mentions of inequality in his speeches, in his public appearances, in everything that he has written and spoken in this particular period, so it's just four years. And I found actually 14 mentions of inequality. Uh, so uh, Putin actually mentions inequality. It's not, it's not a rare event for him to mention inequality, but uh, he does it uh, in a very special way, in a very particular way. Uh, usually Putin talks about inequality uh, for the international audience in some international forums and uh, global events. Uh, for instance, uh, during the Davos Forum in Switzerland this year, uh, he made a speech about inequality and about uh, economic injustice. And uh, the speech sounded as if he was uh, the president of a social democratic country, right? And uh, mm, this was very much in line with the speeches of our other world leaders. And I think that this represents uh, the shifting uh, consensus on the global stage. So this kind of pure form of neoliberalism becomes the thing of the past. And uh, it has become fashionable to talk about inequality uh, among the global elite. And Putin is actually part of this global elite. And he also talks about inequality, but only when he talks to this global elite. So he never mentions Russia in this context. And he never mentions Russia as a country that has actually this problem with inequality. So he does not address inequality in Russia. He addresses inequality as some sort of global problem that affects everyone. So when he is forced to talk about inequality in the domestic setting, and when he's talking to the domestic audience, uh, he always shifts the focus from inequality to poverty. So just like Watt said, this was the recommendation of uh, the international financial institutions. That was the dominant discourse in the 90s that there is the problem of poverty. Poverty, it is a legitimate problem, but inequality is not a real problem. It's not a legitimate problem. We should not talk about inequality. We should talk about poverty. Right? And when Putin is speaking to the domestic audience, he reproduces the same narrative from the 90s, this very new liberal narrative from the 90s that inequality is not important, you know, because uh, poverty is the real problem. And uh, uh, Putin's government was actually successful in decreasing poverty, especially in the 2000s, in these 10 years of strong economic growth. So he, he has something to show in this regard. And he says, look, yes, inequality might be high in Russia, but it's also high in other countries. And uh, we are successful in fighting poverty, right? So what, what matters is poverty. Inequality doesn't matter. And it's a very dramatic difference from his uh, speeches to the international audience. So when he speaks at Davos in Switzerland, he recognizes inequality. When he speaks uh, with uh, the Russians during his press conferences, he never recognizes inequality as a problem. And the only exception was uh, his uh, speech about 
this welfare policy called maternity capital. So it's uh, the most generous welfare policy that we have in Russia. And uh, this is a lump sum, a lump payment to the mothers currently that have uh, the first child, the second child, and the third child. And uh, he was uh, sort of debating uh, this policy with his economic team that is very neoliberal, you know, with the financial wing of the government. And he was saying, so yes, it's a universalistic welfare policy. Every mother in Russia receives uh, this payment uh, when, she, when she has a child. So it is not uh, means targeted. It's not just for the poor, it's for everyone. But we have such high inequality that we need this kind of universalistic policy and it is actually justified. So this was the only uh, time when he actually talked about inequality uh, in the Russian context and used inequality to justify some kind of increased uh, welfare protection. So for Putin, this is very, very uncommon. In general, he does not like to talk inequality at all. So nevertheless, uh, Putin is not alone in Russia. There are other politicians. And uh, I looked at speeches and publications of two other politicians. The first is Gennady Zyuganov, the leader of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. Uh, so he has been the leader for 30 years. He is still the leader. So everyone is very much accustomed to Zyuganov. And um, he talks about inequality all the time, but he says that inequality is basically the result of those reforms, catastrophic reforms of the 90s. And inequality is the result of the concentration of property in the hands of the oligarchs. And uh, his rhetoric did not change in the last 30 years. He says exactly the same things that he said 30 years ago. So nothing changed. As if uh, Putin's period does not matter. As if, as if Putin's period is exactly the same as the 90s. And the political regime in Russia is exactly the same as in the 90s. So um, he never mentions specific people when he talks about inequality. He never mentions specific oligarchs, for instance. For him, it's very abstract. It's just inequality. It's the gap between the rich and the poor. So this gap is very bad. And uh, because of this, uh, this talk of inequality is rather ineffective because he does not try to um, put it in the context of uh, the present situation in Russia. So it's just some kind of abstract uh, criticism of uh, Russian, Russian economy. But we also have Alexei Navalny, who is this well-known opposition figure in Russia, and uh, he's now in jail. But uh, in 2018, uh, he tried to um, participate in the presidential election, and uh, he was uh, blocked from participating eventually, but uh, still he had his own campaign. And uh, during this campaign, he criticized inequality all the time. But uh, he did it in a different way from uh, Zyuganov. His approach was different because he always connected uh, economic inequality to political inequality. He said that authoritarian regime creates uh, corruption and corruption creates inequality. So the inequality that we have in Russia, this gap between rich and poor is ultimately connected to the nature of the political regime in Russia. And so the way Navalny criticizes inequality is different from the way Zyuganov criticizes inequality because Zyuganov never mentions the political regime in Russia. He never says that Russia is not a democracy, that Russia is an authoritarian regime. He only mentions the oligarchs. And Navalny always mentions the nature of uh, the political regime in Russia. And uh, his criticism of inequality in that sense is more effective because he connects the issue of inequality with the issue of uh, an authoritarian regime. So this is... Uh, a slogan from his presidential campaign. He says, uh, decent life for all, not riches for the 0.1%. So uh, this is a populist slogan, very similar to Occupy Wall Street. So it's rather surprising that Navalny adopted the language of uh, left populism from the West, from the United States and from Europe. Uh, but uh, he 
combined this language with his uh, criticism of uh, the political regime uh, and uh, Putin personally. And so uh, this was a new development for the opposition in Russia, because before Navalny, opposition was mostly liberal and uh, they really did not criticize inequality that much because these were um, liberal political parties and liberal politicians. They, uh, their point was that economic growth is slow in Russia because of Putin's policies, but they did not talk about inequality. So Navalny uh, shifted the focus to inequality and injected uh, a dose of left populism in his, uh, in his rhetoric. So uh, my conclusion is that the genie is out of the bottle, right? In the sense that uh, opposition politicians in Russia now criticize the economic order as well as the political order. So they managed to combine criticism of inequality, criticism of economic injustice with the criticism of political authoritarianism and uh, the criticism of Putin's regime, essentially. So yes, Navalny is uh, neutralized more or less as a politician because he's now in jail and his uh, communication with the world is very limited. But I think that uh, the strategy that he pioneered will be adopted by other rising leaders and uh, uh, opposition in Russia will have this left-wing orientation. In the future, it is simply inevitable because uh, it was revealed that this kind of left populist approach is very effective at mobilizing people. So I think that uh, this is the future of the opposition in Russia. And because our president does not want to talk about inequality, he does not want to address inequality. So he tries to sweep it under the rug, so to speak, right? So uh, he actually has nothing to say in response to this type of uh, criticism. And this is why the, legitimate, the legitimacy of the political regime in Russia will be progressively eroded. It will uh, diminish because of this type of criticism produced uh, by the opposition. So this is what I wanted to say today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leah. Fascinating. Uh, uh, I think we're waiting for some questions to come through, uh, but I, I already have some, well, not some, many, many in my head. So I'll just spout some of them out. Uh, but, but before even asking questions, that yeah, I'm, I'm still very conflicted with uh, saying anything Navalny says with left liberal. <laughs> it just doesn't work in my head, yeah. him being anything like that. But uh, the, uh, my question very much was that when we are looking at your data regarding uh, this, this uh, um, new passion for planned economy that emerges. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but looking at Russia, <laughs> especially, uh, what is the, I cannot imagine that this is throughout the country. The, large space had the same view mm -hmm. and and is there would i be right uh, or completely wrong in thinking that it's most more likely that the the large urban centers uh, is where still the the neoliberal ideas are much more popular and as we move away to regions a more planned economy uh, nostalgia and other forms of uh, requirements come through is, is there would it be right to say so yeah no well, this is absolutely correct but uh, Russia is different from, uh, from the West because um, the share of the population living in the biggest cities in Russia is actually lower than in Western countries. Mm -hmm. So there is a statistic that indicates that more than 60% of people in America, for instance, they live in uh, urban agglomerations of 1 million or more. And for Russia, it's only 30%. So 30% of the population live in big cities. So in fact, Russia is the country of uh, medium-sized industrial cities or deindustrializing cities. And in these parts of the country, support for the Soviet Union, basically, for the mm -hmm. Soviet organization of the economy is very strong because these are the losers of the transition, we can yeah. say, right? And of course, in Moscow and in Petersburg, these numbers are much lower because Moscow and Petersburg benefit from, from capitalism. They benefit from capitalist development, but Moscow and Petersburg do not represent the country. This is why I'm not surprised when I look at these numbers. I see that they represent the actual 
geographical cleavages as well as uh, cleavages between you know world views so in the small towns in uh, former industrial towns in mono towns that quad mentions right those places with uh, a single huge factory in those places support for uh, the planned economy is very high because they did not see any benefits from the market economy let's say they did not really benefit from it this is why they changed their opinion since the early 90s they saw that this doesn't work for them and they want uh, the previous system so. thank you yes that 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 detail is very very important and and i think how that detail of size of the city and nature of their economy how is redistributed over the post-Soviet space is also very important, I think, to when we say, look at Kazakhstan, it'll be a different mix in that sense, right? Number of such cities are smaller and overall, uh, yeah. Uh, I wish Kuat was here so we could <laughs> see if he has any other. So now we have a question from Nazik uh, Imanbekova. Uh, Nazik, please go ahead. Thank you, Ilya, for your presentation. It's quite interesting. Um, my question is about a uh, uh, discussion of inequality in the civil society. You talk about uh, uh, about the opposition, and Navalny is, I think, the uh, one of the um, I can say um, most famous um, uh, Russian opposition even in here in Central Asia, uh, but are there any discussions in social, social media, in um, mass media, among the civic uh, society NGOs about the inequality in Russia? Uh, and uh, also I, I want to ask, uh, there was a, a slide about uh, uh, rich, super rich people in Russia, and there was a sudden decrease in 2009 that, mm -hmm. uh, we could have explained uh, uh, because of the uh, this uh, uh, crisis, uh, economic crisis in this period. But then, uh, uh, then we have a sudden rise again in uh, 2010, which is uh, surprising for me. And uh, why right. this it happened? Thank you. <laughs> right. So. Uh... Thank you for your questions uh, regarding the first question. I think that um, the tone uh, when discussing inequality has changed in the media, uh, in the opposition media in Russia as well. So uh, various opposition outlets that are you know, not part of the Kremlin's uh, orbit, you can say they discuss inequality all the time. And they're also focused on uh, exposing and criticizing, you know, um the the real estate the property and the lifestyle of the ruling elite in russia so th this kind of populist attacks on the ruling elite have become sort of mainstream so i would say it's not just navalny it's uh, uh the general mood in the opposition movement but at the same time uh the opposition itself is rather split on this issue because there are still old school liberals who say that Navalny is a populist, so they blame him uh, uh, as a populist. For instance, uh, Grigory Yevlinsky, the leader of uh, the Yabloka party, which is a very old liberal party that emerged in the early 90s in Russia. So uh, he accused Navalny of populism and of stoking class hatred. He says Navalny is stoking class hatred with his criticism of uh, uh, you know, the oligarchs and the richest politicians. But I think that uh, such people are in the minority now. They do not uh, dominate in the discussion because, uh, uh, because mo most politicians, most uh, opposition leaders recognize that if they want to be popular, they need to stoke class hatred because this is what works in Russia. <laughs> so <laughs> this is the way to go, let's say, right? So uh, some kind of right-wing liberals who are close to the business circles, to the business elites, they prefer to avoid this kind of language and they criticize Navalny from the right. But, uh, but in terms of the NGOs, uh, NGOs are, are not really that active in Russia in general because of the crackdown uh, you know, organized by the regime. So most NGOs do not uh, express their political opinions at all. So Russia is not the country where the NGOs are active uh, politically because uh, they were destroyed by the regime essentially. And uh, regarding your first question about uh, the chats, let me just open it. So this one, 
Yeah, the crisis represents the fall in the um, stock market value of uh, public companies. And because they lost uh, the value, the wealth of the oligarchs decreased. And so the number of people who are billionaires also decreased because the value on the, um, on the stock market of their companies decreased. But then it's increased very quickly, it recovered essentially. So this is like an artificial decrease of the stock market value of publicly traded companies in Russia. So once it's recovered, uh, you know, the number of billionaires recovered as well. But uh, the number of billionaires has been stagnating for the last, uh, well, 10 years, you could say maybe slightly increasing because of the problems in the economy. So lack of economic growth means also lack of growth of the number of billionaires. In that sense, China has now much more billionaires than Russia. So the tendency was the same in the, in the 2000s, but now the tendencies are diverging. The number of billionaires is increasing in Russia. In China, it stays more or less the same in Russia. Thank you. Uh, um, Adina, uh, you can ask your question if you like. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this insightful um, presentation. My question was more related to the social well-being side of inequality. As we know that according to this famous uh, spirit level theory, like more equal economies, more equal societies have better societies in general in terms of suicide rates, um, like infant mortality, all those kind of things. Yeah. Sorry, yes, go ahead. So uh, as you mentioned, Russia is one of the most unequal countries in the world. And this theory was actually studied and applied to the case of USA, one of the most, I think, the number one unequal economy in the world, in the developed world. Um, mm -hmm. That actually it is true that um, more unequal countries have less social well-being. Uh, can we draw the same kind of line between social well-being and inequality level in the Russian case? I think 100%. Uh, so uh, the, this book, uh, The Spirit Level, is quite interesting. So the basic point, like you said, is that inequality causes various social problems. So mm -hmm. unfortunately, this book was criticized from the methodological perspective. So they, they, their, their approach to statistics is a bit flimsy. But uh, in general, I think they are right in the sense that inequality in itself is the cause of many problems. So in Russia, it's very clear that inequality causes um, mm, uh, lack of trust in society. So one of the points in the book was that um, the most unequal societies have the least uh, trust between people who live in this country. So it's totally true about Russia. No one trusts each other. And uh, there is the constant kind of tension in society, constant uh, social conflicts. Also the problem of uh, envy and the problem of people who see uh, the lifestyle of the rich in Moscow and they recognize that they will never achieve this kind of lifestyle. But at the same time, this is what uh, is painted as the ultimate goal for a person in Russia, right? So to live like an oligarch. So what can they do in this situation that creates uh, cognitive dissonance and this creates uh, frustration. So yeah, in terms of well-being, inequality is very bad. And this is why places like Denmark, they have lowest inequality and the highest quality of life. So to me, this is like a common sense connection. And Russia has uh, inequality on the Latin American level. So it's higher than in America, in my opinion, because if we look at Piketty's data, uh, then we see that it's even higher than in the United States. And uh, because of this, the well-being, uh, you know, is reduced as well. So yeah, inequality is bad. That's the answer. Thank you. Uh, uh, Barihar, and then we have a comment from Hikarot in, in the chat. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, we... Uh, Iliad, I mean, did you want to just to take that comment from uh, yeah. Hikariad, please? Uh, I think I think I think you partly addressed it in your in your presentation, but you may just want to address it again. All right. So, what is the basis of Navalny's opposition? Does he have a clear roadmap of how to overcome the growing inequality in Russia beyond Moscow? So, uh, he he has a program. And uh, this program was published uh, when he was the presidential candidate. 
and uh, he has some sensible policies in this program, for instance, raising the minimum wage. So he uh, proposed uh, to raise the minimum wage to 25,000 rubles, which is uh, double it, basically double the minimum wage. And I think that uh, this proposal totally makes sense because the minimum wage in Russia is among the lowest in the world, especially compared to the GDP per capita. So this totally makes sense. But at the same time, I would say that uh, Navalny is unfortunately not uh, a consistent left-wing politician. This is why we criticize him from the left all the time because uh, his, the, the policies that he actually proposes are not enough to truly fight inequality. For instance, uh, he proposes a sort of uh, tax on windfall profits of the oligarchs, but this is going to be a one-off tax. So each of them pays a lump sum of money as a compensation for what they did in the 90s, so to speak. And with this, Navalny hopes to close the question of privatization, you know, to again sweep it under the rug because they finally paid what was due and now the oligarchs are good to go, right? So uh, th this is uh, nonsensical in my opinion because uh, he will not raise a lot of money in this way because those factories changed hands many times. So it's not clear who is supposed to pay which tax in this situation, first of all. Secondly, a one-off tax does not work. It's, uh, it's more of a symbolic measure. So in that sense, the actual criticism of inequality that Navalny produces is rather weak. So it's not, uh, he's not a left-wing politician, like I said. So what is important is that he raised this topic and he was very effective in communicating this, you know, this issue to the masses. But in terms of the actual policy proposals, uh, it is, uh, well, his program is underdeveloped. It's not realistic in many ways. So for instance, he proposed to double the financing of education and healthcare, which is in itself a noble goal. I agree with this. But uh, he did not explain how will he finance this increase in, uh, you know, in financing because he, is, for instance, does not clearly support the progressive income tax, paradoxically, right? So <laughs> Navalny never said that he wants to institute a progressive income tax. So Russia is similar to Kazakhstan that uh, we, we unfortunately have this weird system where everyone pays the same tax, right? Uh, it was changed very slightly. Uh, last year, so the richest people in Russia now pay 15% uh, personal income tax and uh, everyone else pays 13%. So it's 2% you know, difference. It, it looks progressive, but it's not really progressive, right? So it's basically the same flat income tax. So and even Navalny, for some reason, did not offer uh, a truly progressive taxation like in, like in all other countries of the world. So uh, to me, this is an this is indication that um, his program is contradictory. He has this populist element, but he also has this uh, neoliberal element because he wants to cater to business interests. He also wants to cater to the masses, to, to ordinary people. And uh, these contradictions uh, should be sort of exacerbated, I think. He should uh, pick a side, first of all, and uh, uh, he should be more consistent on this. But uh, this discussion, again, we cannot have it because Navalny is in prison, so there is no, you know, <laughs> no interlocutor to discuss <laughs> something. <laughs> so unfortunately, we cannot have this discussion with him now. Yes. Thank you, Ilya, for a really fascinating presentation and a real insight into into Russia economy and also politics and uh, people's understanding of it as well. Uh, and, and, and the colleague that uh, suggested you as the, as the emerging voice of critical thinking uh, was not wrong. So, so, so thank you. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so can I now ask Hassan? Uh, uh, we so we have a, a small break actually oh, scheduled uh, till yes, 12. We do. <laughs> Sorry, apologies. Thank you very much. Yes. So, uh, so can we all please make a? Uh, I probably gave Hassan. I would have called a bit of a shock there. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Hassan. Um, no, no, so, no. Yeah. So can we uh, can we can we uh, come back in ten minutes, please? Let's make a prompt start. Uh, yes. So, um, so we're just slightly over by by five minutes, but uh, but in, in ten minutes, please. So that's twelve o'clock UK time, please. Thank you very much. If you want to take a comfort break. And then, uh, and, and there's a, a comment, a relevant comment by Nazi in, in chat as well. But uh, yeah, we can reflect on that as we go forward. Yes. Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, if uh, if if Ilya wants to kind of uh, respond to that in the in the chat, you can do, or, or anybody else can do, of course, in the in the in the chat. Okay, thank you, guys. Come back in ten minutes. I'm a great admirer. Uh, uh, I should say that I'm a great admirer of Hassan's work. I think he's uh, just, uh, just, just, just brilliant. Uh, he's widely published in, uh, in in highly prestigious outlets, and uh, and, I, and I've kind of heard him speak on, on a couple of occasions. And, and I just think he's got so much to offer us here. Um, just to say something about Hassan, so he's the uh, Associate Professor at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences at Lahore University of Management Sciences. So over to you, Hassan. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Paliha, for that very, very generous introduction. Uh, sort of 
extremely humbled. Uh, thank you, Siddhartha, uh, and my thanks to uh, the Cambridge Forum on Central Asia as well for this, this, this opportunity. Um, sort of deeply honored to be allowed this opportunity to, to uh, present uh, sort of some, some, some research. Um, yeah, I want to preface my presentation by saying that uh, this is a work in progress in the, in, the, in the truest sense of the word, in the most genuine sense of the word. And, and, and what I'm presenting today is um, one part of uh, a larger writing uh, project. And this is actually the first time that I'm presenting this work, uh, presenting these ideas. And uh, it struck me that a forum such as this would be a good opportunity to put some ideas out there and more importantly, get feedback because I'm really piecing together uh, the story. Um, so, so this is really you know, my my way of saying that you know I'm I'd be very happy and very grateful for any and all feedback uh, pertaining whether or not these ideas fit together, whether whether what I'm saying makes sense, uh, whether there's critical sources that uh, that I should be looking at. Uh, I, I sort of do want to say that a lot of the narrative that I'm building was uh, put together. Um, during COVID, so during the pandemic. So in other words, pretty much sitting in this chair where I am right now. So, so I haven't really had the opportunity to go to Central Asia since the pandemic started uh, and look at sources, but I'm hoping for that uh, opportunity perhaps in the next year, we'll see. But in any case, I'm open to suggestions. I'm, I'm, I'm open to ideas in terms of how this uh, can be moved forward. Um, sort of the, the image that you see in front of you uh, is an image of Karasu Bazar in southern Kyrgyzstan. Uh, and I've put it up for the very simple reason that even though I'll be talking about developments, or even though I'll move towards developments that happened uh, in the early 1990s, I first started thinking about these uh, developments and these occurrences in the bazaars in Kyrgyzstan were between 2013 and 2018. I've, I was doing field work, um, and and what this is, what this what this paper does, or what this presentation does, and 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 uh, you know what I'll be doing over here is uh, moving from the present in the backward direction. So uh, in other words, uh, starting in the present moment, and then sort of you know going back to the to the early 1990s uh, when something really interesting happened, uh, or at least that's my understanding of the situation, but. Uh, there was a shortage of cash and cash started disappearing and the bazaars of Central Asia uh, were a response to that. So they were a response in part to uh, vanishing cash, the need to generate cash. Um, so that's why, that's why the bazaar feature is on the title uh, and that's why uh, images of bazaars will keep popping up uh, through, the, through the presentation because these, these have really helped me think through a lot of these historical issues that I'll be describing uh, in the, in the uh, sort of latter half of this, this, this presentation. So in other words, it's about connecting the present uh, with, the, with the past. And, and one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm moving towards uh, is looking at or thinking about ways in which the economic setup um, in Central Asia is not of the way in which the elite or particular individuals uh, transitioned from the Soviet Union to independence and managed to retain their power, but the way in which the monetary system, the way in which the banking system uh, might have had a role to play uh, insofar as those continuities uh, are concerned. So I'll uh, move on to the next slide. I'm afraid uh, uh, the slides are not moving. <laughs> uh, yeah, we still are, we have the yeah. Uh, maybe we'll have to unproject it. Perhaps maybe that's what sure we need thing. to. Do. Yeah, absolutely. Let me let me do that. Well, that's unfortunate. Okay, so okay, I'm I'm trying to escape uh, from the projected view. <laughs> Well, at least you can hear me, so I'm happy about that. <laughs> Maybe just we can try one thing. If you can just un unshare and reshare and not project it, then it'll. Sure. 
Okay, there we go. So I've, I'm I'm on the second slide now. Let's see. Let's see if I okay. can. Yeah. Let's see if it works. If it doesn't, then you know I'll I'll just sure sure actually. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, okay. So 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 the the bazaar is is the point of departure, uh, and uh, so one of the things that's striking about the bazaar is the volume of people who work in these marketplaces. And I've just put up some figures over here uh, in uh, sort of the Doe Bazaar, which is in Bishkek. We have about 60,000 people who are said to work in the bazaar daily. Uh, in the Barahulka, which is uh, a bazaar in Almaty in Kazakhstan, uh, it's estimated that about uh, 200,000 people are working in the bazaar or in related industries. So the question that then comes to mind, and these are striking figures, uh, especially when one looks at the population of these cities. So in other words, what we can see is that a substantial portion of the city's population or a substantial portion of the city's workforce is actually working in these bazaars. So the question then comes up is that, you know, is this, is this an exceptionalism? Can we explain this through, through social sciences literature? Um, and how do we understand the role of these bazaars uh, in contemporary economies? And I seem to be stuck again. Uh, I apologize. Um, sort of. It, can you can you hear me at this point? Yeah, we can hear you clearly. Uh, uh, okay. But but maybe we should try that. Yeah, we should. Let's just okay. unproject it okay. and then. Yeah. Sure. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So so um, let me just sorry. Okay. So it seems to be working with the with the arrows underneath. But you know, let's let's. <laughs> Okay, so this is the structure of the presentation. Uh, sort of in the beginning, I'll just quickly run through some uh, sort of popular social sciences approaches to, to, to the bazaar, uh, to the way in which people have thought about bazaars. I don't want to spend too much time on this because that's really not the focus of the presentation. Uh, I'm then going to move on to questions of unemployment, underemployment, uh, and the everyday logic of the bazaars, especially uh, sort of as they uh, pertained to the early, uh, the early 1990s when the transition was occurring. Uh, then I'll move on to monetary restructuring that was taking place at the twilight of perestroika. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little bit about uh, market reforms that are taking place in Russia in the early 1990s, where the, so the Central Asian leadership is uh, sort of, you know, trying to work alongside with these market reforms that are taking place in, in, in Russia. And then finally, I'll sort of moving on to the point at which uh, there, is, there is a movement away from, from, from the ruble zone. So the first part, uh, in, what I want to do in, 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 in the first part of this, uh, of this talk is just sort of, you know, very, very briefly uh, mention what some social sciences approaches have been. Uh, there's the there's the um, the bazaar economy approach. I won't spend too much time on this, but this this idea was put forward by by, by Gertz, um, and 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 crucially, and I think this this ties in with with some ideas that uh, we heard during Gertz's presentation earlier today. Uh, sort of with the with the whole bazaar economy idea, uh, what we find is that uh, there isn't any innovation that's taking place, and 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 this is something that uh, has 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 come up in conversations. Uh, I've had with colleagues in, in, in Kazakhstan as well. Um, bazaars sort of as per this, uh, sort of as per this approach uh, had low profitability thresholds, circulations was uh, limited, uh, information was scarce. Uh, and uh, this was in opposition to the way in which uh, the modern rational market uh, was, 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 was being understood. Um, sort of another approach which I found useful when one thinks about bazaars is uh, sort of what you might describe broadly speaking as uh, sort of what, what political economy might tell us. You know, here I find the work of Polanyi very, uh, very interesting. And I think there's, Polanyi of course became extremely popular in the 1990s once the Soviet Union collapsed. But I think that uh, there is uh, sort of still utility in uh, going back to Polanyi and thinking about bazaars through Polanyi. Um, he describes powerful structural forces. He warns about the danger of unregulated markets. Uh, he sort of is warning how rent can annihilate the people. 
Um, and of course, he's pointing out that uh, markets needed to be governed uh, by the state and by a model economy that's that's upheld by the community. And the image that I have over here on the screen is is also from Karasu Bazaar, but this is this is a statue of uh, Manas Turatali, and uh, this is interesting because Manas Turatali uh, was the individual who established Karasu Bazaar uh, in the early 1990s. So so it it, it and and he, sort of he's he's still a he's he's talked about very fondly in the marketplace. There's a certain narrative about uh, how much he did for the community. So it it really brings together uh, a sort of. Uh, some some interesting ideas about uh, paternalism uh, and ownership and the way in which that translates into into economic power. Um, yet another social sciences angle that uh, has has utility in thinking about uh, bazaars is the informal economy angle. Uh, and and you know here I've got some rough estimates on the size of the informal economy. Again, you know, these are IMF projections. They they, they, they're, they're rough approximations, but uh, you know you can see that in Kazakhstan it's estimated to be about 26% of the economy, in Kyrgyzstan 35%, Tajikistan also 35%, and then there's yet another economy, the shadow economy. Uh, and when we talk about the shadow economy, then obviously uh, the estimates increase because shadow economy would also include the criminal economy and things like tax evasion. Um, Historically speaking, when one thinks about bazaars uh, and when one thinks about uh, the uh, transformations that were taking place in the macro economy and the way in which that was affecting people's everyday lives, um, underemployment and unemployment are, are a big part of the story. Um, sort of as we've as we've all read, as 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 we all know, uh, at that time pensions and savings very quickly lost their value. Uh, and bazaar trade becomes um, becomes a popular vocation. This is this is the very standard retelling of the story of why one sees bazaar trading taking place at the level that it does in Central Asia. Uh, bazaar trading has a very low cost of entry. Uh, one of the things I find uh, interesting about bazaar trading is that it utilizes public infrastructure. Uh, this image uh, from Orthosai Bazaar in Bishkek is a, is a really interesting example of that. It's a good example of that because it's demonstrating how roadsides and street sides um, could end up being sort of basic infrastructure, public infrastructure could end up being used uh, by, by the traders. But the question then becomes, or the question that, that, that kept coming back to me uh, during field work was that, well, what more can we add to the story? Uh, can, we, can we nuance it? It yet further. Um, and I think we can. Uh, I think there's an everyday logic uh, as far as bazaars and uh, bazaar trading is concerned. Uh, and I think this everyday logic is applicable to the present. And I think it was applicable in 1991 as well. Uh, I think one aspect of this everyday logic was the fact that the price points in the bazaar uh, were not in discordance with the purchasing capacity of the people. Um, and then another aspect of the bazaar, which I found uh, uh, very interesting and which is really where my, my, my sort of thought process uh, uh, sort of uh, was, was, was uh, greatly, greatly stimulated was uh, people took to, to the bazaars because there was a, there was a want of money. Uh, cash could be acquired in bazaars and money could be made to, to multiply. And that then led to the next question that, well, you know, was there a shortage of cash? Um, and if there was a shortage of cash, why was there a shortage of cash? And does this shortage of cash have a history? And the story, at least as far as I understand it, uh, goes back to the twilight of perestroika, uh, it's at this point in time that the per capita GNP in Central Asia is between 50 and 75 percent of the national average. The way I understand the story, there is uh, sort of a whole bunch of reasons for this. Uh, one reason that kept coming up again and again in the, in the sources that I was looking at was that uh, towards the end of perestroika, towards the end of Soviet rule in Central Asia, there was uh, ramped up cotton production in Uzbekistan that was exhausting the land, that was depleting the water. Um, I also read about a very high degree of interdependence 
uh, in manufacturing, as a result of which it became difficult to disentangle sourcing and manufacturing. So it became very difficult to, to, to uh, say that a certain product was made where, where the, where the uh, raw materials were coming from, where the power might have been coming from, where the labor was, labor was coming from. Um, in Russia, there's uh, sort of, uh, in, in the Soviet Union, more broadly speaking, excuse me, uh, there's runaway spending at this point in time in aerospace, defense, state-owned enterprises, uh, and the uh, fiscal deficit in Russia towards the end of perestroika is about 25, 26% of the national expenditure. And this is where things started to get really interesting for me, and it goes back to that question of banishing cash. But one of the things that I then read about, uh, which I found fascinating, was the fact that the State Bank of the USSR, the Ghost Bank, uh, it starts financing deficit through credits or the creation of non-cash rubles. Now, uh, as far as the Central Asian states are concerned, uh, as, as, as uh, sort of the, the, the disintegration of the Soviet Union was happening, uh, there were advantages to staying within, within the ruble zone. Uh, one advantage was the protection from economic shock, uh, there was a sense that uh, they, could act, act, they could continue to have access to credit, which would allow them to purchase goods from Russia. Uh, there was also a sense that energy could be secured from Russia. But cracks begin to appear uh, in the system very, very early on. Uh, one is that uh, the Central Bank of the USSR ends up becoming the Central Bank of the Russian Federation, and the local branches become local central banks. But one disadvantage that these local central banks have is that they can't issue rubles. They can, however, issue non-cash rubles so that they can, they can issue credit. And this is something that's going to work to the disadvantage of the Bank of Russia, or at least as far as I understand the story. Now, the, the, the sort of the, you, what, what cash was used for and what non-cash uh, monies were used for were, were two separate things. Uh, the way I understand the story, cash covers salaries and uh, state transactions that require hard currency, and non-cash rubles were then, were then credit. Uh, they had, they had uh, varying purchasing power. And what's happened now is that the central banks in the Central Asian Republics and across the former Soviet Union can generate credit, so they can they can generate these non-cash rubles, and this ends up at least initially becoming something of a lifeline for the smaller states in the ruble zone. Um, initially, there's about 15 states in the ruble zone, um, and 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 the ruble zone, as we all know, is going to is going to disintegrate almost in its entirety by the end of 1993. Uh, January 2nd, 1992 is when price liberalization happens in Russia. Uh, it's an attempt on the part uh, of Russia's economic leadership to ostensibly correct uh, overproduction, uh, abolish state subsidies, uh, and it results in soaring inflation and soaring prices. And sort of here one sees something quite interesting as well, uh, namely that in places like Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, uh, there's an attempt at domestic price control by issuing bread coupons. And I think that's interesting because on the one hand, there's a decision to stay within the ruble zone, but very quickly they're learning that uh, the aftershocks from economic restructuring in Russia are going to be uh, extremely destabilizing. Uh, and, and, and one starts getting a sense of this early in 1992. Um, through 1992, uh, as I've been able to piece together the story, the situation gets, gets, gets much more tenuous. Um, in 1992, it's uh, uh, sort of decided that all transactions that are now taking place between uh, Russia and the successor states have to go through, through the central banks. And, what, one of the things or one of the consequences of this, according to the documents that I've looked at, is that it just ends up creating excessive banking traffic uh, in, 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 the, in Russia and in the successor states. 
1992, uh, Viktor Garashenko becomes the chairperson of the uh, Central Bank of Russia, and, and sort of in the in the in the literature, he's he's a he's a fairly controversial uh, uh, figure. Um, and and one of the things that he ends up doing is that he ends up increasing the limit of non-cash rubles that Russia would be willing to accept from successor states. And what ends up happening as a result of this is that Russia ends up accumulating debt. Uh, and this is debt, or these are IOUs, which are being passed on from the Central Asian states to Russia. And then in Russia, what ends up happening is that this debt ends up being passed on to the enterprises. And what the enterprises end up doing is that they end up falling back on what are described as surrogate financial institutions. So these would be promissory notes or, or bills of exchange. And, and my understanding of what these promissory notes or bills of exchange are is that they're, they're, they're basically junk bonds. I mean, they, uh, they, 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 don't really, they don't really hold value. I mean, at best one could say that they're, they're placeholders. Um, and as a consequence of this, uh, in 1992 only, one ends up seeing is that there is sort of a significant variation in price between the value of cash and credit. So they might both be rubles, but one is cash ruble and one is credit ruble. And as I understand the situation about uh, the, 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 the cash ruble has 30% more value than the, than the credit ruble. So, so in other words, in 1992 only, uh, one ends up in a situation uh, where the uh, credit ruble uh, has significantly less value than its cash counterpart. But still, uh, as far as the Central Asian states are concerned, uh, at least until the end of 1992, uh, there isn't a good enough reason to, to leave the ruble zone. Uh, and what we end up seeing by the end of 1992 is that uh, the tide starts turning when the Central Bank of Russia attempts to stall the flow of rubles that are going out of Russia. And they become very, um, very picky, very choosy about accepting non-cash rubles. And the sources that I've looked at uh, point out the fact that, you know, they just flat out refuse to accept credit from, from Kazakhstan. And again, I mean, this is, this is something that I'm sort of, uh, I, I, I'm inferring at this point in time, and I, I could be wrong about this, but I, I think that these are important insofar as it has the Central Asian leadership now thinking about other economic models. So, so in other words, I think one of the things that happens as a consequence is that uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, there's an attempt to, to sort of look for other options away from Russia. But nevertheless, uh, at this point, the states are still within the, the ruble zone. Um, the monetary policy, um, uh, Russian monetary policy is, is uh, seen as something of, of, an, uh, of an affront, as a, a political affront by the Central Asian leadership. Uh, so they're, they're, they're making both sides, the Russian uh, leadership and the Central Asian leadership are making statements to the media uh, in which, in which they're, they're saying things to the extent of uh, you know, how, how offended they are by, by, by sort of what the other side is doing. Uh, but still, uh, once we once we get to 1993 and in the beginning of 1993, uh, within Central Asia, there is a sense that the states are being pushed out of uh, the ruble zone. July and, and Kyrgyzstan, as we all know, is the first to leave May. Uh, but but July 26th uh, is is yet another turning point for the states that are still within the ruble zone. Uh, and what happens on the 26th of July, 1993, is that uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the Central Bank in Russia announces that all rubles that were issued prior to 1992 are being phased out. Uh, and people are given a two week window in which they can convert up to 35,000 of the old rubles, which would be worth about $35. And then the rest of the money had to be frozen in a bank for six months before it can be converted back to the new ruble. And the strategy over here is that it appears that the Central Bank of Russia was making it too costly for the Central Asian states to remain in the ruble zone. And as we all know, by the end of 1993, 
uh, only Tajikistan was still in the in the in the ruble zone. And um, what we what we end up seeing is that uh, sort of because of because of interdependence in banking and manufacturing, uh, the poorer countries, especially those in Central Asia, uh, never really stood uh, stood a chance within the ruble zone. So so it was. It was something that was um, that was a makeshift. Uh, um, it was a it was a, a sort of a makeshift policy decision for a while, but it 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 it, it clearly wasn't going to last, and 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 it couldn't last. Um, by the end of 1993, and this is bringing us uh, towards the end of the story, uh, we find that convertibility between cash and credit is breaking down, so that whole business of, of, of non-cash monies uh, is, 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 is really coming to an end at this point in time. Um, this crisis had actually been manifesting through, through 1993, uh, through, through the earlier part of the year as well. Uh, and in Kyrgyzstan, for example, that year, what we find is that uh, the industrial output was varied between 15 and 60 percent of 1991 levels, once again, as a result of the fact that either there wasn't cash or if there was credit, then those credits were really, were really worthless and banks were refusing to lend money to enterprises uh, against, against that credit. And as a result of this, we see the unemployment that I think pushes people towards vocations like, like bazaar trade, to sort of that, that, that kind of sort of brings us back, back full circle. And another reason why, why people then look for vocations uh, such as bazaar trading was because any savings that uh, they had in rubles uh, had essentially become, become uh, sort of worthless. Um, so that, that, you know, I think also takes us back to a point that I'd made early on as well, that the bazaar then becomes this place where you can actually generate money. The, 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 the cost of entry is low. You can utilize public infrastructure. And if you're successful, uh, then that money can grow, that money can become more money. And that's very different from what's happening in other parts of the economic sector where, where money seems to have, have, have vanished from. So, you know, I think modernization theory, informality, shadow economy, political economy, uh, you know, these, these are all useful frames. And I think to a very large extent, uh, they explain the, the presence of bazaars today, but so, sort of doing field work in these bazaars and speaking to people in bazaars, uh, what one has also come to realize and what one has also come to appreciate that uh, the, the, the disappearance of money was part of uh, sort of a, a macroeconomic uh, process, you know, what on the slide I've, I've described as uh, a centralized uh, macroeconomic edifice that carries over from the striker from the Soviet Union, which chatters in 1993. And, I think which in very interesting ways, very curious ways, uh, continues to have an impact on the region today. Thank you very much. I uh, sort of greatly appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. I would say it's a, it's a big discussion to be had. I mean, the, 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 the economic, the ruble part, I, I am really grateful that I've done the details about. But I would uh, uh, contend that the, that being a fundamental reason why Bazaar exists because of uh, in the number of different ways we can approach it, and I'm, we, we can have a separate chat about it in the sense that uh, uh, the, the, the the whole social sociocultural aspect of bazaar, the history of bazaar in the region, um, uh, availability of things which are not uh, otherwise are available, uh, especially relating to cultural and ritualistic spaces, and you know so there, there are various other aspects sure. to it and 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 I, I, I don't disagree with you at all i'm just saying it's a pixel of the picture rather than the the picture itself I agree. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Agree. yeah yeah but anyway it's a, yeah and there are a number of people i know in the audience who uh, study bazaar or are studying bazaar in way so i think yeah. questions will come up but kuat has formally asked a question so kuat please kuat Yeah, uh, Hassan, thank you very much um, for the very interesting presentation. I unfortunately missed the, the first part. Uh, 
but uh, I'm very much interested in um, your historical account, but my question is more about the future. So there are so many allegations and speculations and political predictions that what is the reason uh, and what is the future of the Eurasian Union? And for uh, Central Asian elites and, and Kazakh intellectuals particularly, uh, the fear is, uh, and nationalists, the fear is that, you know, this Eurasian Union is, uh, even though it isn't like kind of, uh, uh, the, the official uh, official reason is, is purely economic, uh, economical. Mm -hmm. uh, but everybody's understand it's very much a political. And the fear is that, that gradually uh, it will turn into, you know, the subordinate position will be so strong of uh, our small economies that gradually they, they, they will be turned into this, you know, having a, something like uh, um, a, a one unit uh, monetary union, which will be the end, official end, the economic end of uh, sovereignty and yeah, independence. So what, what, what do you think about it? Can you elaborate on that? Because there is a strong, very strong suspicions that sometimes even Russian experts, they implicitly say that, well, at the end, it will be all about, you know, monetary union. Now it's with Belarus, which is like just unbelievably, you know, uncomparably small, smaller than yeah. Russian's uh, region, you know. And so yeah. the, the Russian economy is just will swallow be Belarus, you know. Yeah, and so yeah, the next yeah. will be like other kind. So, what, what do you think about this monetary union? Uh, Kuwait, it's a it's a it's a big question, and you know I think this is you know it's it's it's, it's perhaps uh, the topic for a longer discussion, and and you know I'd love to sort of engage with with yourself and other colleagues on this. Um, you know I can I can sort of give give some uh, vignettes, or I can I can share a vignette or two from from people that I spoke with in the bazaar in 2013 in Kyrgyzstan. Um, Pretty much everyone that we spoke to in uh, the bazaars was deeply, deeply apprehensive about the uh, Eurasian Economic Union. They said the bazaars were going to die. There was a sort of deep sense of apprehension. Uh, 2014, it was, and, and Kyrgyzstan hadn't joined the Eurasian Economic Union at this point in time. 2014, it was a foregone conclusion that Kyrgyzstan was going to join. But then 2016, when I was back in Kyrgyzstan, uh, the bazaars sort of had, had you know, not only survived, but, you know, one saw sort of new comparative advantages that people had discovered. So, for example, uh, it's around about that time that garment manufacturing had increased uh, in places like Durdoy Bazaar in, 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 in Kyrgyzstan. So, I guess what I'm getting is that they, they, they leveraged that to their, their advantage. And very anecdotally, I got the sense that uh, in 2017, the number of the number of day shoppers in Durdoy Bazaar in Bishkek, uh, day shoppers from uh, Almaty was far, far greater than what it had been in 2013 and 2014. So, I mean, I see these as, as malleable, highly adaptive institutions. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I, I think, I think, you know, they, they, they'll sort of adapt to, to the larger political economy in which uh, the states find themselves. Actually, one of the things that makes me somewhat hesitant to project into the future is, you know, A, I haven't been back since 2018. I'd love to go back, but, you know, it's, it's, it hasn't happened up until yet. So, so you know, I, I really don't know what's happened in these bazaars um, during the last two years. And the last two years, of course, are <clears throat> extremely important because, because COVID changes, mobilities and what have you. So, so, so that's, that's still something that I need, to, I need to wrap my mind around and learn more. Well, thank you for that, that 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 question. And once again, you know, at some point, you know, I'd love to sort of have a conversation on the on the economic union. Yep, uh, I, I know it's a, it's a really fascinating topic because the the bigger question that we usually quite often ask in in teaching and discussing uh, the bazaar story is that there was a with certain institutions in Central Asia, as they were cut off from the wider Asia conversation, certain exceptionalism sort of ways of thinking about evolved, so whether it's Mahala or Bazaar that's being something very Central Asian and doesn't exist anywhere else. Uh, of course, you know, you start with, uh, you started with Gates, uh, you know, so there's a, it's a much wider story of Bazaar. Somehow we don't engage with that as often. So, so why, and I think that leads more or less to, uh, to Ilya's question, which is in the chat. 
that with, with uh, Ilya, would you like to ask it uh, or would you like us to read it? Uh, uh. Yeah, yeah, I can ask it. So, <coughs> may I ask you to clarify uh, the connection yeah. between exiting the ruble zone and uh, the growth of bazaars? Because I do yeah. understand that. Yeah, so. yeah. Thank you, thank you, Ilya. I mean, it's, it's so. So this is okay. So, so you know, one thing. So, you know, as, as, as Siddhartha said, I mean, there's, there's a sort of vast amount of literature on the bazaar. There's a vast amount of literature on the Central Asian bazaar as well. Uh, and there's many explanations sort of as to why the bazaar emerges after, after 1991. And, and what, what, you know, I was trying to do over here is sort of try and figure out one piece of that puzzle, uh, which was this whole business of vanishing money. Uh, and the fact that when one reads newspaper accounts, for example, from the early 1990s about bazaars, uh, sort of in places like Kyrgyzstan, one of the things that um, sometimes get mentioned is the fact that cash is still circulating. So the question that then came to my mind is what happened to cash otherwise? You know, why was there, there, a, there a shortage of cash otherwise? And, and what, I'm, what I'm trying to do here, which is, 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 you know, it's part of a longer writing project, but what I'm trying to do over here is um, sort of look at how initially staying within the ruble zone uh, adversely affected uh, the Central Asian republics. Cash, at least in my reading of the situation, and once again, I mean, I'm just sort of working through these things in my mind, so I could be, I could be wrong on this. But cash, cash kind of vanishes, cash dries up. And that, I think, leads to the sort of unemployment, underemployment, the need for money, which pushes people to the bazaar. So the bazaar in that sense, and once again, you know, I could be way off, but the bazaar in that sense is very different from the sort of macroeconomy or, you know, exchanges that are taking place between the central banks, because increasingly that's all credit uh, or exchanges that are taking pl place between the central banks and the enterprises, because that's either credit or junk bonds. But in the bazaar, you actually have currency, you have cash, which is, which is circulating. I might be overstating the case, so you know I'm 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 saying all of this with 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 a you know with the caveat that you know this is you know this is you know something I'm still piecing together. This is really you know I have to be honest. I mean this is the first time I'm I'm presenting these ideas. So 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 you know I'm, I'm treading very carefully. <laughs> yeah, the, the, there is a very sophisticated uh, um, uh, how to say credit system in bazaar as well. Again, you know you can call it informal in in some sense, but it's kind of a semi-formal. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I think you might probably find it interesting. Again, we, we can chat. But Balihar, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, Asan, uh, thank you. And uh, again, didn't disappoint me with your with your analysis. Uh, so great, fantastic. Um, I suppose what I want to kind of throw in the mix for you is I, I'm, I'm sure you've come across it. Um, um, uh, Hyman's Minsky's. Um, financial instability hypothesis. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether, whether, whether you've come across that. Minsky, I mean, he's, he's a well-known kind of an economist uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and he links uh, credit instability, regulatory framework with uh, overall macro economic activity. Minsky, I will, I will, I will drop it in the, in the, in, in the chat. Sure. But, but that may be kind of useful, I think, for to helping you to kind of make the link. I think that Ilya was, was, was kind of asking was about mm. how do you move from currency and credit to the kind of the, the, mm. the impact on the uh, economy, which then mm. leads effectively people trying to find other forms of, 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 of employment. But, mm. but, but effectively what Kominsky argues is that credit is crucial for economic growth. And then when you have the growth of credit diminishing, mm -hmm. it has a considerable impact on uh, economic activity. Uh, and, 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 and then the key thing about Minsky is that he talks about growth, not the, not the level, but the growth. So, right. so, so it seems what you were, what you were saying here about the, uh, the, the ruble zone is that the growth of credit considerably mm. went down considerably as, as a result of the Russian, uh, Russian intervention bank, uh, the intervention of the Russian central bank, which then had a considerable impact on the, not only on this economy, but also on the regional economy. Yes, because credit is crucial for, as you know, uh, I know you're an anthropologist and, uh, and a scholar of, 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 of markets, uh, 
uh, credit is the is the is the lubricant that that fuels uh, the wheels of commerce. Uh, so, so once you have the, the 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 kind of you know the growth of credit going diminishing, it 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 inevitably has has that impact. Mm. But 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 what Minsky does, I think, is that he kind of attributes that to to poor regulatory uh, framework, um, and that may be kind of kind of useful just just as a way of kind of even maybe just like kind of kind of uh, contextually anyway. Um, I suppose then then my thing is this. That, that that the 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 growth of the bazaar then effectively is an outcome, unintended outcome it seems, of the the collapse of the economy. Uh, obviously, it wasn't it wasn't something that was intended by any means. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And 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 the search. I mean, I suppose there's 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 two searches for mm -hmm. for cash within the bazaar. Firstly, as you quite rightly point out, I think in your paper that the 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 uh, the search for 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 cash becomes important in order for people to make ends meet, but also importantly, cash becomes important to pay the market owners right. because the market yes. owners require cash. They don't yeah. they don't require you know yeah. IOUs, right? So yeah, yeah, so, yeah. so it's not what it's called that the uh, and of course. Yeah. If the uh, market traders are unable to create cash, well, then they get kicked out. Yeah. So, so, and, and of course, we don't know. I mean, I suppose that's another level to this: is that if if the uh, market traders borrowed money from the banks, let's say, mm. again, they need to create cash uh, because that's that's what the uh, the lenders want, uh, or or if they borrowed money from their relatives. Again, yeah. they need to get cash because yeah. it's not it's not you know their relatives or their friends as a friend or someone else, you know, could just get it say, oh, you know, I'll pay you two months' time, or what about if I just give you a bag of carrots or something like that and barter? Yeah, they, they don't want that. They want cash. Yeah. So I think the generation of cash becomes yeah. important because of the relationship, not just between the market traders and their customers, right, but also because of the market traders. And either the market owners, or, yeah. they, or or the market traders and the lenders. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's that's. I mean, uh, uh, that, that that's very correct. And in fact, I mean, one of the things that I that I've that I've argued elsewhere is that uh, bazaars are rent generating property. I mean, that's that's which is which is why they're so essential to to the larger political economy in which, and, and I think really speaks to the themes of of the first two presentations. In which you have a small group of people who wield extraordinary control over large segments of the economy, and I think bazaars are part of that story as well. And uh, sort of the the um, uh, yeah, I mean, sort of the literature on 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 credit, I would find very useful. So so if you could if you could share some of the, the references, I mean, I'd, I'd sort of really really appreciate that. Yep, <laughs> thank you. Uh, the uh, we're moving more or less to the next talk, but I just wanted to say, uh, Hassan, one of the, the, uh, the first important things that you pointed out, how mm. um, the public infrastructure uh, uh, mm. gets deployed in, in these things, and that, that those are the mitigating factors where you don't have the cash, and you can't, can't pay the, the, you know, the, the market owner, then you have other recourse, but then, then you have another negotiation with the police or other civil authorities mm. who will then push you back. So there's a lot, lot more than starts to, to happen as a dynamic system. Yeah. Uh, so we, we have a couple of more questions in the chat, but I would suggest maybe Hassan can respond to them in the chat just, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> uh, okay. uh, while we, we move on to the next speaker to keep in time and because we are doing that pretty well right now. <laughs> but Valiha, uh, to you. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you, Montil. And, uh, and again, uh, just to repeat, my, my thanks to Hassan for really fascinating uh, presentation. So next speaker, we have Shokan, uh, who completed his uh, PhD at Cambridge, uh, I think under the, under the supervision of Monto, I think. No, 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 not me. No, no, you, <laughs> he's, okay. He's, he's Peter Nolan's student, yeah. Oh, He'll tell himself. Right, yeah. Okay, yes, yeah. And, and, and I think he offers a really insightful understanding of the connection between science and neoliberalism and economic development. Um, uh, it's uh, with great pleasure that we have him. Uh, and uh, just to say something about him is that he's a professor uh, of 
of, of the uh, Kazakh British Technical University at Almaty. Thank you. Yep. No. Uh, am I muted now? Can you hear me now? Fantastic. We'll end. Great. So let me share my presentation. Mm -hmm. So, oh, well, can you see me? Can you see the presentation? Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Montu, Dr. Saxena. Thank you, Baliha. Dr. Sangera, uh, for this fantastic opportunity to speak to speak up on such a vibrant and really essential topic. And the, as Baliha mentioned in the beginning, the, it's um, the moment is very timely because, um, in my view, all post-Central Asian or post-Soviet Central Asian countries and Russia have just uh, really recently started finding their own path beyond um, beyond those first the Soviet development and uh, nowadays uh, from the neoliberal discourse uh, to which uh, all the nations dedicated 30 years of, of, uh, of time. And that's um, really now it's a, it's, a, it's a time has come as always in history to look back and to wait uh, whether the, all the babies were thrown with water or not. And just uh, uh, I see ourselves because I belong to to both the Soviet and post-Soviet um, identities, uh, it seems that um, we threw away too many babies, and now fortunately we are looking for them, trying trying to give birth to new ones <laughs> using the old skills and possibly good health. Um, so my talk is about um, fundamental science in the innovation chain and modernization. questioning the post-Soviet neoliberal development, development. But before going into more detail of, of the impact this, this theory and its um, implication had on, on the old post-Soviet society, it is necessary to, to have a look not from inside, but, but rather from outside. I mean, to have a look at from a global perspective, because uh, whether we want it or not, um, everyone in post-Soviet society um, became less and less actors on, on the world arena and becoming more dependable on the um, external factors and, and the global development, of course. And if we look at uh, talking about science, if we look at the, uh, some sort of um, uh, directions which uh, humankind may, may go or may follow, of course, we, we have nothing less than uh, the UN 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, so-called SDG. Uh, they are now mentioned throughout everywhere, from here, from there, in, in, in connection with different areas of our life. But truly, it's, it's a kind of indicators we should follow if you want to reach a, a development. And, uh, and but however, what is not really elaborated there, if you look closely at all these 17 goals uh, describing this very familiar to you picture, you could see that at least 14 out of 17 goals are not achievable without science. And actually, I mean fundamental science above all. Um, for instance, you may look at no poverty. Of course, we can't reach poverty without um, growing economies. And economy, of course, today's economies everywhere in the world, most of the world, is dri it, it, driven by science-induced technology. Zero hunger is, is, is uh, directly connected to it as well. So without agriculture, without science, modern agriculture is impossible. I'm not talking about good health and well-being. All of us have faced with this problem within the last two years. Now, now we know how important is healthcare, how important is vaccination, how important is, is, um, is a, a developed system of healthcare allowing to fight COVID-19 in this case. And, and, and we could see a fantastic development when, when all these vaccines were developed. And actually one of them was developed in Kazakhstan. We Is I think is most of these goals, uh, quality education, it's, it's um, intrinsically connected to, to science. 
without um, science, you, we wouldn't have a quality education. And the same is, is, is about it, affordable and clean energy and industry innovation and infrastructure. I hope climate action, which is extremely important for Central Asia and for the globe uh, in general, all of them are impossible to achieve without having a foundation of developed fundamental science. And I will explain uh, in more details uh, why and how it's related to Central Asia then and now. Um, the thing is that um, the humankind um, have faced it particularly dramatically within the last a couple of centuries. If only one inven inven invention, if it's, uh, it's of a steam engine, have had, oh, sorry, changed the, the whole course of the 19th century, all events, geopolitics, uh, industrializations, um, wars, wars uh, the establishment of colonial powers in the rest of the world. Um, at least all around five fundamental discoveries uh, determine the course of the events in the, in the next the 20th century. So um, the crucial one was the discovery by J.J. Thompson in Cambridge in, 90, uh, sorry, in 1897 of Electron, uh, which allowed it to have all the high tech, which is in another, in another way called electronic industry, was developed due to the, this discovery and introduction of electricity, then internal combustion engine, which determined the war of uh, the wars of motors, uh, which both uh, world, uh, wars were. And, uh, and is, again, establishment of the new borders, uh, the rise and fall of the Soviet Union, the Cold War, the collapse within it of the colonial system. Uh, and transition to a new colonial system. But all this was witnessed and all these changes became feasible, doable. Uh, first of all, because of the discoveries, scientific discoveries. And the thing is that the process hadn't stopped at all. We keep living in this and in, now we're living in the new industrial revolution. And it's, a, it, and it's not going to be driven by one or handful of discoveries. It's going to be driven by groups of, of discoveries uh, in various uh, spectrums of, uh, of uh, scientific disciplines in which, um, for instance, Dr. Saxena is engaged with, with, a, with, a front, um, with the front line of the quantum uh, line. And, and uh, many believe that this quantum reality, quantum discoveries will change our life to the extent which we were much greater than, than the impact of the of previous industrial revolution. And the first phase we, we, act, we actively involved in nowadays is, 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 um, is a telecommunication and communication revolution, which we, we can see through digital tran informatization, transformation, and, uh, and the birth of communication, and especially social communications, which became possibly possible due to the um, scientific movement. And here is important to, to um, go into more detail, explaining the difference, because uh, a main problem is that, that many people live in, um, in a sort of a bubble of information, which was created by mass media and economic and business literature in order to attract investors. But a, a proper close, deeper look would allow us to say, and, and it is um, that fundamental science is really lies in the heart of all the invention, innovation, and uh, and, 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 and it's a basic point of, of the innovation chain. And here is the difference, which is not clearly articulated between science and technology, uh, because many people under science sometimes understand or imply technology, whereas technology, uh, whereas science or basic research in American English is propositional knowledge, knowledge of what, which allow, allow us to understand the nature of, uh, or the, the nature of nature, the nature of things, the nature of processes. Whereas technology and uh, very much connected um, engineering to it is prescriptive knowledge or know-how, which is the knowledge that prescribes certain actions that constitute the manipulation of the natural phenomenon for human material needs, which means in other words, production. And according to Joel Mocker, an increase in the set of prescriptive knowledge allows society to produce cheaper and, and better good products. It is at the heart of the economic growth process. And all the several levels of engineering, which is very complicated um, uh, scenery, we're not going into detail of it because our lecture is about slightly different, but it, it's uh, all applied science, sciences, as it was called in, in, in a Soviet methodology. 
it bridges science and technology. And main problem, as I mentioned, that current economic methodology doesn't distinguish, does not delineate science from uh, fundamental and uh, applied science, the science from engineering. And they all uh, hidden under the umbrella of the term of IND, research and development. So uh, all together with Dr. Satyana, we develop a conventional LNA model to, to describe um, this process. So uh, what is really important is the ecosystem, which is a social and education development. And uh, as um, Ilya Matveev previously said about how important uh, equality is for social harmonization of, of this system. But in, in this system, um, in which it implies also equality, education, and, and developed culture, because science and culture, they always go, to, go hand in hand together and intrinsically connected to each other. And they are all both different uh, phenomena which, which uh, allow us to cognite nature, but by different principles. Um, and science, it's, uh, it's always driven by curiosity. It is not driven by economic motivation or a rather kind of material incentives. It's always driven by a really a human uh, a phenomenal uh, feature. It's a holy curiosity, as Einstein called it. And if you open any uh, Nobel laureate speech or any ask any scientist, including Taksena, who is present here, uh, they would tell you that Everything that what brought them into science was curiosity to uh, learn things, and actually that was described by ancient uh, philosophers like um, Aristotle's Metaphysics twenty five hundred years ago began with that every human is uh, um, is is striving to, to to understand the world, and all this from science uh, through seven levels of engineering, we now only entering the, the, the realm of technology innovation uh, in which, um, which turn this knowledge, both uh, uh, propositional and uh, prescriptive into the, uh, making them useful for good or commercial uh, gain. This creates industry, economy, and finance. In post-Soviet society, it's very often we think, ah, okay, we, uh, we made fund, uh, finance all right, we create financial systems, we would develop trade, and then we, we, we would, we would um, um, fund um, technology, maybe we will use technology transfer, but science is taken culture. Once we have free, some free money, we will give something to eat for, 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 for pleasure of, 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 of being human. Uh, in fact, it's, uh, everything is upside down. So it, what is important is it's an education, it's an ecosystem. Uh, uh, equality is an incredible uh, determinant uh, of it, leading to science and culture, because without science, we're not going to have culture in modern society and vice versa. And this is uh, create the most um, stable uh, fundament, uh, um, foundation for the development of all other um, material e e economy. Um, to illustrate how such model works in practice, I, out of um, millions uh, of examples, I chosen one, uh, which is connecting the Soviet Union and connecting the, the thinking we all have in our hands, uh, for instance, iPhone or other Androids. And it's due to the Soviet um, physicist, uh, Jory Ivanovich Althorov, discovery of uh, semiconductor heterostructures. You actually can see them at the bottom of, the, of, of your screen. And uh, which um, this discovery allows um, conductivity between dissimilar materials, providing all this, um, um, all this connection and conductivity again. So according to the uh, president of Royal Swedish Academy of Scientists, which awards the Nobel uh, Prizes, Without Althorov, it would not be possible to transfer all the information from satellite down to the earth or to have so many telephone lines between cities. And, um, and you can see how it works during this uh, current global economic pandemic, actually, down, downturn. We, on, we can see the capitalization of, of such giants or new high-tech company as Apple or Zoom which we are using now, and we can use it due to mostly and mainly contributedly by, uh, by, by uh, academician authorities um, that we can transfer. 
And even uh, Althor, when he was asked about uh, by um, another journalist at Samara University back in 2017, uh, asked about how technological advances I found, he said, I'm, I I'm tired of answering this question. Actually, there are two basic technologies at the heart of every iPhone. It's, uh, it's a silicon chip, which again is a, uh, was developed with the contribution of the Soviet engineer Alek Losev back in uh, 1927 and the semiconductor heterostructures with allowed uh, conductivity, which was actually the author of discovery. So this, this model works in, in all, it's applicable to all technology science and technology world that is really not fully reflected in economic and business literature. And, and this is the problem Kwat Akinjanov mentioned that our policymakers and whole society, so terms, uh, went deeply, thank deeply, in, into the into the realm of this economic language, when all this indicators, economic indicators, GDP, and all these things became prevalent, and and they were prevailing all over so, importance of social development, the importance of education, importance of culture, and above all science, and um, um, and before talking about how it actually happened on the example of Kazakhstan, it's necessary to shed a bit of light on how the system interacts into the, not into the innovation chain, but how interact in the, in the, on the, in the, the nation's perspective, in the country's perspective. So we can see uh, here in the triple helix innovation model, which was developed at Stanford University with the participation, participation of some European researchers, we can see three basic models of how um, this world today is organized. So the most developed and most harmonious, if you wish, model is considered to be uh, the model three, which is a balanced, balanced triple helix model in which all the, the center of the helices, which is actually uh, state, industry, academia, they all um, co are coherent, creating this innovation core, which is marked by black. This core is it's a, it's a guarantee the rotational movement of all helices, providing development in such a way. And, and um, uh, it's a uh, guarantee if, if one of the centers underperformed and uh, all of these things. Uh, so this innovation core is important. However, a problem lies that um, this model is applicable only for a few countries in the world. And they are really small countries like um, um, for instance, Singapore or Switzerland. Whereas in the, in the most of the Western developed world, like uh, Western Europe, US or Japan, um, a model two working in which all the three centers of the helices, uh, i.e. state, industry and academia, have been developing for centuries independently on each other. And the industrial policies of these countries are directed on, on the, on, on the um, on the providing uh, of getting the centers closer to each other. So um, incentivizing uh, donation, uh, incentivizing uh, uh, industry to donate more to the state, uh, to academia. And the state is encouraging this policy actually, and it's slightly different. Whereas for developing countries, um, we can see what, when they um, come to the uh, world arena of uh, competition and industrial development, they may see that, that, that they may have only one leverage left in their hands, which is a state policy. And this state policy encouraging or actually funding or investing into the development of industry and academia, somehow um, consuming them inside, despite the problem it might have with a, a, with a, um, with a bureaucratization and uh, um, uh, slow movement, this model is workable. And actually this model is the USSR. And this model also was developed in Poland and, and China, which is a number two economy nowadays, and even exceeding in the number of um, academic uh, journal publication, it's number one. And even according to Nature Index, which was established on research institution all over the world, um, established in 2016, uh, China is, is taking the Chinese, the Chinese Academy of Sciences is taking position number one. Uh, and here is the example of Kazakhstan. If in, we are talking about the territory in which a hundred years ago, there were only 15 engineers of, of, of Kazakh origin among 576. There were only two libraries. There was no single university. We're not talking about uh, uh, scientific research. 
And educate, education was, was around a few, a few percent. Um, and educated people were considered those who can, who can uh, write a surah from the Holy Quran or, or new arithmetic, not, not more. Just in 15 years, the following was established. Well, and you may see, you may see this, this impressive figure, 12 IND Institute, uh, experimental station, 186 hydro station, and so on. So the, the main focus was on the development of human capital, which also uh, led to the following result. So comparing this 14 engineers or 576 overall, uh, um, we receive, um, we in Kazakhstan, uh, received uh, almost 178,000 people of intelligence. It's difficult to distinguish uh, between scientists or not scientists there, but believe me, with all the whole policy of politicization of the society, the, this technical scientific line was prevailing. So most of the books in the library, despite propaganda and all those things, were dedicated to the questions of uh, science and technology. So most of the establishment of the higher education were oriented towards uh, uh, it as well. And the same, the school, high school curricula, they were about uh, mostly about physics and mathematics, uh, um, chemistry and biology. So a uh, whole system effort was inclined into the developing science and technology and developing, developing this angle, developing this philosophy and scientific philosophy and um, scientific thinking. Uh, more importantly, in 1932, the first branch of the Academy of Sciences was established, which um, through transformation in 1936, in 1946 became uh, the National Academy of Sciences of Kazakhstan. And uh, as described by James Peck, uh, the development of science and culture, which was resulted from the implementation of, of the social and educational policies um, in the global discourse, the term vernastization was replaced by modernization and made what happened mostly due to the successes of uh, Central Asian countries, Soviet Central Asian countries in the late 40s and 60s, 50s, which became so appealing for the leaders of, uh, of, of the rest of, the, of, of Asia. In the left-hand side, you can see uh, Kunaev, Din Muhammad Kunaev, at that time, 1955, as uh, the second secretary of the Communist Party of Kazakhstan. And you can see the first secretary behind it, behind is, is uh, Leonid Brezhnev, a future general secretary of the USSR. And they were accepting Jabakhawal Nehru and Indira Gandhi in Almaty. Uh, and, it, and, uh, and his visit was driven by the um, desire of the Indian elite, of the Indian policymakers to find a path for India, to, to make um, as successful as, as the Soviet uh, Central Asian Republic had been. On, um, in the middle, you can see Fidel Castro visiting Uzbekistan in 1963, the same. He wanted to look, have a look at how this is uh, for developing, for undeveloped countries, what uh, the past uh, of the Soviet past could be successful. And on the right hand side, it's, it's a Tashkent uh, Film Festival uh, for Latin America, Africa, and, and, and Asian countries, which is extremely uh, successful. And Tashkent was really like a capital of Asia uh, of those times which is, I believe, now Shanghai. And uh, talking about the impact of this neoliberal policies, which were so beautifully discussed in, in the, in the uh, previous parts of our uh, workshop, you can see that um, the Academy of Sciences was um, developing research in all whole spectrum of the modern dis scientific disciplines. And, and you can see that Academy of Science included five departments uh, by the field of science and, the, and a regional department in Karaganda, and the, which consisted of 49 institutes, in which in turn, 38 were specializing in science and 11 in social sciences. And uh, all this, uh, with, um, despite the views which some may have on the role of science in development, and or technology in economy, everyone would agree that such a colossal capital is really difficult to achieve. This is this this what was um, really put Kazakhstan and other Soviet republics into the category of the of the first two worlds and the third world. But it happened within within just a few decades, 
And it's important that first, and Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, both are classical examples how um, this was developed. First, research and education was, were established. And after that, industrialization began. And this model uh, is believed uh, was used in, in the, the most massive technology transfer in history, which was the Soviet one to China in the 1940s, uh, late 40s till 1965 when uh, the USSR invested 7% of its uh, annual income into the development of, of China. And, and here, as you can see, that there are no socialist or capitalist physics. The foundation of the industrial society, of any industrial society, is, is, is uh, I described beforehand. And you can see this, this um, academic sort of mini academic city or terrain in the center of Almaty, in which the Academy of Science is building. And there you could see all this um, institute of chemistry, um, catalysis, uh, metallurgy, astrophysics, uh, geology, geological sciences, hydrogeology, and so on, and mathematics, history. They all were all created the same thing you can experience in Cambridge. And the most prominent feature of it is the special atmosphere which you, you enter immediately, you can send, which, which encourage you to exchange knowledge and information, to create new multidisciplinary uh, knowledge, uh, which can come from analysis and synthesis. And this is still, till now, even the academy is almost dead, and now it's the NGOs. Uh, and it's, it's still the atmosphere, the atmosphere is still there. So um, it's actually this atmosphere and this, of course, research led to what is according to Saxena, um, that many electronic devices in use today globally contain materials invented in the Soviet Union, including Kazakhstan. And on the right hand side, you can see Kanish uh, Sapayev. Um, he was the founder of the academy and the uh, geologist and uh, Due to him, Kazakhstan has potentially a, a huge future in, 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 in the high tech of, the, of this and next centuries, because all this high tech involves uh, rare earth metal. They are the heart of any uh, magic processes happening in our computers and uh, everywhere else. And uh, only two countries have the, the whole spectrum of the rare earth metal. It's I, Russia and Kazakhstan. Whereas China is the main uh, import, exporter, but, but the whole spectrum is in our bowels. And, uh, and the impact of that liberal policy, as we can realize now that without development of science, we, we, we can't really talk about the future, especially in the time when the, a new industrial revolution is coming. And most of the tools and the economy, even the energy sector are about to change within a decade or so. But Soviet spending, which, which reached in its absolute uh, records up to date, up to 7-8% uh, of, of GNP, of Russian, of Soviet, sorry, GNP, whereas 5% were contributed to the development of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, which is the mostly uh, fundamental research. And um, if we look closer, and the level of, uh, of uh, decision-making and policy-making, you can see on this on this almost um, satirical example, when Mstislav Keldes had been the head, the president of the academy, explained to Alexei Kasigin uh, that one or two pages is enough for you to for such a uh, broad funding, because uh, bureaucrats can't understand science. You should be really trained for years and educated for years, if not decades, to get into this. Um, complicated, really complex and uh, real. And uh, sadly, the current expenditures of the three countries making the, the foundation of the Eurasian Economic Union, you can see that, 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 that it's in the Russian best case, it's slightly more than 1%, whereas in Belarus and Kazakhstan, and believe me, in the rest of the Central Asian countries, even less, it's, it's, uh, we, 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 they can't support the development of all this spectrum of the research and they can't invest into education it's simply not enough and market condition... Jokhan, I'll, I'll have to ask you yeah. to conclude okay. in a couple two minutes yeah you have two minutes to conclude yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay great and once uh, the Kazakhstan now it, it, it's 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 a between two models 
it hadn't really left the Soviet model of education, but hadn't yet reached the model of education uh, of Anglo-Saxon uh, system, where university are considered to be center of research. Simply because of this neoliberal policies doesn't allow universities um, to get funding. From, it's impossible to fund science from market. Everywhere in the world, up to 90% of the funding is coming from the state, be it the US, the UK, the Soviet Union, China, or um, all other developed countries. It's the state is, is a main investor and it contradicts to all this, um, everything declared in all the neoliberal courses which are spread and established in mass media and in, in, in social, uh, social thinking. However, we, we can't stop and here with, with, uh, with Saxena, we develop, for instance, it's like not to be um, pathetic, but telling the, uh, the, the detail of, what, of the direction of new industrial revolution, that each of, of the world science with Kazakhstan can be hugely involved. We know people, we know, but there is a lack of policy. And the first thing to get rid of this policy is, is, is to go into, um, uh, to, to leave, to leave the neoliberal impact. But first, thank you very much for this um, um, presentation, uh, uh, for this uh, workshop, because one of the first steps is to discuss it before we could elaborate a, a, a policy. And uh, every brick imposed uh, or built in into this new building is extremely important. And in conclusion, I would like again to cite Monto Saxena that it's not economic perspective alone, which is important. So we should abandon this, this language of terms, of, of, of concept of looking from these economic indicators. And, 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 and the, the carrier of this philosophy, not economic one, was this uh, Mr. Kunaev, who I mentioned beforehand. This is his car that found a home. And uh, it's, he was also, although he was a, a member of Politburo, of Soviet Politburo, he was given cards of uh, being mining engineer. He said, positions, political positions come and go, but mining engineer is forever. Thank you very much. Hope I was practically on time. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, questions? They, I, I, I didn't think this is going to generate too many questions immediately. Uh, but uh, one uh, important point while people are thinking about is that uh, to reiterate what was embedded in what Jokan was saying is that how specifically the extractive industries, both oil and mining industries, uh, how they're connected to the global supply chains and, the, and, and they necessitate that these um, commodities remain as cheap as possible uh, uh, when they're brought out of the Kazakhstan. So the, the local idea of local value add, which comes from the processes to come describing, uh, needs to be somehow uh, reined in or subverted. Uh, and this is a story not just about Central Asia, but, but certainly it, it's very much applicable here. So uh, while education, as you can see across the Central Asian space, has become, uh, first of all, confused. The fact that you have the, the, the Academy of Sciences have now been more or less dissolved or, or diminished in their, their standing. Uh, universities are supposed to become research universities. Uh, however, the, the funding, timing and everything else is not put in place. And so education is also commoditized. Uh, rather than being linked to scientific development and research. The, the, the sim simple thing, as many of you uh, uh, have always uh, stated, that uh, how to become a research university, that, that here we have, um, for example, in, in Cambridge, we have not only funding, but we are given time to do research. Right? Uh, that aspect is very much missing in the planning. And then, again, you trace all of that back to particular new liberal values that are promoted, uh, that, that, that education should be bought and it's quality of education, you should teach more classes and, and, and the volume of that to be delivered. So anyway, that's that. We have some points uh, being made in the chat. Uh, uh, yes. Chokan, can you see the chat? 
Yeah, yeah. So uh, Dinara Abu said that I, I should have shortened the history part because the ending was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah, I could refer. Yeah, I could refer to my uh, my lecture on YouTube if you find it with, uh, in, in Russian. There is a there is a bigger version there. Uh, Balihar, please. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Shukhan, for uh, for an interesting presentation. Um, I suppose I would have liked you to kind of uh, kind of kind of tease out more the connection, the interconnection between the state research and uh, and the corporate sector. I wasn't quite clear how uh, the neoliberalization was able to benefit from research which is funded by the state. So, 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 so let me give you an example of this. So we know that, um, um, uh, for example, the COVID vaccination that was developed at Oxford University was largely funded by the state and by the university. It was funded largely through taxpayers' money. Yet this has been, this has been incentivized, privatized by the, uh, by the pharmaceutical industry. Partly because they are able to uh, patent their, able to patent their their, their so-called uh, inventions, which is funded by the, by, by the state, or copyrighted in some, one form or another. And I'm kind of reminded here of the work of, and, 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 and I don't know whether you, you know her work, but, but, but she has written a fair bit on science, science and neoliberalism. Uh, Marina Masakoti, uh, who talks about how Neoliberalism is not so much about the lack of funding for, for, for the research that's, that's kind of happened within neoliberalism, but rather how corporate sectors have been able to patent research undertaken by universities funded by the state. And that's a specific form of neoliberalism that has taken place. Yeah, thank you. Um, Baliha, this, that's the thing I, I keep focusing on. It's the difference between science and technology, between fundamental research and engineering. Because the thing you are talking about now, it's multi and corporate sector is engaged with, it, it's, uh, it's industrial research and it's engineering. But it, it can't develop without uh, expertise, knowledge, which is concentrated in, in the fundamental basic research. That is why all these corporate sectors, industrial engineering, gather around universities or gather around um, um, any scientific research thing, because on, on practically on every day basis, they need in the engineers, they are trained differently. Of course, uh, without science, they wouldn't have become engineers, but they need uh, more, a deeper knowledge on everything they face on the engineering basis with them but uh, fun, but basic research is not patented it's open information it's like atomic bam, bomb the structure of atom which was mostly discovered in, in cavendish lab in cambridge uh, and all of this is open access knowledge but the bomb itself is engineering which may be part uh, may be part of secrecy may be patented or not and all this is very important to to, to distinguish but what was good about Kazakhstan and, and the other Soviet Republic, that they already in place have the precursor, the necessary precursor, required for development of the rest of the innovation chain, including uh, engineering, technology, and innovation. Because without science, without this level of expertise, nothing is impossible. You can't get, even, even with technology transfer, everyone talks about nowadays, you should be as good as the source of your input. I don't. I, I don't necessarily dispute that. I mean, I, I think. I think. I think. I think that's. That's. I think. I think but, that's fine. But yeah, I. I might uh, plug into uh, just to answer your specific point that you made. Uh, ask about the 
the patent and so on. So what uh, uh, Matsukoto uh, has obviously written quite a lot about it, but there is a, there is still more, how to say, uh, layers to the story. So if, if I describe yep. the process, the, the way neoliberal industrial system, whatever, extracts from state. Uh, so, so it happens at all levels. One level Chuck already described. So first and most important product uh, that education is, is the student or the, the worker, which is largely in, without that nothing starts, right? The second thing that has become more modern thing, which is horrendously promoted in uh, post-Soviet space, is this idea of startups. You know, and the patent story is linked to that. So what, what happens really is that at the expense of state, risk is taken and, and many of the startups fail and what succeeds is then appropriated by the industry, uh, uh, you know, to the corporate sector, I want to say. Yeah? So, so, so that, that has become systematic, and, but in, in some sense, we have some safeguards here uh, in, in critiquing that uh, as academics and, and, you know, and we decide how far we want to go, how far we want to participate in that. We have the choice. But what's happening in the post-Soviet space, Russia, Central Asia, else, the choice is what's subverted by the neoliberal thinking of the state, saying that that's what you have to do. Exactly. Uh, the, the, so that's where the, the biggest problem lies. And so when you apply for a grant or when you apply for whatever, you front end declare how many papers and patents you will produce, as if it, it, it can be done, in a sense, right? So it becomes transactional rather than productive. Uh, so it becomes what Hassan uh, uh, was talking about, Bazaar, like it's really, no innovation is needed, do not innovate, because that will cause problems, and it costs money. So that's where the, the link really is made. Uh, we have a question from Nikita, please, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, I want to ask you a question, uh, whether do you think the state must or has to regulate how much benefit corporations and businesses may get from science, and, from science advances. For example, we might speak about advances in robotics, automatization, and artificial intelligence. What do you think about this? I, again, my opinion, and once, once uh, fundamental research is concerned, the less is regulated by the state or by the bureaucrat, the better. I mean, like, ideally, it should be zero interference. It shouldn't be regulated at all. So the fund, but it's very painful for bureaucrats to pay for satisfying someone's curiosity, which science at the bottom is. And it's difficult to explain uh, and understood without proper training. That is why it's... Um, necessary among policymakers to have a sufficient amount of um, properly educated people. And properly, I mean, in this sense, uh, educated in, in science and technology. And if, talk, if we are talking about the corporate sector or, and all these um, new sectors, of course, it should be regulated. And actually it's regulated everywhere, but to what extent and how if you have sufficient amount of these policymakers who really understand informatization, digitalization, or artificial intelligence, then you would possibly receive a, 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 a smart regulation, sort of encouraging really pro, uh, potentially prosperous direction of research and really discouraging. But it should be driven not by mass media, social blogs, or something else, it should be driven by real knowledge. But the problem of nowadays is that the knowledge is became equal in social environment, in social ecosystem to opinion. And the really, the hierarchy of knowledge has been uh, uh, firmly out and hugely affected. And this is one of the main nowadays, not only for the post-Soviet countries, it's just a truth about, possibly the whole world nowadays with them less less related to China. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, quite, do I ask briefly want to ask you a question? And can I ask Chukan to briefly uh, respond to yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll try my best, uh, thank you. Because, 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 because we do want to keep the time and, uh, and, and we don't want to encourage too much into people's lunch. 
Okay, Program, thank you very much for your interesting accounts. My question in the, from the perspective of today's topic uh, about this uh, economic reforms and everything and connecting uh, your topic, then it's more a common problem. Maybe you will deliberate a little bit more. Uh, pessimistically saying, I don't see any exit from this situation when uh, our countries, uh, Kazakhstan particularly, is embedded in this neoliberal governance that there will be any uh, catch-up strategies, will any catch-up strategies will work uh, in Kazakhstan with this kind of mode of regulation. Okay, even having this great tradition of the Soviet style without irony in uh, the very modern uh, kind of, uh, what is say, huge leap forward during 1950s Till 1980s, 70s in science and everything, even having this tradition, uh, I believe that because of this neoliberal governance, you know, we have dozens and dozens of cases when the yesterday's members of uh, scientific elite intelligence, they turned the most successful, so to speak, uh, our former members of uh, Academy of Science, they turned into the owners of the private universities, if you remember, you know that, in the 1990s, and still now. And they, are pre they turned into very, pretty much successful business-oriented businessmen who, and uh, I, I expect that uh, Balihar would tell us more how they reap these benefits. They turned these universities into these uh, rentier uh, making profits, you know. Yeah. I, I, so I, I there is would, no exit. So again, there is there, there is only political choice, and I I'm not political. pessimist, but my understanding is that there is no exit. I I, I don't I think there there will be a dis disagreement on this point uh, uh, very much. So, but you can can you respond? We really need to yeah. cut yeah. for lunch. Just yeah. a few seconds. I yeah. would say that there are some positive trends. Uh, all right. However, the problem is, is uh, really the competence of the policymakers because they were not trained, they were not educated in this realm of scientific technology. And this uh, economical, economic and economics education has really become the problem because people can't get out of, the, of this terminology methodology which was imposed. Uh, and really scientific uh, um, terminology and philosophy lies beyond that. Uh, however, we have trends, but, but let's see how, how we will cope. But without the state and without changing the science policy, which is the most, because all these funds which are now tended to be increased, they may, they may be diluted and fragmented among all these different bodies, including those rectors and universities. If not a united, coherent, and, and, and intelligent science policy is elaborated. And, yeah. and Tina was asking about the uh, interregional cooperation in science and technology in Central Asia. Unfortunately, no. I don't know examples. There are some, but... Um, I, um, yeah, that, it's a topic for different discussion. So I, I thank you. Thank you, Chokan. Uh, we will reconvene in uh, exactly 26 minutes. <laughs> uh, so... <Won't> <laughs> So yes, yeah. uh, so we come back at two o'clock UK UK time. Thank you guys. Thank you. I can see Adam. Hi. Hi. Okay. Catch you later, Montu. Yeah. See you shortly. Okay. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming back and joining us for the second part of the uh, workshop. And I'm really delighted that we have Tomasa here, who is a highly respected scholar who's worked for so long on uh, uh, Central Asia and has contributed considerably to our understanding of labor and uh, uh, other issues, uh, especially in uh, uh, Kazakhstan. So, I'm, I'm really I'm delighted that we have to master. Um, and as I said, his publications are considerable as well. Um, just to say, uh, Tomaso is an associate professor at the Department of Asia, African and, Med and Mediterranean Studies at the University of Naples or L Oriental. Thank you, Tomaso.
Thank you very much, uh, Balihar, for your kind words and uh, also to Montu and you uh, for inviting me, for having you, uh, for having me uh, with you and discussing my work. And I think I can uh, share a PowerPoint now. Let's see. Should work. Does it look nice? Good, it works. Very nice. So um, I uh, am now in the uh, position of making a slight uh, shift from the, um, um, uh, say, uh, uh, analytical angles uh, that we had in this morning. Uh, it is uh, ethnography's turn right now. And um, what I will uh, be going to talk about uh, is um, uh, through the prism of one particular case study, uh, the steel plant uh, uh, in uh, Timirtau in central Kazakhstan, uh, uh, I will address the transformation of industrial labor and industrial uh, communities uh, from the Soviet to the uh, uh, post-Soviet and, and present time uh, period. And now this is a project that has been in the making already since uh, uh, some time. A few work goes back 2013-14, but still, I'm a bit puzzled about uh, how to tag, how to, you know, uh, give a name to the particular industrial trajectory that uh, we are uh, witnessing. So is it really post-industrial or neoliberal? Uh, I have my doubts uh, and uh, I think that uh, because pragmatism is so uh, prominent in the vicissitudes of this uh, 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 town, uh, which also talks uh, to more broad, uh, broadly to situation of labor in Kazakhstan and in, in Central Asia. And I will show you how in a minute. So my plan now is to talk a little bit about the context of the research, uh, and then I will uh, skip uh, history and really talk about the privatization and the private ownership regime uh, uh, to address in how far uh, neoliberalism applies. Uh, and then finally, I come really to the nitty gritty of the shop floor ethnography, which I conducted uh, in one part of this uh, large uh, steel town, uh, steel uh, uh, factory, uh, and in which I uh, analyze labor subjectivities that emerge through the, through the reforms. So uh, the, the, the work is on, uh, the focus is on um, uh, really the shop floor, the labor process, and in, in, in you want, if you want, it is a very uh, old-fashioned shop floor ethnography that I am uh, proposing, and uh, my uh, looks and incursions into the cities are very much seen from from the factory in which I've been carrying out the um, the research. Uh, is this visible? I hope so. So. Uh, I said a little bit of uh, uh, geography. Uh, Timirtau, you follow the red arrow, is situated in the heart of central Kazakhstan, surrounded by the steppe uh, named Saryarka. Uh, and it is at 200 kilometers from the uh, uh, capital and also then north of the south of the uh, Virgin Land uh, uh, Belt. Uh, it's, it is, if you want, together with Karaganda, really a sort of industrial oasis uh, uh, surrounded by, by the steppe. And in the Soviet period, it was uh, the most important industrial and urban agglomerate between uh, Novosibirsk and uh, Almaty. Um, so um, this uh, uh, industrial uh, hub uh, has been um, uh, characterized by the uh, Soviet experience very much. So the the people uh, coming there in various uh, epochs uh, were, uh, are now Russian speakers, uh, and, um, and it has a very marked uh, Soviet industrial legacy that uh, uh, still uh, characterizes, let's say, the, 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 the city culture. Uh, and so there were um, important German minorities, but all this uh, multi-ethnic uh, Soviet, Slavic, European, but not only uh, uh, koine of uh, 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 migration that has sedimented in Central Asia uh, over various uh, uh, decades. 
uh, so in, in, in the post-Soviet years, we, we have heard a great deal uh, about the crisis and the monetary and uh, industrial crisis in the talk uh, uh, before. Uh, this uh, heavy industry side entered in, in a deeper uh, uh, social and uh, productive crisis and entered in uh, its so-called Rust Belt uh, year. So you have really uh, um, a creeping uh, uh, deindustrialization, a fatigue of uh, keeping up with the past uh, uh, glory that was uh, not only of production, but also of a, of a whole industrial society. Uh, but no, nevertheless, uh, uh, this is a two uh, uh, um, unilateral and one-sided uh, uh, portrait of the Mirtau today, because the city has still a very active migration and its uh, demographic landscape has dramatically changed over the last 30 years with many people leaving uh, the city uh, for Germany and Russia mostly, but also many people coming to Temirtau attracted by the possibilities of making a living in industry, in heavy industry. And this is something that has been given uh, less attention. Um, so uh, rural Kazakhs mainly from the surrounding, from the South, uh, from Mongolia and Uzbekistan, uh, are um, the more, more uh, important uh, demographic uh, inflow. Uh, so nonetheless, we see from the picture and we see now the, the casting of the molten iron on the, on the city emblem. So Timirtau Gorod Medalurgov, so Timirtau, the, the city of steel workers, uh, it still retains very strongly this Soviet in, uh, industrial uh, identity. And the place is in fact unique uh, Temirtau is the largest uh, steel plant in Central Asia and the only uh, one which has an integ full integrated uh, uh, pr uh, production cycle. Uh, it was called Karmet Karagandicheski Metallurgicheski Kambinat in Soviet time and, and nicknamed uh, Magnitka. Uh, and uh, um, after uh, uh, the post Soviet years in 1995, uh, Karmet had been. Um, uh, privatized uh, to uh, the British Indian steel magnates uh, Lakshmi Mittal, uh, who took over uh, both the coal in Karaganda and the steel in Temirtau, this symbiotic heavy industry um, uh, complex, uh, and then uh, started to run it privately. So this is what I will be uh, talking uh, about uh, in, in a minute. And uh, so I, I have to say that this project in Temirtau is very much the product uh, of uh, a collective enterprise. It started uh, as an uh, outgrowth of a collective project at the Max Planck Institute for Social um, Anthropology in Halle, uh, where uh, together with other colleagues, uh, we were giving collective and uh, comparative glances on the world of heavy industries insights uh, uh, across uh, Eurasia and uh, uh, with a predilection for heavy industrial sites and the vicissitudes of the working class. Uh, so that gave me, so to say, a, a template. And we were in particularly interested in the forms of inequality, uh, really with a grassroots uh, view. So uh, hierarchies, uh, class transformations, and it, inequalities that were not just social, but maybe uh, ethnic, uh, religious, ideological, or whatever. Uh, and uh, uh, so came to the fore. And then the other very important questions regarded the forms of precarization and flexibilization, which are the two, two battle horses of neoliberalist studies, um, uh, were also, uh, were also uh, 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 on the fore. So I was interested is there a particularly Central Asian characteristic in this pre precarization? And uh, what is the particular encounter between uh, uh, global state capital uh, that here in the form of ArcelorMittal uh, that takes over uh, uh, um, uh, Soviet industry and then the nation building trajectory of a vigorously nationalizing state uh, and uh, the Kazakhification of uh, a region uh, that was until then very uh, Russian uh, dominated, uh, how does this go hand in hand with this important Soviet Russian industrial uh, legacies? Uh, and so look at state regulation, uh, regulation, property, citizenship, uh, forms of labor and employment, 
but last but not least at the power relations uh, at the point of production in the in the implicit understanding that looking at how uh, work and labor evolves uh, would uh, give also uh, insights that uh, merely focusing on narrative or discourse uh, would uh, give not. Now, really, a glimpse on the history of Carmet or Temirtau, uh, a metallurgical plant. Uh, it has a path, path with roots in the Karlag, in the Soviet Gulag experience, uh, in the World War II and uh, industrial relocation. Uh, through which uh, steel uh, uh, began to be uh, cast in uh, during World War II. Uh, but then it was built up through voluntary labor uh, during the Komsomol campaign of the uh, uh, late 50s and was also the site of the uh, well known uh, labor riots that occurred in, in, in Timirtau in 59 and that uh, uh, speak to the chaotic uh, uh, also beginnings of heavy industry in, uh, in the the Kazakhstani state. In 1960, uh, the first uh, um, blast furnace was uh, open among the workers, President Nur Sultan Nazarbayev, that uh, since then has its political destiny really linked uh, together with the whole generation of cadres that uh, uh, passed through the headquarters of this factory um, uh, in, the, in the ruling of the, on, of the country. In the 70s, uh, 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 Carmeta uh, was uh, not only producing steel, but really it was a society producing factory. Uh, the, the, the factory was as big as the nearby uh, city, uh, and uh, uh, the, it is 20 kilometers times six kilometers uh, surface. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the two cities really in the mono industrial town fashion uh, grew up uh, uh, symbiotically. Uh, and um, so workers were also neighbors uh, and uh, work on the shop floor was, uh, you know, attuned, accustomed also to the, uh, to the rhythm of the cities. Uh, uh, and so was providing the, the, the social, socialist welfare and also the privilege for what was understood as to be really the, the top of the industrial labor hierarchy. So together with the coal miners, the steel workers were, in fact, a, a really uh, privileged and well uh, uh, respected and well uh, uh, remunerated uh, uh, position. And so, uh, what uh, uh, happened with the end of the Soviet Union was also implicitly this fall from grace. Uh, so the 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 the, the steel workers. Uh, ended up from being at the top of the labor hierarchy of the Soviet Union into a very difficult uh, situation. So the, the years of Rasval, the, the economic breakdown, uh, put uh, uh, not only Karmet, but the whole region in an uh, existential uh, threat. Uh, and the, the uh, factory was uh, really at the, at the point of uh, closure, which would have uh, meant also uh, uh, switching off uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, heating and the electricity, uh, not only of the factory, but also of the city. And so uh, uh, the, the risk was quite existential. And in this sense, uh, after a, 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 a difficult period of transition in 1995, uh, uh, Lakshmi Mittal, uh, then uh, at the uh, beginning of uh, the career as an uh, industrial giant and nowadays uh, head at the top of the head of the most important steel uh, conglomerate uh, worldwide, uh, it managed to, to secure uh, a deal. And the deal uh, uh, signed in 95 uh, was in a way a much more a watershed moment for the people of Timirtau than uh, independence proper. Uh, since this started to change their livelihood and their conditions and their and the, the work situation in, in a very radical uh, way. Uh, so, it, as I said, it was difficult to find an um, investor because the, the, the factory was in a terrible shape and uh, modernizing it would have cost uh, 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 amounts that, uh, um, uh, that Kazakhstan absolutely lacked. Um, and so uh, uh, Mittal uh, was uh, very uh, uh, say assertive and uh, also took some risk uh, and uh, secured uh, a, a deal. The deal today is very criticized because it has been 
secretive. So workers today say um, that he got the, the factory uh, more or less uh, for free. Um, but uh, uh, when the deal was, was uh, uh, said, then he was at first really hailed as the savior uh, of, uh, of an otherwise condemned uh, mono-industrial uh, town. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so what were the, the conditions? So Metal received an Asian uh, uh, Development Bank grant, it was granted a, a, a decade-long tax holiday and exemption from environmental standards in production uh, to leave uh, him enough time to start with the modernization of this very aged and very polluting and anti-economic uh, uh, machinery. Uh, in, in a, uh, the deal was secured against the promise of uh, investing in the modernization, in keeping occupational levels, and also paying out the wage arrears for the uh, then 40,000 workers uh, that were waiting in the cold uh, without knowing how uh, it will develop. The deal was also advantageous for President Nazarbayev, which I see the, uh, has his political career uh, uh, and the reputation also linked to this uh, steel worker town and the city in fact uh, profited because it uh, awarded the, the, the worst. But over time, the workers uh, were to, may, were to may, made to pay uh, a high price uh, for this uh, deal because uh, their, their conditions uh, 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 um, worsened significantly uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, as I will be explaining you uh, in uh, uh, in a mi minute. Uh, so both uh, Nazarbayev and, and uh, um, uh, 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 Mittal, here we see them on a uh, billboard in front of the factory headquarters, uh, uh, were good, you know, in, in presenting um, uh, the, the deal as something, uh, a win-win uh, uh, beneficial, uh, and, uh, and uh, present uh, the new uh, private ownership uh, uh, regime as a forebringer of innovation and modernity. But this was mostly an effect of, uh, of the facade. So we, we have a new corporate culture, a new global brand, ArcelorMittal, uh, that arrives in Temer Tau uh, and introduces new health and safety policies, uh, introduces new payment system with incentives and, and, and penalties, uh, but also new languages. Whereas before Russian was the only language in, in, in Karmet, uh, then English and Kazakh start also to, to surface uh, in the factory. But their, their role is quite cosmetic. So uh, English is the, now the language of the a handful of uh, foreign uh, managers that uh, occupy uh, the financial department of the headquarters. Uh, and they are from India and they work thanks to the local uh, beautiful translators. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Kazakh is the language of, you know, the, the political connection uh, uh, that, uh, and the political offices in the headquarters. And as we will see also of a new, com a new coming, uh, a very unskilled, very precarious class of laborers that are not necessarily fluent in, in Russian but uh, Russian remains the main language and the backbone, uh, 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 you know, of the, of the organization and of the worker and of the skilled worker is very much in continuity uh, with, uh, with the, the, the past. So uh, uh, behind uh, this facade, which is very shiny and which has a very aggressive corporate social uh, responsibility policy and the media presence, uh, the reality of, uh, uh, the new uh, uh, um, private ownership regime was far grim, grimmer. And we have uh, plenty of problems uh, because uh, um, the, the modernization really stalled. Uh, and so uh, most of the machine is really the same and aging. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the investments lag behind and uh, the, the factory is becoming uh, year by year a more dangerous place despite the new health and safety uh, regulations. So pollution, health crisis, explosions, accidents uh, are on the everyday lines, but uh, in fact both the government and the company are in denial. So they accept this reality but then frame it in a way that 
uh, pushes away the the wind from the the uh, from the uh, 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 seal uh, from the ship uh, and uh, and uh, uh, um, the distracts the the attention from these urgencies. So um, what in, in the act we can we we can summarize uh, this uh, uh, privatization uh, uh, production regime is that machines and workers are squeezed by the uh, new uh, private ownership. Uh, they are used to the limit uh, for profit extraction. And so we have here really an interesting example of uh, uh, profit making in the modernization, because in fact, uh, uh, the modernization is only punctual and, uh, uh, and uh, only uh, uh, inserted only where it makes uh, 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 economic uh, uh, sense, I, otherwise uh, the, the attempt is to save costs and, and money. And so uh, we can also rephrase this uh, ownership regime in one of uh, uh, austerity. Uh, so the new regime basically uh, consists very much in cost saving measures uh, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and not so much in the uh, 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 quick, uh, uh, you know, modernization, which was very duly needed uh, of the uh, Soviet age um, uh, machines. Uh, nonetheless, in the over the first decade of the 2000s, the factory made beautiful gains, and three factors were concomitant: uh, the high steel price over, uh, uh, overall, uh, uh, the fact that the Chinese steel competition did not still. Uh, uh, take off uh, uh, and the low labor costs uh, that uh, were mostly translated uh, in the factory in a gradual erosion of uh, uh, labor force. So we see that from the privatization until the field work, the uh, uh, labor force was uh, halved. Um, and uh, uh, together with the shrinking of the regular labor force, we have uh, the appearing of a new form of work, uh, the per the, uh, um, uh, the uh, non-permanent, the, the, the contract work, the contingent temporary worker that steps in to support uh, uh, the main worker where uh, the labor force uh, is not sufficient anymore. And so this comes with a cheapening of the labor and also with a pressure on the regular labor force. And so this division between contract and company labor was the most important inequality that uh, I could witness and, and find uh, in, in, in the uh, industrial uh, labor class. And it's in fact not limited only to the steel plant and talks to a more general uh, pattern. Uh, now, uh, nonetheless, uh, the, the story of uh, 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 struggle between labor and capital is that of a half success, of a partial success in Temirtau, because in fact the plans for precarization, for flexibilization of labor were far more ambitious. Uh, uh, so uh, by comparing with other steel plants worldwide, uh, we see that uh, uh, ArcelorMittal Temirtau gradually uh, became uh, from, you know, the prestige object at the beginning that allowed Mittal to, began, to begin a global career, more and more to a problem child in which the policies could not be implemented fully. So the idea was to implement the neoliberal X, as you see here, meaning that on the Cartesian uh, graphic, uh, uh, you would have, uh, you know, the regular labor force going towards zero uh, and the uh, uh, precarized labor force, so the green one, going to, to the up, uh, forming an, an X, of a full precarization, which has uh, happened more or less, uh, for instance, in India and has been described by uh, uh, colleagues uh, and, for instance, in the work of Jonathan Parry. Another uh, model that uh, ArcelorMittal implemented elsewhere, for instance, in Poland, was that of the uh, 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 vertical slash, as we see here in the second, where then uh, regular labor erodes, uh, contract labor is not implied, but uh, a high cost, uh, a high investment in a modernization of the machinery is also uh, introduced. And what happens in Temirtau is that in the bargain between Mittal and Nazarbayev, somehow the factory muddles through 
and uh, uh, whereas overall the working conditions are worsened, there is also some degree of, of labor that is maintained and keeps um, uh, the city, uh, uh, preserves the city from become, becoming just one of un unemployed. Uh, so uh, this, uh, this uh, story of, uh, 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 say, uh, partial labor success is also the result of uh, labor activism that has started then, uh, started from 2005 until the, the period of my, my, my field work. And uh, so uh, seeing that the, the company was making profits and given the total non-transparency of the uh, financial uh, figures of the, of the company, the, 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 the workers started to protest against uh, job cuts, against uh, uh, um, uh, health situation, and for an adequate pay, so for pay rises. Uh, and uh, so the, the, the crisis, the, 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 com contradiction, the, contra um, the confrontation was quite uh, uh, verbal, so to say, but uh, um, this confrontation was also quite mitica mitigated by the presence of the state. So a, a real strike, a disruption of production never occurred. And from one side, it is the specter of Jean Ozen. So the risk that uh, there would be such a confrontation that the police would have to shoot at, at workers uh, was very much in the air. And uh, the, the company workers uh, and the company knew that they can, they can uh, uh, make the claims, but with some limits. And so uh, there is a, a relative success and the fact that it could not become even more successful certainly is also connected to the fact that uh, company workers and contract workers did not unite. Uh, and that um, so great divide between a non-unionized precarious workforce and a, a very historically conscious, labor conscious and, uh, uh, and uh, um, uh, claiming uh, uh, company workforce, uh, uh, this gap uh, remained. Uh, what also was in the air was the specter of a real capital intensive modernization like in the oxygen shop, which is a, a part of the, of the factory, which had been outsourced to a, another global company, Linde, and where uh, after capital intensive modernization, the workforce was reduced from 450 in the Soviet era to 15 uh, after privatization, meaning that basically jobs become almost unnecessary and they were just monitoring uh, elite jobs that were given as, you know, as privileged jobs to uh, uh, people uh, with uh, political uh, connections. So uh, what where I did my field work is was quite the opposite of this. So I'm leading here you to really uh, uh, a, 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 a very uh, old fashioned, uh, a very dilapidated, a very old shop floor, uh, which uh, was, uh, uh, you know, uh, ironically termed also an uh, industrial museum by the workforce. We are in the DSFA, Drabilno Sortirovochnaya Fabrica, or the iron and stockyards uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, um, of the company. This is where um, the uh, iron ores arrive by train. They are unloaded, they are sorted, they are processed, uh, and they are stocked, uh, and then they are transported to the other production department. And here we see that uh, it is a huge territory um, uh, and every day a tremendous amount of materials uh, uh, arrive. Uh, just to know the shop floor, you need months uh, because it develops over uh, uh, 60 meters, uh, 30 meters below surface, 30 meters above surface on a surface of 800 times 400 meters. And it is a very low tech um, uh, uh, shop floor nonetheless, uh, uh, high scale. And the scale is not the formal scale, but is based on experiential knowledge of this aging machinery that the company workers can, uh, can uh, handle uh, until uh, it will uh, break apart. So we have here a machinery that works with patch on patch on patch and where company workers and contract workers work together in the same shop floor. So the workforce is very composite. We have female and male, we have uh, company and contract workers, we have new coming rural Kazakhs and or old uh, sons and daughters of former labor aristocracy of the Soviet Union 
that uh, work uh, to, together. Um, and um, so uh, what the experience of work in this context is, is uh, it is extremely demanding. It is a dusty, a physical, a very heavy uh, environment exposed to the element and to pollutants. And here the workers really are heroes, much more than their forefathers of the Soviet times, which were celebrated as heroes, but the real heroic work is theirs, or so uh, try to keep the, the, the machinery working. Uh, Tomasa, uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, uh, how much uh, time do I have? You are one minute over now, but we can I'm do a couple more minutes. A couple more minutes Thank to you. conclude. Yeah. I, I'm really sorry uh, for yeah. that. Um, yeah, but we also started some minutes late. I see on my but yeah, we, we, ca we counted that in. <laughs> okay. Oh, then double sorry. Uh, yeah, so now what, what I wanted to uh, uh, say basically is that uh, the, what is uh, puzzling uh, and what is the reform miracle of Mittal in this context is that with little cost, uh, he was able to uh, make the workforce more productive by creating a, a bad work climate in where workers are divided, are competitive with, with each other, and then where we have a strong shift between company workers, which are in fact strong of the Soviet labor legacy that uh, uh, were strong in, in, in knowledge and have an attachment to the workshop that they feel it's, it's falling apart. And then we have the contract workers that in fact are hired to substitute machinery. And here we see that the, the factory in fact turns back the, the clock of industrial labor and where workers are, are, are really coming up for the, for the uh, demodernization. And then to sum up uh, on all of this, I say that uh, the industrial trajectories of Temir Tao, in fact, are still characterized by, um, uh, by the, uh, the steel. It's still a very much a steel town, uh, but the new perspective of social mobility are mostly and increasingly outside the industrial class. And so we have uh, a new coming, uh, uh, new working class made of young, Kazakh precariat, which is stepping into the steps of the former old uh, labor class and an old working class, which is more uh, Russian, uh, Soviet, and projects itself either outside the country or when it retires, it uh, tries to make a living uh, outside uh, of, the, uh, of the steel plant. And uh, for instance, in the, in the uh, building uh, of the of the shop floor. This is the house of the shop floor. Half of the of the people are not any more of the shop floor, but testify for a, a rapidly changing uh, migrating uh, situation. And I uh, uh, saw a, a picture of, of the emerging rural new uh, working class. Uh, but I want to finish with just saying the acknowledgement that made possible this work. Uh, Ksenia Prilutskaya, Prilutskaya was my research assistant uh, and now is a PhD in anthropology uh, student in Germany. Max Planck Institute uh, funded the research and ArcelorMittal granted me access. And my most thanks go to the staff of the uh, Drabilno Sortirovacnaya Fabrika, which let me work together with them. Thanks very much and sorry for overstretching time. That's all right. Fascinating, wonderful ethnography there and and the stories uh well people are thinking of questions just just uh, uh, uh you know part of the story um uh Thomas, i don't know if you um, you know the reason one of the reasons uh that is stated why Mittal was able to bring in this labor from india uh, uh, is has an interesting connection to the soviet past that it was the soviet investment in indian steel industry and training on the very similar technologies and 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 you know the methodologies was that's what allowed him to literally transport the plane full of labor to Demirtau. And that is another aspect of the Soviet story in Indian investment and development. And so kind of it links back to what Chokan was saying. And then, so it starts with Nehru arriving there with Kunaev <laughs> and ends with, with your field work in a sense, yeah. Yeah, in, in, uh, if I can just react to yeah, that, yeah. Uh, I, I totally agree. Um, so uh, there, there were really engineers from uh, Temirtau building up uh, the Neruvian industrialization uh, project. Uh, but this is a, a, a part of the work on which I have only anecdotal, anecdotal evidence and I have, I have not really ethnographized. Right. 
thank you so we have a question from Ilya and one from, from Lorena in chat yeah so Ilya please uh, hi thank you for the great uh, presentation it was uh, actually super interesting for me because uh, um, I me and a few other colleagues were also trying to investigate industrial plants uh, in Russia, specifically the Aftavas plant, which is somewhat similar to um, the Timirtau metallurgical plant, I think, because uh, it was also considered the biggest achievement of uh, Soviet industry and the most modernized plant. But then uh, the, the fate of this plant in Tariati was also in, in question because of uh, economic transition. So I actually have two questions. Uh, do you think that ArcelorMittal was able to keep uh, the plant profitable? So. And what did they do to maintain profitability? Because <clears throat> so uh, uh, with outdated technology and with uh, such a huge workforce, uh, even uh, even now it's still more than uh, 15,000 people as I understand. So probably it's very difficult to, to, to maintain profitability. So this is the first question. And the second question is what is the role of the state? So. Uh, do they prevent ArcelorMittal from uh, dismissing too many workers, for instance? Do they try to kind of uh, regulate this process or uh, they, they allow <clears throat> the management to hire as many workers as they want, for instance? Thank you very much for this very good and uh, uh, central questions uh, to my presentation. And I, I, I think I, I rushed a little bit. I thought to have given answer to that. In the, in the paper, um, but I, I will clarify it a, a little bit better now. Um, the, the, about the, 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 the profits of the factory, there is absolute secrecy. And this was really, you know, the, the, the issue of contention. Uh, so I collected, you know, the labor nar workers narratives, which say, if there was no profit, you would not have been here. Uh, and so the profit, uh, uh, and uh, the, there is also, uh, uh, rumors and more than rumors, uh, also uh, all sorts of uh, newspaper uh, headlines about uh, a profit percolating away from the um, uh, steel plant in myriad ways uh, through corruption, uh, through uh, uh, tax laundering in Dubai, uh, uh, tax avoidance, uh, etc. But this is anecdotal, and in fact, what is the most important fact is that it is built in secrecy uh, and that. Uh, 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 Mittal succeeded, you know, in delaying and deflating workers' um, demands for better pay through this argument of uh, lack of profitability, profitability. And this was also the point of rapture, of mistrust, that then in, in the fact that they don't believe to each other. Uh, and uh, what, the only thing that the workers want was a pay raise, only more money. So this was the most contentious issue. And how he, he did the magic, I tried to, to, to explain uh, what is really the Mittal neoliberal revolution is that no investment whatsoever, but by fragmenting uh, and better exploiting the, the labor force, he exhausted machinery and workforce. Uh, so it is an unsustainable growth because obviously reconstructing a shop floor like the, the DCT, which you have uh, seen, would cost millions and millions. Uh, and it is also not eternal. This is a, a museum uh, where the, the textbooks go back to the 60s and 70s and where these workers are like, uh, you know, uh, priests of an ancient wisdom that is not taught anymore. Um, so it, it, is, uh, it is really, and that gives them also a, a power. But you see, it is cheaper to uh, hire uh, a contract worker from Mongolia uh, to clean the, the iron railroad than to use uh, a machine, a train, as was the case in the Soviet time. So we have really a deindustrialization, uh, which makes that the, the machine and the, the workers are exploited. In fact, yeah. I hope I, I answered everything. Thanks for your question. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, Elias' uh, point also made me remember um, another person who we're going to invite but couldn't find at the right moment. Ruslan Zarasov's uh, work on steel industry. You'll find interesting. Uh, Thomas, we'll uh, we'll send we'll send you the link. Yeah. 
Uh, and Lorena, would you like to ask your question uh, uh, verbally rather than us reading it? Hello, Lorena. Hi, nice to see you. Um, Thomas, very interesting. I was wondering, um, I mean, we all know that in Central Asia it's a little bit hard to find, um, you know, the gate opener to, uh, I mean, kind of like, yeah, uh, politically interesting, <laughs> economically interesting uh, settings. And I was wondering if you could tell us more, how did you, I mean, process your, develop your methodology? Uh, how did you select workers? Why still okay. work? I mean, it's, yeah. Okay, Lorena, thanks. The, the question is, is really important uh, and it would take a bit of time to answer. Uh, but uh, the good news is I really made it already transparent and published. So if you go uh, on, on one of the papers that I uh, showed you about how I accessed uh, the steel plant and what were the working conditions in a climate of absolute suspiciousness on the behalf uh, of the workforce towards me and of the company uh, against me. Uh, and so the, the, it, it was really difficult and integral part of the of the field work of building up the access in uh, uh, in the in a very short floor. So it, it was no foregone conclusion and it took a lot of time. Uh, but uh, I hope it, I don't know if it's uh, enough, but just to make it not even shorter, I, I asked for formal permission. Um, and then uh, 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 we entered, I have to say with re research assistant Xenia, uh, and then it took uh, uh, really weeks uh, to find a shop floor where we would be accepted and months to gain the trust of the workers. Yeah, and it is very dangerous and people took a great responsibility on uh, having me there because if an accident happens, then they are responsible and might uh, lose their job because of the foreign scholar. Yeah, thanks. It'd be very interesting to most to, to get you to compare or rather do similar work on a in a in a sense a different location but a different commodity within the same space. So so comparing, for instance, not the metal but uh, Oskamen, where you are dealing with uranium, yeah. uh, and it, which has a different political meaning and a global meaning as well as how the investments were done and what meaning what was allowed, how much risk you could take to make it unsafe. You know, if you take that perspective how much you can exploit the original machinery and original worker. And, and given that particular industry and, and its needs uh, may set, have a very different kind of a uh, you know, setting. Although, uh, yeah, there are, there are similar stories there. I, I've spent some precursor time there, but the, I think if you do it in depth, it'd be very interesting to see. You know, and I, I mean, it helps me also to really stress the exquisitely political nature of this economy. Now we have seen that there is a president steel worker, a unique case in the world, uh, that has really a, a lot of uh, political capital in uh, Temir town not to fail. And you have an Indian global capital coming to uh, uh, Central Asia and perhaps even affording uh, loss or uh, risk uh, for reasons that are really far beyond the profit, but just to keeping uh, Karmet and Timirtau away from uh, the competitors, for instance. So it, it is quite, it is quite uh, complex. And I think at this scale of uh, heavy industry, this uh, uh, political and geostrategic uh, uh, reflection make, make quite a sense. Yes, uh, definitely. I mean, we, we can <laughs> I'm tempted to continue talking, but I won't. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, 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 it's me, me. I have, but uh, yeah, uh, Balihar, over to you. And uh... thank you, uh, Thomas, uh, for uh, for a really fascinating presentation, and uh, and and again, you didn't disappoint. So thank you. Uh, um, and so next we have uh, Franco. Um, um, who just completed his PhD at the University of Manchester, and I had a great privilege of reading it. And it was a fantastic uh, PhD. And uh, and and if 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 Tomas is a is, is an established scholar, uh, I think uh, Franco is an emerging one, uh, and I'm sure he will go as far as Tomas or even beyond. 
uh, in his in his in his uh, in his both in his research and publication. So, uh, um, Franco is, is a lecturer at the uh, University of Manchester. So, over to you, Franco. Thank you, Baliha. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. And no pressure there, yeah, from Baliha after that presentation. I mean, it's an introduction. I, you, you probably expect, okay, I've got the answers. So, I don't, but I've got a presentation. Uh, I can share my screen, right? So, yes. Can you see it? Yeah, is it, is it clear? Okay. Um, so uh, uh, my, my presentation is entitled Rise of the Surplus Population, uh, Decollectivization, Class Stratification and Precarization in Uzbekistan since 1991. So uh, I am, uh, um, it's part of a paper that I'm writing for a special issue, I'm co-editing as well, on the precarization of labor in Central Asia and the post-Soviet space. So, um, quickly about the plan of the other the presentation. So I will start looking at... Um, Franco, would you like to project it? It might be easier to read. For. Is it easier? Yeah. Okay. Let me see if I can do that. Is that all right? Is it better? It's a bit bigger now. Yeah. Good. Yeah. yeah? Okay. Excellent. Thank you for that. So um, yeah, I will start with a paradox that um, I found uh, quite frequently in the, in the dominant literature on the former Soviet Union, which is the transition literature. Then I'll, I'll try to, uh, to unpack that by first looking at some history of uh, collective agriculture in the former Soviet, well, Central Asia, especially in the Uzbek Socialist uh, Soviet Republic. And, uh, and then I'll go, I'll try to uh, present a different kind of approach on how to read developments in, in Uzbekistan, in uh, post-independent Uzbekistan by using um, an approach steep in global political economy, specifically Marxian political economy. And these, uh, this material is based on my uh, perusal of the literature, but also on uh, extensive field work in Uzbekistan between 2018, 2019, all across the country, and uh, in trying to apply different methodologies and, and, uh, and theories to, uh, to the region. So as I said, I'll start with the, uh, with the, with the paradox. So the literature on transition. Um, uh, clearly, I've got half an hour, so I will. Uh, I cannot go into very much into details, so uh, in, into anything really. But uh, uh, very generally speaking, um, when uh, when you hear about transition uh, in the former Soviet Union, there is a, a, a the literature seems to adopt a very mainstream consensus in development studies uh, within the special case. What's defined in the special case of the, of the Soviet Union, so they need to transition from the command economy, Soviet command economy, to free market capitalism. And what does that transition entail? Usually, again, an or orthodox reform, reform package that entails privatization, liberalization, and other, other reforms in line, as I said, with the mainstream consensus development studies. So there is a sort of, um, uh, quite a strong normativity in the literature saying, well, either you do this and therefore you transition, or if you do anything else, that means you're not reforming. You're still sticking to the form, the former Soviet ways or the Soviet way. Um, and that for Uzbekistan, for example, means that the literature fo focuses on the form of land ownership. So since, you know, land remains state-owned or price distortions continue under the so-called Uzbek model, then the literature says, well, it's strange. We have this paradox, right? There is no transition, so no reform, and yet very, very deep socioeconomic transformation. So they define it as a paradox. And for transformation, clearly, what, um, what is meant is the fact that if capitalism is development or is equated to development, clearly the lack of reform and this transformation results into the collapse in living standards for the general population. Okay, that's on the, on, the, on the literature. So before presenting a different kind of approach, uh, very briefly, I'll, uh, I'll go into uh, how, what collective agriculture was in, in Central Asia and, and in Uzbekistan, what it meant. And the reason why that is important, specifically for this case study for Uzbekistan, is the fact that uh, the majority of the population during the Soviet Union and afterwards actually live in rural areas. So looking at collective agriculture first and then the reform of it or the transformation that happened after 
after independence give us a very uh, important sense of what happened in, in the country since. So collective agriculture. Collective agriculture meant, um, you know, stated collective farms, and these were more than just productive units. We were productive units providing full employment, but also they regulated the infrastructure of rural social life. So on top of full employment, you would have social infrastructure and welfare, like water, gas, electricity, hospitals, schools, kindergartens, and then collective use of the land and the commons. And there I put some examples, right? Input, stocks, grazing. What do I mean with that? It means that the, uh, the rural proletariat working in these uh, collective state or co and collective farms could uh, use collective inputs like uh, tractors, fertilizers for their own private plots for food production, could use cotton stalks, uh, cereal straws for, food, for feed for the animals and uh, wood uh, or as wood for, for eating, and then the commons for animal grazing, etc. cetera. So um, in, in this context, I will I put just a, a quote there. Stated collective farms were much more than a production unit. They comprise a rural community, providing medical care, housing, daycare, schooling, subsidized food, along with gas and water delivery, as well as maintenance of infrastructures, cultural events. There were social institutions embracing practically all aspects of social and economic life. To give an idea of how, of how um, collective agriculture was organized during the Soviet Union and what it meant for the rural proletariat. And uh, these are, um, uh, this is what, what I, I then define as collective reproduction. So within this collective form of agriculture, the rural proletariat could secure its collective reproduction. And um, in terms of like the, the lifestyle in, uh, in, the, in the countryside, I put a couple of quotes there, you know, 50 years of egalitarian rural policies deprived the Soviet countryside of any meaningful stratification, so no significant class stratification. And then an individual occupying an agricultural service sectors could offer earn a higher income and sustain a higher standard of living in Uzbekistan than his industrial or urban counterpart. So, does that mean that the Soviet, uh, Soviet countryside was an idyllic, class-free, you know, Garden of Eden? No, it doesn't. I mean, but as we heard from previous presentation, like Ilias, I Ilias, sorry, uh, he said, well, you know, Soviet Union was one of the most equal countries in the world, and that changed radically after 1991. And that's the case also for the countryside and the countryside in Uzbekistan. So during Soviet Uzbekistan, what we had uh, as a result of these conditions of production and social reproduction, was that the lowest migration, uh, you know, within the Soviet Union. So there's no significant rural migration. And then the indigenous nationalities stayed concentrated in agriculture, water and services, because as Lubin says, that was an okay life. And then um, women's clearly had still a double burden, a la Soviet, as I put, but they were integrated in the economy in formal jobs. So jobs that paid enough for them, uh, for, for, for their lives, but also uh, doing reproductive work within extensive infrastructure work and within an extensive welfare state, okay? So we can say that the Soviet social pact for Soviet Uzbekistan was a collective reproduction of the rural, so rural proletariat within collective agriculture or cotton for welfare, if you want a catchphrase to encapsulate it. Um, how did that change? Well, the literature on transition says it didn't change much. There was no reform, so no transition, and yet there was significant transformation. And uh, that's how the paradox emerges. And I think that's why the literature cannot explain what is going on, why that is going on. And my, uh, uh, my approach is, uh, well, let's take you know, um, an approach steeped in Marx and political economy and see what happens. So there's a couple of uh, paragraphs, uh, it's a paragraph that I took from the paper that I'm writing um, that gives uh, a, a taste, at least uh, an initial taste of what, of what I'm trying to do. Uh, how um, I think by starting with the fact that Uzbekistan was integrated into the global market as a raw exporting material, a, a raw a primary commodity exporter, cotton, then transformation can be explained. So I take a broader look. 
let's look at how what happened in the, what transformations happened in primary commodity exporting countries in the past decades and identify it too. So I read these out. In the past decades, the expropriation of the, mark, uh, of the mass of the people from the soil, or in Marx and terminology, primitive accumulation, has been central to changes in land and resource use, particularly in countries of the global south that have been integrated into the global economy as raw material exporters. Put differently, peasants have been expelled en masse from the land to put it to use for the extraction or production of uh, primary commodities uh, for export. With that, I mean also cash crops, yeah? So intensive agriculture as well. To meet global demand, particularly by large scale industry. So continuation. This has given rise to large relative super po populations, only partially employed or wholly unemployed. They struggle to, to reproduce themselves. I mean, precarity, informality, and poverty is evident in the increasing security and vulnerability in rural areas across the globe, fueling mass rural outmigration and the growth of informal economies in towns and cities. So there is a, there is a lot to unpack here, but in the brief time that I have, within the huge diversity of the global South, meaning raw material exporting countries, the tendency is, uh, there are two tendencies that are very obvious in the last uh, 40 to 50 years. On the one side, what Marx calls primitive accumulation. So the uh, peasants being expelled from the land because these land resource, uh, resources, think about water, uh, are put to production for the extraction, production of raw materials in, in line with global solvent demand. So de uh, demand for raw material exports from these countries. And on the other, because of that, these uh, vast population, uh, rural population expelled from the land struggles to survive. It cannot be absorbed by capital intensive, extractive industry, capital intensive um, uh, agriculture, inter alia but let's leave it at that for now, okay? So within this framework, I think we can start understanding and explain a bit better what happened in Uzbekistan in the last 30 years. Uzbekistan, as, as I said, as a cotton exporter, or at least in the first 20, 25 years uh, of independence, as a cotton exporter within the global uh, political economy. So there is no, in my opinion, there is no paradox. It's just a matter of, you know, wearing new glasses or new lenses, looking at it through new lenses. And I think political economy might have, might help there. So decollectivization is primitive accumulation. So um, in other countries of the global South, perhaps the um, primitive accumulation came under the banner of structural adjustment programs. For the former Soviet Union and certainly for Uzbekistan, it came under the banner of decollectivization. So uh, breaking the back of what I described before, collective agriculture. For Uzbekistan, I put one piece of legislation, which was fundamental, the 1998 land law. There are very many, many others. But what this law did specifically was a creation of private farms by land leases of up to 50 years. Well, now the literature says, well, you know, uh, this is not real, real privatization. So uh, that is counts as no transition, no reform. Land is still state-owned. And yet uh, my argument is that yes, Legally, that's, that's correct. There were land leases. And however, the land was parcelized and privatized in terms of access. And so were the commons. So that really demolished the social pact I talked about before, the Soviet social pact. And um, this meant that most peasants were left landless uh, and excluded from access to the land and, common, and, and commons, whereas cut rents were going to subsidize instead of, uh, you know, being exchanged for welfare, um, they were going to subsidize capital in, uh, in various ways. Uh, for example, in uh, import substitution industrialization, including in new production, in joint venture with multinational corporations, small and medium enterprise development, etc. So again, uh, putting together, um, or uh, if we want to have another catchphrase before I said cotton for welfare, then became cotton for capital accumulation and then change radically the uh, conditions for, of production and, and therefore of social reproduction within now non-collective agriculture. So privatize access to land and commons. How did he change that? 
Um, next slide. Yes. So I argue that decollectivization gave rise to class stratification, and that explains the rise of vast, a vast relative surplus population in, uh, in Uzbekistan, in the countryside and cities that fight to survive amid uh, widespread precarization. I put a quote here that I took from uh, one of my interviewees, uh, at the Khan, like a farm, uh, one of the uh, many land peasants. Um, but I think encapsulate uh, this process very, very well. Without land, what do I do? Can't you see that the private farmers have fenced off their land? It looks like a jail. There is no other land available. When this was a kalhoz or collective farm, it was different. There were no fences, there was land available. So again, Soviet social path was demolished. And uh, on the one side, a minority of private farmers emerged, calculated between five, 10% of the, of the rural population with 85% of the land versus the majority of landless peasants or relative surplus population in my you know, Marxian reading of it. Um, things are changing now with the clusterization, but that, that's increasing the process of concentration and centralization. It is not decreasing it. So even some farmers then uh, are being pushed out of fermestva, so they're not private farmers anymore. They also become landless peasants. And uh, so I'll, uh, I'll go through a little bit about what I mean with labor precarization. Um, to explain this process from the point of view of the land peasants. So, um, as I said before, um, uh, Uzbek Soviet uh, Socialist Republic, formal jobs and welfare sta state, uh, now precarious labor. So temporary work, casual work, daily work, seasonal work. Uh, precarization meaning low wages, uh, no job security, no welfare, no benefits, no social wage. Um, this is something that I think I heard before in, uh, in another presentation by Hassan, I believe, like these are uh, rising informality and precarity. Um, so informal jobs with little to no social security, collapse of the welfare state, you know, the fight for survival. I put a couple of examples there. So daily workers or Mardi Kore. This was also a, um, a late Soviet uh, phenomenon. But according to many of my informers, um, that, uh, that was a very limited phenomenon then when land was accessible. And it's instead become now a very, very obvious part of social life in, uh, in, in Uzbekistan. Wherever you go across cities, towns, and uh, rural areas, major um, you know, road intersections or bazaars, people waiting on the side of the road, waiting to be employed for, for the day. And then seasonal and labor migrants. As I said before, I mean, uh, if anything distinguished Central Asia and Uzbekistan during the Soviet time, at very, very low, like some of the lowest percentages of, of migration. And now mass migration, both internally and internationally. So to Tashkent and other cities in Uzbekistan, but also to Kazakhstan and to, and to Russia. So we're producing this precarization in, in, in the cities. And uh, to show how the processes uh, go hand in hand. Um, I just put here um, a small, I just collected a small chart where you see at, at the bottom there in, in blue how these uh, collective forms of agriculture were being slowly dismantled uh, in the, in, uh, at the beginning of the 2000, following the 1998 uh, law and the rise of, in red, migrant workers. I just put the ones officially registered in Russia, so it's a certain underestimate. And then in parallel to it, the, the rise of these remittances coming from Russia especially to Central Asia and, uh, of course, to, to Uzbekistan. This is what comes to Uzbekistan. And again, um, Tommaso, in one of my previous presentations, not, not today, correctly pointed out that there cannot be one-to-one uh, -one, uh, correspondence, right, between decollectivization and migration. And that's absolutely correct. Uh, there are other factors that influence it, but that's clearly... The engine then pushed it, and then the rise of oil prices in the 2000s in uh, the northern, richer northern neighbors, so Kazakhstan and, and especially Russia, then meant that the rise, the boom, the construction boom, so relatively cheap, precarious labor coming from Central Asia became fundamental to fuel or to, uh, to meet the demand for, for, for this kind of labor in, in the Russian market. And you see the rise of remittances. They also fluctuate according to the price of oil. 
Uh, you see the 2009 collapse in the price of oil because of the um, of the uh, financial crisis. So a collapse in remittances later in the 2010s. Also, there was another collapse because of uh, problems in the global economy. I mean, these these things fluctuate, but. Um, Social life is being radically changed. You have millions of Uzbeks seasonally working in, in Russia and Kazakhstan now. Um, the last thing, do I still have uh, a minute? Yes. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, I think I think the, you got about nine minutes. I think. Oh, so yeah. I'm finished, yep. I'm finishing earlier then. Good, uh, good. Because Get these back. are last the last slide. Sorry, guys. I've, <laughs> I al I'm always worried that I ramble on and on and on. So I try to keep it short and sweet. Good, I managed for once. So I mentioned before, like the situation of women are clearly, there, were, there, were, there was a double burn during the Soviet Union uh, within very specific uh, conditions of production and social reproduction, since both changed in independent Uzbekistan. This process of precarization had very, very specific gender dimensions. So. Uh, number one, women lost, lost their access to formal jobs because of the dismantle of social infrastructure. So the welfare state was uh, basically uh, staffed by, uh, by women, uh, think about health, education, etc. These formal jobs, especially in rural areas, disappeared, dissipated. And so from that, women are integrating even more precarious labor, daily, seasonal, migrant labor. Migrant labor in fewer numbers than men, but still, I mean, and because of the social reproductive responsibility. But then again, I mean, shuttle trade is, a, is a, an industry that's being feminized, for example, and, and others. And at the same time, loss of, loss of access to benefits because of the dismantle of the welfare state and the collapse of infrastructure. So, uh, you know, electricity, water, gas, etc. So something uh, that Kim, for example, defined as a dawn to midnight enterprise. So social reproductive work for, for many of those women, especially in rural areas, especially then again, and the differentiation varies depending on the, on, on the area, but again, rural areas and within rural areas, the most, um, the, the most, the furthermost from, uh, from the capital, uh, this dawn to midnight ent enterprise for, for, for most women. So um, I think that concludes my, my presentation. So if you have questions, uh, comments, and uh, thank you very much for, again, for the invitation and for listening. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Franco. Excellent. Uh, really, uh, you know, well, how to say, engineered <laughs> in many ways, and, and questions are coming through. So, so I'm going to jump in and ask, rather make two quick points before we launch the question. One was the, the, <laughs> On the gender side of things, you know, uh, uh, it's a very good point, and I think we can push it a little bit further. There were the specific kinds of benefits, which, uh, for example, childcare and related, you know, uh, infrastructure, which had a quite a strong effect, not at, only at the lowest labor level, but but across the board, right? And uh, and, and that that really kind of a story which is never told. And uh, the second thing I wanted to say was, what I really uh, the image that came into my head, uh, looking at the, the fluctuation remittance and something that we, we all know very well, but the, the visualization some, somehow provokes. So that, is there any work or any thought on, because that reflects that the oil price is funding certain kinds of, of labor opportunities. And those are ones who have affected, are being affected more. So uh, for instance, if it was just seasonal agricultural labor, uh, it'll have a less effect from oil price. Uh, so is it the construction industry is where we're looking at or, or you know, uh, do we have any idea about that? So that's my initial questions. Yes. Uh, do, am I on? Yes, I'm on. Yeah. Um, yes, excellent. Yes. Uh, thank you for mentioning it, actually. I think in the gardens is, uh, is uh, a massive part of the story. And uh, since they were provided by, um, you know, enterprises in the cities and uh, you know, by enterprises in general, anyway, and uh, collective, uh, uh, collective farms, state farms, in in particular for rural areas. Once those disappear, these infrastructure disappear with them. So I think for Uzbekistan, if I'm, I, you know, I'm starting from uh, from memory. I think um, kindergarten pre pre uh, penetration went from thirty percent to nine percent in about ten years. 
So it completely collapsed. And clearly they had a massive uh, effect, especially, I mean, in, in, in gender, uh, this process of uh, precarization, gender precarization. And then, yes, um, you are also right about labor opportunities. There is a seasonal agricultural labor go going to Russia, to, uh, to Central Asia. But as far as I could find, I mean, in terms of statistics, um, most uh, people do go and work in uh, services. Um, you know, there was this massively racist uh, advertisement in Russia about, you know, your pizza is being delivered by a PhD from, uh, you know, someone who can quote Pushkin, I think it was. Yeah, yeah. In, in Moscow. So these kind of services and then construction, definitely construction. And since price of oil and this construction spree was, uh, was very much associated in, in both Russia and Kazakhstan, that's where a lot of the demand came from. So, uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kuat. Okay, uh, Franca, thank you for your presentation. Yeah, uh, I have a kind of general question, maybe looking for the perspectives. Like, um, you know that for the last three years, Uzbekistan has a new president, uh, Shafkat Mirzoyev. And so compared with uh, Islam Karimov, who is very kind of classical dictator, I would say, and his attitude to political situation was also reflected in the economic situation in Uzbekistan, where there was a, almost like preservation. I, I, I missed the, the first part of your presentation, so I don't know if you covered that. So Uzbekistan didn't, in the past, engage in this kind of radical transformation, market-oriented reforms. Now there are some signs that Shafkat Mirzoev is much more open. Some even thought very carefully, uh, said that it's probably some kind of political liberalization, which is not, he is a part of the system. He used to be prime minister for more than 10 years, but he is more kind of market oriented person, more kind of open. So there are some signs of like, of what we did here in Kazakhstan back in 1990s, my, like more open to foreign investments. There is a construction boom going on in Tashkent. I was told by my friends. Uh, so do you think that, you know, Uzbekistan is just going to implement the same neoliberal reforms to some extent and it, even turn it into another rentier state whereas in Kazakhstan it's national uh, oil and gas whereas in, is, is in Uzbekistan it's uh, uh, cotton so any any perspectives any thoughts what would happen in Uzbekistan in the nearest three to seven years Shall I answer that first and then wait for Lorena, yeah? Yeah. Okay. okay, so uh, thank you, Kuat. Um, I know you missed the first part, but I didn't address much of the uh, Mirzio era. I was just given a very broad uh, uh, general overview. Although I mentioned the the fact that um, the, uh, I lost Kuat. No, Is he's me? there, he's there. Okay, um, although I mentioned the fact that with um, clusterization in the cotton sector, now this process is actually coming to uh, its full full circle of uh, in, even more centralization of uh, and concentration of land in the in the hands of small clusters yeah sometimes within with foreign investments and foreign investors um i i don't like to make a gr like great uh, predictions uh, but i do not uh, subscribe to the view that under karimo there was no radical change the, the fact that it came more gradually is linked uh, directly, in my opinion, to the political economy of, uh, of Uzbekistan, meaning the fact that uh, uh, the, um, the rents that were, um, uh, that, that were taken in, in the country came from agriculture. So uh, they, they could, there was not an opportunity to just liberalize and have the whole cotton sector collapse. So that was uh, the main reason why the change was gradual in terms of capital accumulation. But in terms of social relations of production, as I tried to explain in, very briefly in the presentation, I think the change was absolutely radical. It was brutal. And uh, this is what mm, most of the informers I talked to, uh, not the farmers, the landless peasants uh, and migrants, etc. Yeah, would that would uh, I think uh, would that uh, would tell you. It's actually quite interesting to see how 
um, common it is for um, most people, well, at least most of the people I talk to, even beyond the formal uh, interviews, would, uh, would connect the collectivization with the mass migration and the, the collapse in, in Libby standard in, in rural areas. Uh, in terms of uh, the changes now with Mirza Yoyev, uh, the, the political economy of Uzbekistan remains integrated as a raw material exporter, but the raw materials have changed. They've changed completely. Now it's not cotton anymore, it's gold and natural gas. So that's why you can see this explosion in uh, this uh, construction boom, fictitious capital, and it is not just a scam. And we're about to publish an article in Open Democracy about housing demolition throughout the country. And even when I was traveling there in 2018-19, most uh, you know, uh, regional centers are, are really uh, experiencing this construction boom. Actually, local elites are, um, are incentivized to show that they're doing something, they are developing. You know, that's the, the new phase, if you, if you wish, of development. I mean, one, one could add that, uh, I mean, first of all, I agree with Franco completely, but the, the two things go out, I, I mean, I don't know what you mean by uh, a uh, classical dictator. <laughs> we write a new book about the classicity of dictators. But uh, uh, the, 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 the most important uh, point is that there have been different periods of attempts to uh, put new liberal reform in Uzbekistan. Uh, and how far they went or, or retreated were governed by exactly how Franco said the the, the, the structure of the, you know uh, the, the resources available, and the 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 and a lot of what you're seeing currently this visible Kazakh type of neoliberal reform actually did start early on. It's just that the certain other smaller adjustments were made, but you can see these people were not born you know out of nowhere. They were all there, right? So I mean the people who are involved in this thing, they're the similar people having this very similar position still they just say slightly different things and they have gradually changed the language and how they have spoken about it so but, but the I would say the biggest change is the fictitious one that complete and utter uh, slavish uh, sort of a worship of metrics that has been brought in you know the global metrics you need to move up the metrics and whatever little smaller steps you need to take to move up those you will do that so that's the biggest change I see in in, in the Karfa how they present themselves. Uh, Lorena, up to you. Hello, ciao Franco. Congratulations on your PhD. I saw your email, but I was in Bosnia without internet. And then I forgot to reply, but congrats. And congrats <laughs> about okay, your you. uh, job. Um, so, I mean, as you might imagine, I have a lot of comments about your presentation because we, we, we don't disagree, <laughs> we don't agree on many things, as you know, but I'm glad that you at least you upgraded from the condition of authoritarian neoliberalism. I guess you change your mind, which is good <laughs> because Uzbekistan is not authoritarian neoliberalism, at least until, uh, yeah, whatever, three years ago. So I have a couple of points. The first one is about the gender like post-Soviet and the historical thing. Uh, there is a lot of like, I mean, I, I just want to plug you uh, a couple of papers without being self-promotional, but there is, I just published a RIBE, uh, on RIBE, a paper that discusses exactly what you're talking about. So the, but I looked it from uh, social reproduction and uh, regimes of patriarchy. So I look at the re regimes of public and private patriarchy to understand the um, process of uh, yeah, um, gender exploitation. Uh, and I mean, the, and I use a methodology that's a little bit more micro than you. And that is why maybe I have a lot of problems with your uh, uh, arguments. Um, I mean, for instance, uh, this connects to my second point about your argument of primitive accumulation. Because when I've done my survey at the farmer level survey, and this is a, another paper published in the Journal of Agrarian Change, um, basically there are still patterns of communality and commons. So for instance, there are uh, uh, cotton picking uh, um, women, pickers, women that use the leftovers of the cottons after you know the the, the, the cotton campaign has been um, operationalized 
there are mechanisms of input and output distribution, which are basically uh, not privatized. Uh, land, you're right to say that the collectivization has produced an intensification of social stratification, but uh, there is, a, you know, what, when you mentioned Dehan, Dehan is being the food basket of, this, of the of Uzbekistan. And one good evidence of that is that food security indicators in Uzbekistan are the, those who have improved the most uh, across the five Central Asian countries. Uh, so I wouldn't argue, I mean, I basically, I wouldn't argue that there is a process of privatization in the land. Uh, although, as you're right, I mean, you're right to say, I mean, lease doesn't mean that it's but then it's still public, doesn't mean that it's like, you know, doesn't have to go into market mechanism, but there is no profit of either profit making mechanism nor pro, uh, mechanism of competition. So, I mean, or at least these are completely filtered uh, in a way that is not, for instance, liberal. Um, and that is, yeah, and then, uh, I mean, like very short comments about your graph. I think I agree with, um, with Tommaso, correlation doesn't mean causation. And also I'm not an expert migration, but there are all the, both pull and push factors that determine uh, migration. So uh, you can't, I mean, analyze, you know, the, like the national limit, otherwise you fall into the same things that you criticize, the national methodologism. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I mean, just to flag that uh, on the social stratification, uh, I mean, Denise can be audience, Tommaso Trevisani have been saying this for 20 years, so it's nothing new. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, so just like, I mean, just some suggestion about literature that this can be um, uh, used. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, interesting. Uh, so I will try to read uh, your thesis at some point. Bye. <laughs> Thank you, Lorena. I was afraid actually when you started, but we don't disagree on much actually. Um, uh, and thank you very much for the congratulations. And uh, yes, I read your paper in RIPE and the one in, uh, um, what's it called, Journal of Agrarian Change. And I would recommend everyone read uh, those and uh, Lorena's work, which is great. Now I'll start from the, uh, and it's been no, very useful. You don't have to praise me. I mean, Tomas no, 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 but it's, um, have done much for, they opened this. I was about, I was about to say, yeah, I was about yeah. to say, and uh, next to that, that's why I'll start from the, from the, from the end. Uh, because uh, uh, Candiotti's work and Tommaso's work and uh, Ilhamo's work have been very, very important for me. And the, uh, the only thing I do in this presentation is that I go beyond the paradox. I show why uh, I cannot do it in 30 minutes, but I do it in the paper, I do it in the PhD, and hopefully I do it in my next publications. It's a fact that um, uh, whereas um, anthropological work from, from my specific work has been absolutely fundamental because um, you know, I cannot in four years do what these uh, amazing people have done in 30. At the same time, I think that a global political economy perspective can provide a, a different lens really to understanding the processes in Uzbekistan, in the region, and the former Soviet Union, comparatively, and uh, for individual case studies. I do not use a neoliberal authoritarianism anymore. As a, I didn't even mention neoliberalism once in the, uh, in the presentation, because I, I agree with you. I, I, don't, I think it would be off the mark. I'm just saying, looking at this uh, from this perspective, there is no paradox. This is what transformation looks like. This is what transition looks like. So there is no paradox and no transition and transformation. The transformation, the specific effects of uh, Uzbekistan being integrated as a global cotton exporter is exactly what defines the transformation in social, economic, and polit political terms in the country. Although I didn't talk about politics today, I just talk about social, economic issues. Now I'll go back to the, uh, to the other things. Yes, correlation doesn't mean causation. I, I completely agree. That's why I use also a pull factor of the oil price which is fundamental, but, um, and, and that's why the, the year 2000 is, uh, is like really the turning point there. And the uh, primitive accumulation, yes. Um, I, I also agree, I mean, the cotton picking women uh, using leftovers, cotton inputs and output, absolutely. These are former resistance by labor. Uh, it is not something I, 
I integrate it in the presentation, but I do talk about it in, in, the, in the PhD. It's about the fact that every time capital precarizes, informalizes, et cetera, there is action and reaction, right? So what are the forms of resistance that you find in Uzbekistan? Well, I use a lot of uh, Zulfia Tursunova's work, you know, about uh, women in agriculture, so agroecological practices to combat climate change, collaborative practices, which also Denise Candioti talks about in that 2003 article, you know, Cry for Land, which I think it's a, it's really a masterpiece, uh, and it's a, it's a, it's a well of information. And, uh, and therefore, yes, I, co I completely agree. It's not that everything has been transformed, but uh, uh, significantly collective agriculture and the Soviet past has, has been demolished. And that is what I'm, I'm addressing. Um, there is also resistance and pushback, but like in most countries in the world, um, it, it is, uh, if, if, you, if I can say like, like that, it is capital that's you know, carrying the day. Uh, workers in, uh, in, uh, in the Gord Metallurgov are being uh, precarized, informalized. Yeah, they have less formal work and then the fewer formal works than they were before. So across the board, that's, that's the tendency. Um, primitive accumulation, yes. Food basket, yes, yes, uh, absolutely. The Hons do produce 70 to 75% of the cheap food, and especially women produce most of the cheap food that uh, inundate bazaars. But can this food from you know, the private plots actually feed a family? It can't. I think Tomas has got this uh, 2009 article in this book collection, right? Where he says specifically that, especially for large families, um, uh, a small plot can perhaps cover 25%. And that is why all of these rural labor has got to engage in a portfolio of activities. One every two uh, uh, rural house, households have got a migrant labor, so remittances that cover 10, 20% of expenses. And then, you know, all sorts of other work, seasonal, daily, etc. Cotton picking now, you know, for the poor households, women led households, covers 30% of annual income, etc. So that's what I mean with precarity. Um, and informalization. And then, yeah, gender processes and uh, regional practice. Yeah, the, the papers. Well, Franco, uh, you've yes. got one minute to summarize. <laughs> yeah, no, I think, no, I think I finished, but thank you so much for, for, these, uh, for these questions and for, for all the comments, really. All right, excellent. Uh, we have a short break uh, for you to get your coffee or whatever. Oh, Tomaso had a question. Uh, um, well, let's make it like this. It's, uh, let's not, not have... Go ahead and ask the question. Franco can, uh, can answer if you like. People can get their coffee if they like. Let's just be informal about it. <laughs> Thanks, Moto. It's not really a question because uh, I, in, the, in the interest of time. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to take the occasion since Lorena and Franco are here. Um, and uh, I mean, there are not that many experts <laughs> interested in Uzbek decollectivization, um, and, and and maybe we should once uh, meet some and 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 organize something to to get more into the nitty gritty of uh, uh, these works. Uh, well, because I mean there are plenty of uh, issues, and I think there are a lot of things that we could um, so, so, discuss about. Isn't... And so thanks also to to Montio and Balihar for making so, this possible. So yeah. Wait, I, I have an offer to make. So uh, I'll announce it for the people who are here. And I should ha we should have done this in the morning, but we're not organized enough. 6th to 9th of December, we're going to host a, a St. Asia focus conference, <laughs> uh, which has moved around because of uh, um, you know the pandemic and so on. We are hoping to have at least some people in person, but we will have it hybrid uh, in both ways. And I, I immediately... Uh, invite you guys to organize a panel on that. Uh, I, and Thank we can you. see how it works out in terms of person or on, online or whatever else. Sixth to ninth December, 30 years of uh, the, the, the theme. Online, you mean? N well, this, as I said, it depends on what's happening in terms of infection mm -hmm. and so on. We have permission to host, as, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know how, what the number would be, whatever the rooms allow at the time with social distancing or whatever, in-person meeting. But it might, uh, it might not be feasible to do it in person because of various reasons, including, I mean, the biggest problem would be people coming from abroad, particularly 
uh, Central Asia or so on, the vaccine thing wouldn't be recognized. They have to be 10 days and, you know, all those kind of things. We don't know. But the fact is that please do mark those dates and whatever happens, we'll, we'll try to do something. Yeah. But Bemi, Monto, Napoli could be also a nice venue for arranging <laughs> that sort of thing. I completely agree. Uh, me too. Yeah. I, got I completely completely agree. agree. I'm, 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 Sorry, I'm always I'm ready for Italy. Uh, but, but we <laughs> we have uh, some funding, so, so which we have to spend. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. thanks a lot, Monto, okay. for inviting. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, so colleagues, uh, we've got about uh, nine minutes. Uh, can we come back at uh, 3.45, please. 3.45, London time. Thank you.
in one two. Can I just um, try my um, presentation? Just sure. Share it, please. Yes, yes. Sorry, I... uh, you're in a high line. I just want to just try my presentation. Yeah, just yeah, to yeah, share no, no. But do, if you want to present first, you can no, go no, ahead. No, 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 no. I just, I, I just want to see that it does work. Monte, I have to ask you a question about a guy uh, who's based in Japan that uh, Bhakti Gore told me that you know. You mean Timur Dadabai? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What do you want to know about him? <laughs> We have we have I a lot of audience to, listening to the can question. Can you put us in contact? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I'm there's a lot of audience here who knows him. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I so, just need to ask him something. So, uh, so does that work? Sorry. Yeah. 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 It works. yeah. Do you want to try the same thing like others uh, to project it and everything else? Uh, oh. Uh, okay. Can I? Let me. Let me. Let me just try. Sorry. Just. Uh, yeah. We still have one minute, so it's okay. Oh, golly. Slide. Okay. You can just go down to the bottom, uh, Balihar. Oh, yes. Does that? This is good. This is good. This, is good. this does it. Yeah. Does that yeah. work? All great. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. I'll stop sharing. Thank you. Sure. Sorry, sorry, Lorena. No worries. All right. So, Balihar. I think we can well, maybe let's give people a minute to come back. Yeah, just go, yeah. Sorry. Sorry, really. Yeah. No, we... no, this is the uh, graveyard shift. Sorry? This is the graveyard shift. So this is the <laughs> very end. Yeah, I know, I know. In 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 uh, in physics world we put the most important speakers here so people stay. Yeah, I mean, it's okay. I think they're very tired. So, so but yeah, I'm I'm sorry for Monty because I think he already uh, watched this like presentation. Maybe you didn't, Balihar. But yeah, it's okay. Uh, I I'm in uh, the process of reviewing it now. So I I I think there are some new MPhils who are starting. <laughs> So who would not have heard and probably will have to read your papers anyway. So it'd be a good introduction okay. for that. Yeah. yeah. Good. Oh, by the way, uh, uh, Lauren, I know I sent you an email already, but uh, congratulations on the promotion. Oh, thanks. Oh, yes. Well done. Yeah. Highly, Ooh. highly, highly deserved. Great. I was really, I was really pleased when I saw it, you know. Yeah, I mean, academia is a beast, you know, and it's like, <laughs> I really needed a pay rise. So said, let's try to, you know, to, 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 to apply. And I got it at the first round. Usually it's really, I mean, but to be honest, I mean, it's been four years of intense work for oh, the yeah, university no. for me. So I, I ticked all the boxes. My head of department told me if they wouldn't give it to you, we would have a pill because in, on paper, you basically, you know, mm -hmm. like uh, have um, all the requirements. So. Yeah. so, so, so this is a conversation round, right? We have uh, uh, your Sorry. promotion and Balihar and Amina's book. So it's yeah, a... <laughs> congrats on your book yeah. launch. I yeah. mean, you will organize. A, 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 I mean, you had you came at the Open University talk about rental capital. Oh, and, all right, um, and my timekeeping capacity, I <laughs> call everyone back in. Uh, okay. Balihar. Okay, well, it's with great pleasure uh, that we have a Lorena here. Um, when Monte and I were first devising this workshop, the one name that we both immediately agreed to have was 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 Lorena. Uh, her, her her just her insights uh, are just are just are just fantastic. Her work, and as we were discussing, some of your colleagues made before we just started this, just her publications are just uh, are, are very good, excellent in, in major outlets um, in critical economy. Uh, and uh, and it's, it, it really is uh, uh, a mark of her achievement at such a short time that she also got promoted as well. So, so our congratulations to her. And without further ado, I hand over to Lorena. Actually, uh, I'll, oh, I'll and, add... And then just to say that she's a yeah. senior lecturer 
yeah. at the Open University. Yeah. Sorry, I I, and I, I wanted to add that, that how uh, unlucky I am in this story because Lorena was going to be our PhD student and uh, that and she then, uh, learned, then she's going to come and be a postdoc with us that she ended up but every time to, to a better place so so yeah there we go so twice I'm sorry, Montu, but yeah they, they gave me a scholarship and they gave me a permanent contract <laughs> so, yes beaten every time is not, yeah. it's not enough for the yeah. compensate those material conditions of necessity <laughs> yes i want to call out the new liberal in you but that's all right exactly. <laughs> but yeah okay no, over mean, to you now now yeah, yes. but i mean it's glad i mean i'm glad that i mean it's like uh, i mean thank you for organizing this i think this is really interesting and uh, i mean with montu we met exactly when i was still like a postgraduate student basically a mature postgraduate student and uh, yeah i mean it's um I mean, I've been dealing with Uzbekistan since 2010 because I was uh, working for the UN there for three years and then I got in love with these amazing countries and that is why I decided to go back to academia and do a PhD about it. So this is the background stories and uh, that's how I met uh, Montu. But I'm really glad that, I mean, you are basically building up this network and... Um, consolidating both of the past scholars about it. Okay, but for the sake of time, I'll start. Um, ah, no, the last thing is that last year with Bella Weber, who works on China, we did 20 years of market transition, a panel at the DSA. So I think it's very punctual at the moment of, I mean, this was beyond Central Asia, was like Asia and planned economies, but um, I think it's a ne necessary reflection that we are doing here. So today I'm going to present something that has been presented around for some time. Um, and, uh, and it's mostly an, a, a, a theoretical exercise. Okay, so uh, the main point that, I don't know if you can see, can you see? Yes. Yeah, okay. So the main point that I, uh, I've said, I mean, the main reason why, um, why I started to um, uh, do this, to write this paper is because uh, it's been like uh, some times now, that some years that there is like all this fuss about the rise of state capitalism. And um, for someone who works on market transition, it's something like a no brain. It's like, uh, you know, the state has always been there. In, my, in various uh, social forms and uh, mechanism, but um, you know, this like how new institutions in the 21st centuries are becoming like uh, maybe the magic solution to, you know, the crisis of capitalism is something that wanted to, I mean, I think I needed to, be, to explore and link it to the debate of market transition. So um, what I'm going to do is to look at the patterns of market transition, the reflection about the ontology of market transition. So what do we mean by market transition? Uh, I'm going to look at the um, literature, literature of the 20th century about past-led uh, state accumulation, in particular primitive socialist accumulation. Um, and now this links with the state capitalism now. So, one of the contribution of this paper has been to historicizing this um, um, language. If you want, in this ontological category that I found it very, uh, yeah, uh, in a way very, yeah, self-contained. Um, and then I basically, I tried to apply uh, these changes and these like uh, two phases of state capitalism, if you want to, the, to, to um, Uzbekistan, by looking at the first phase of what I call like primitive state accumulation, uh, which goes from the 19, one, from independence to the death of Karimov. And then I'm gonna look at the second phase, uh, that's how at least I classify the temporalities of uh, Uzbekistan transformation. And now I'm gonna, and then I'm gonna highlight a little bit of the contradictions that um, are there. So uh, first of all about like, narrative of transition towards what so the narrative of transition has always been as a say uh, as always depicted the state market relations as dichotomic 
And this has been particularly visible in the context of post-Soviet and non-aligned states and satellite states and Eastern Europe states where reforms have been classified, you no know, options and policies have been classified in two main groups. And there is a, this amazing book by Gevorkian who kind of created a taxonomy about that. Um, or the first one, like the so-called shock therapy, a big bang, which has been mentioned today, was aligned to the Washington consensus, and it was a, a pretty much a neoliberal package of policies linked to fiscal discipline. And I mean, as a caveat, I'm an economist, so stop me if I'm too technical about things. <laughs> uh, public expenditure away from subsidies. Uh, financial liberalization of interest rates, trade liberalization, removal of buyers of for to foreign direct investments, privatization, deregulation, and property rights, and liberalization of exchange rates. The second options and patterns to transition has been this more gradual and more state-centric approach. And there has been a lot of work done in the case of China, for instance, but I mean, in the smaller case, uh, I mean, myself and I mean, also Franco now is doing things about it. So, um, so what I want to do, like emphasize is here is that these two strategies were aligned to a diverse epistemology and ideological approach uh, that basically uh, creates the premises uh, on which social relation of production and exchange uh, are organized. So from the one hand, we obviously have acknowledged the fact that across the global like spectrum, neoliberal pathways are becoming the hegemonic one. And there has been an, an intensification of the Washington and Wall Street consensus later on with patterns of corporate governance and financialization through capital account liberalization, which for instance, the case of Uzbekistan haven't had. Um, it is important to, the, however, it is important to problematize the reasons of why private ownership has been treated axiomatically as the end point and it looks at the transformation as a unidirectional or phrase because empirical evidence, and that is why the, the scholarship of state capitalism and I mean, uh, uh, like the work of Adam Dixon and Nus Dalami now is becoming so popular because there is still a, a, a empirical evidence that shows that there is a combination of public planning and hybrid forms of accumulation have led to higher level of socioeconomic growth, less volatility in the regimes of private accumulation, and avoided strong automation of the market. So there is an argument for which like our marketization has not been a sufficient condition to, to a successful transition to market economy. Um, so what has been uh, overlooked that I argue in this paper, but I, is, is be, this builds on, on my previous paper on state-led upgrading that relies uh, a lot on the Jessop um, strategic relational approach that we miss what has been the differences between like state and market as institutions and as uh, operator of uh, social relations of production and exchange. And is the first one, the multi-directionism, multi-scalarity that the state has. The second one is the ability to time and pace patterns of accumulation through coordination of reforms. So there is a, a focus on the dialectic strategies of accumulation and distribution that contribute to nurture the debate on historicizing the variety of state capitalism. So not only spatially, spatially but also um, uh, time-wise. Um, so this has been, uh, um, obviously, uh, a lot of linkages has been done with the state capitalism story, but there are still missing links in relation to class, space, and time. Um, so one way of doing it is how do we identify this? How do we may unpack these realities? Is to identify source of surplus, and now these surplus are distributed. Uh, so I'm gonna look at strategies of accumulation and distribution over time. And one of the analytical lens is structural transformation because this identifies a response variable that grasp specific effect and dynamics of accumulation through diversification of technology, creation of employment, et cetera, et cetera. 
So let's start from primitive socialist accumulation. This is a concept that has been uh, developed, uh, I mean, in the 20th century uh, by Brebrobojensky. Um, and is the accumulation in the hands of the state of material resources, mainly or partially from sources lying outside the complex of the state economy. Um, and this is a, a quote that I really like because I think it grasps the specificity of a typical global South low income countries, neoliberal, uh, neo colonial kind of story. And what is different about um, uh, post Soviet spaces. And there is the fact that there is the main source of when you have no colonies to extract from, the non um, non capitalist state, the, the non capitalist sector is the actually the main source of extraction. And this has been the case uh, in uh, for China, for Uzbekistan, for Turkmenistan, if you want, for Belarus, in different forms. Um, agriculture has been identified as the source of um, surplus to finance industrialization. This capital accumulation is basically um, being implemented, uh, setting up uh, prices that are not converging between production and market and between consumption and market and through nationalization of assets. So prices here, and this is a theoretical economic point, is not seen as an indicator of value and, and um, scarcity, but rather as a redistributional tool. Um, uh, okay, let me go, otherwise it becomes too economicistic. Um, so the Uzbek case, um, this is something that, I mean, I started to work on when I was like before starting the PhD, but I looked, I focused on the cotton sector to analyze a uh, system of extraction and patterns of extraction. Um, and then I basically here expanding a little bit more the institutional um, settings around this system of extractions. And uh, if you want, there is a, 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 through different sectors and, uh, and dimensions of the economy, a rejection of the main rules of neoliberal capitalism. Uh, because there is uh, an implementation of what has been, for instance, the Chinese policy of privatization to uh, keep it gradual and keep big public ownership of strategic upstream sectors, public red and privatized the smallest, including services. Uh, trade relations are, basing, uh, are based on political and geographical bilateralism and not in the, like if you want a liberal arena such as the WTOs. Uh, import substitution and public procurement, I mean, we all know here <laughs> that are, are actually the main policies through industrial and trade policies. There is a high spending in health and education as GDP, and there has been a, um, um, a presentation today that mentioned Polani to look at social policy actually as a filter to um, system of private accumulation or to system of accumulation. And I'm here, I, I mean, something that has been always overlooked about Uzbekistan, but if you compare uh, the same income countries, a World Bank classification, uh, Uzbekistan has maintained one of the highest um, investment in uh, health and education. There is a slow price uh, liberalization, and that was also like, I, I think I'm going to talk a bit about like sensitive uh, food product. And they kept a current account surplus that in, uh, for, uh, if you are a financial macroeconomist, that means that you don't have to ask uh, for credit to IMF, which is a big thing. <laughs> So um, examples of state accumulation, the agro-industrial complex, obviously uh, there has been an extraction from the cotton sector, but also from resource um, uh, based, such as gold and gas, we all know that. But what I'm arguing here is something that I've been mentioning in Franco's presentation is that it wasn't only an extraction, it was an ecosystemic uh, system, a, a ecosystem of extraction and redistribution that can, is not like comparable to any kind of predatory source of private accumulation uh, in uh, a neoliberal setting. Um, 
these have obviously, I mean, had uh, very good figures in terms of export at the, at the, in the world economy. Another very interesting policy is that is very is being very redistributional, although highly contested. And this I also published a paper about that with uh, Nodir Janibekov uh, in um, who is a um, research, senior research fellow at the University of Halle, uh, Yame, Yamo Institute, that basically were, they were called some transition economies. And basically, um, we looked at the um, wheat self-sufficiency policy because that was also part of the trade and uh, um, industrial policy. So they've been implementing uh, a, a diversification of land to produce uh, low quality, if you want, uh, wheat uh, through public procurement with uh, obviously a price setting. And there was a semi quota system in the sense that they, uh, farmers had to sell the, um, a quota to the state and the rest could be sold at the commercial market, which is, was obviously higher. And this has two strategic object objectives, to reduce the use of foreign currency for food import. And we saw that during the food crisis of 2007, 2008, this has been one of the biggest shock for low-income countries. And food security in remote and rural areas, given the population pressure. So I, I'm not saying that uh, people are, um, you know, um, uh, I mean, there is a, 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 a um, because I have also a paper on dietary diversity and I conduct a food type survey. Uh, so there is, for instance, a, a, um, a diversity and inequality in food access in relation to gender, for instance, to age and to space. But like food indicators in Uzbekistan, wheat production per capita went up and food indicators are um, objectively uh, improved as a result also of these policies. So there has been, uh, although, I mean, with obviously outdated machineries, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, very unsuccessful uh, experiments, um, um, declining the poverty rate, uh, literacy rate and uh, female to male enrollment in education has been uh, high, um, low public debt, and there has been a process of diversification. I mean, what I'm, I mean, it's also interesting that we are quantifying the years of these countries. These countries are independent, like indep have been independent for less than, you know, I'm basically born and they were still the Soviet Union. Uzbekistan wasn't, still wasn't Uzbekistan yet. Um, so what is interesting is like, so what has been the shift from the state-led uh, accumulation process to something else? And there's been, is, there is something else going on. So um, in 2016, this uneven exchange was not enough for capitalistic growth to expand. Because obviously, even if you're in a state capitalism, you know the filters, we are still living in a global capitalistic economy. And there is an intrinsic compelling, you know, urge to expand in order to survive. And this has been uh, obviously the uh, Mirzoyeva era started, but the process of transition has been uh, towards more private accumulation and more neoliberal phase of accumulation, if you want, started as a result of in, at the beginning, internal determinants, obviously there is an urban middle class that demand higher wages, they are much more educated, they want better jobs, and they want also, if you want, liberal changes. Uh, and employment needs both capital and infrastructure to be absorbed, which can be done through the integration to the global value chains. But however, there has been, there is a, also a power relationship within determinants. And I'm arguing that the, the two external determinants, in order to basically invest a pressure for um, market-oriented reforms coming from the IMF and the World Bank. And uh, here I'm quoting uh, uh, Lagarde, uh, who was at the time the head of uh, IMF in 2019. Uh, she went visit uh, Uzbekistan and says, um, 
So, but with these investments be channeled to, because I mean, she was basically acknowledging the fact that there has been a, a flow of internal capital between sector. So we, but they will this investment be channeled to the most competitive and profitable firms? Then the, there, is a, there has been a constant question in Uzbekistan and the answer is yes, if the right is right. So there is like a massive push for price liberalization and privatization. And the second uh, determinant has been uh, BRI uh, because it's been perceived obviously as a, a huge opportunity for credit and for investment in infrastructure and energy. So to recap what has been done since 2007, there's been a cut in import tariff, price liberalization and foreign exchange liberalization. Uh, there's been established the State Committee for Privatization and Demonopolization, which has created a lot of a series of privatization, although there has been a lot of yeah, joint stock companies that um, with a public stake. The establishment of foreign, um, uh, foreign uh, oh my God, uh, special economic zone. Sorry if I, there's a misspelling there. That, that now they're not five, they are maybe 10, I think. And there has been a process of commercialization of the financial sectors with new banks um, entering the financial market um, from abroad, which is uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, and there's been a process of lender prioritization in urban areas. So in this, in this process of transformation, China has become through tariff cuts, the main trade partner, they basically exchange natural resources in exchange of intermediate um, components, trade volume expanded. Um, there has been a, a, a kind of a patient capital approach to infrastructure. And uh, I mean, it's not ideological, but China has been able to resolve the uh, Kemchik tunnel. That is something that, called, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a particular uh, area of, uh, of the country that it was supposed to be connecting uh, Uzbekistan and Ki in Tajikistan for years. I remember when I was working in Uzbekistan, I was going to Tajikistan, it would took me like, like six hours or something like that to go by car. Um, and this has been, has been done through sort of technological transfer and cooperation and soft power through educational uh, actually cooperation as well. Some of these loans are in UN. So very interesting uh, currency bilateralism there. And there is a, a hybrid form of state capitalism in the bank banking and manufacturing sector. So um, is this a contradiction? And is this, uh, what is this blend of public accumulation and market integration? So there is a, a, obviously a circularization of credit and domestic demand uh, so there was a need for credit and capital to invest and create employment through, you know, like expanding the productive basis of the economy. But my argument is that there was still not ready. So there was not enough uh, structural transformation uh, reached. Uh, there is a problem, and this is something that post Keynes and M. Palle uh, brings about all the time that is like obviously you need capital but if you don't have endogenous capitalist classes that can acquire prominent capital there is a an intrinsic asymmetry in capital relationship between the global uh, capital economic powers in particular multinational corporation and the negotiation at the you know domestic level which creates uh, problems um so uh, China has become a, a key new player to attract foreign direct investment. Uh, at the same time, and this is something where, I mean, I think I slightly disagree with the previous presentation, um, land is, uh, uh, are not completely dispossessed, but are partially proletarianized. And for the reason I explained, because there is, even in the new clustering mechanism, um, there is a strong intervention in, uh, for instance, if you look at the wave of reforms, there has been a trial and error mechanism happening at the state level in order to minimize um, the concentrations of land in the hands of the few powerful, uh, you know, farmers in uh, rural areas. Um, 
property rights are still largely public. And um, so the state is closely involved, are still closely involved in the process of accumulation uh, because it localized uh, process of capital accumulation in specific sector. And at this point, we are still cannot like argue that there is a process of neoliberalization within the countries because there are still collective policies that contrast and resist of course, an hegemonic agenda that is not though like negotiated locally, but it has to be negotiated regionally and local and globally. Um, so one of the open questions that I'm asking to myself now is whether China and financial Western financial institutions are pushing the countries in opposite direction or are actually complementarizing the operation to you know, speed up the process of private capital accumulation. And I stop here. Thank you, uh, Lorena. Yes, uh, I, I will resist this time not to start asking the same questions we, I asked you before <laughs> last time. <laughs> so I open up, uh, 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 perhaps you can unshare the screen so we can get yeah. audience back in, yeah. So any questions? Please, Ilya. Hello. Hello, Hello. Renan. Uh, thank you for the presentation. So uh, my question is this. Uh, you started with uh, this idea that it is a theoretical sort of contribution. So what do we learn from Uzbekistan in terms of theory? Because uh, judging from the empirical part, it's basically the story of uh, a post-Soviet uh, state that refused to uh, implement uh, neoliberal reforms when others uh, did that, right? For instance, Russia. So, uh, but then uh, ultimately uh, cracking under pressure, Uzbekistan implemented uh, part, of, part of this package. So what does this perspective of uh, uh, surplus uh, a surplus extraction and accumulation regime. What does it bring to the table here? I didn't yeah. think about that. From a theoretical point of view, you mean? Yes. Okay. So I have to be, I mean, I to, basically I have to be precise. This paper doesn't like, um, didn't start by looking at Uzbekistan. It start so the theoretical contribution is about I'm, uh, I mean, in the paper is basically most of it, and then the, the rest of it is like applicable empirically to the case of Uzbekistan. But I'm basically merging the ontology of, two, of the scholarship of market transition and um, uh, state capitalism. Uh, and I'm arguing that we need to historicize, uh, uh, you know, like this. Um, kind of unidirectionalism uh, through which state, I mean, process of, uh, you know, primitive, uh, primitive um, social primitive accumulation of uh, beginning with. At the same time, uh, I found uh, the case of Uzbekistan uh, pretty uh, well suited to describe these processes. Obviously in 25 minutes, I couldn't, um, you know, argue that much, but, um, I, I hope that this review will be accepted and the paper will be published soon. But there is an, a um, kind of an excursus that create that discusses what is different and what is the same between previous process, 21st process of a you know um, state-led accumulation, and what have been the contingential differences um, that enable or disable the condition for state-led accumulation uh, today. Um, so, yeah, in that sense, uh, Uzbekistan is just my case study. Yeah, I mean, but Uzbekistan is quite interesting, you know, presents all these contradictions and uh, how we, we, we see things, uh, I mean, at a very superficial level. So you have to start capital markets as a big speak. So they create an agency for capital markets. And then you say you have innovation, you create a ministry for innovation and all of immediately there's a contradiction in <laughs> regulation uh, for the thing that you're saying that you have, you know, uh, free markets. So this really is a case to, if you want to theorize the, the test models, this is your, one of your best crucibles. Anyways, and 
So, any other questions? Balihar. Yeah. Um, oh, go on. Tomaso, Tomaso first. Go on, Tomaso. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot, Lorena, for this really interesting paper. Uh, and I think it, uh, you, you, um, uh, you, you r really managed to wrap the uh, complexity of um, the Uzbekistan economic path into a uh, quite sophisticated economic language. I, uh, I, I could follow nonetheless. Uh, which was good, good. Uh, but I, I still I, I found I mean to, for my taste uh, very little of uh, Uzbekistan itself in it and uh, what you present can be read in this peculiar ambiguity which also serves um, you know a new presidency that uh, claims uh, uh, implementing many changes and these changes are Still, I mean, a, a promise to see. I mean, how I I read your conclusion is that in fact, no still nothing really has happened, and I think you could be more uh, outspoken uh, with that. Um, and I mean, it, it helps um, obviously um, saying and 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 you know it. Just sorry. No, that's okay. I, I have to close the door. <laughs> Sorry, um, that um, uh, I mean, these companies and these economic processes can mean different things, and uh, owning land can be a, a, a liability uh, as much uh, as a fortune, depending on on the on the conditions that you have. So, in order to understand this, I think that many things are left a little bit intentionally suspended. So you, 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 for instance, term, there is an urban middle class demand for higher wages. Wow, I would like to see a bit of evidence, you know, okay. to contextualize the evidence on that to, to reflect what, what, what is really new therein, because it, it has quite the, the potential. And I mean, uh, you obviously are not an anthropologist, but a economist. So we, we, we speak the same language, but use different approaches and now maybe my way kind of methodological way to understand better what what is the change but can you can you portray uh, uh, stories of uh, su successful uh, uh, foreign uh, investments uh, in Uzbekistan and and counter portray them with unsuccessful ones so is it possible for foreign investors into the new regime to make money in Uzbekistan and actually go away with the money that they, that, they, that they make in Uzbekistan. And so when you write about China, my last comment, sorry for being so long. Uh, so I, I, I was so pleased to be reconfirmed for really the, the conclusion of my book on the collectivization, that Uzbekistan is really trying to mimicry, to, to emulate the uh, Chinese reform socialist path and maybe to, to understand this path, it, it is better, better to focus on the gradual evolution of the elites from a party machine to uh, uh, you know, a, a group of entrepreneurs and then their political backing. And something quite similar, I think, is, 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 uh, is where, uh, still adopted by Uzbekistan. But thanks for interesting paper. I, I'd like to see when it is finished then. Thank you. Should I reply? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes. Yeah. So, no, I mean, very good point. Thanks, Tommaso. I think it's, uh, you know, what is the interesting part? It, I, I, I mean, I'm collecting basically, I mean, because it's COVID, there is COVID, like I'm collecting, uh, I'm doing interviews on Skype. And uh, what I found it different, and I'm, I haven't had the chance to unpack this paper because I want to write another paper on exactly that is this new pattern of structural transformation by industry. Um, and I think what is happening with Mirzoyev is that he opened up, uh, not materially, but uh, formally. And this creates new patterns of competition between foreign direct investments. So before you had, you know, Russia, Kazakhstan, very regional and Soviet 
sphere of interest uh, orbiting around Uzbekistan, whereas now, I mean, yeah, there are like new players going on that are intersecting in uh, new marketized sectors, such as the banking and insurance sector. Um, and I mean, it, it might be that this, like, I, there is like, we can't really tell that it's like that is a change, but it's something new. So obviously we'll need to more evidence and more like time also to, to explore that. Um, higher wages, yes. I mean, I need evidence of that, but it, it's basically, yeah, my collection of uh, urban interviews and my access to my former colleagues, <laughs> parents and relatives. Um, and, um, uh, on the, um, yeah, no, I mean, just to add the, 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 the gradual evolution of the elite, I agree. And I mean, obviously Uzbekistan is trying to be like a small China, but at the same time, the elite of Uzbekistan is not that rich. <laughs> so they need, you know, uh, foreign uh, players to to even to like trade what comes from China or like, uh, you know, there is like still like most of the sectors that are not strategic industries are, are not privatized in a way that are marketized in a way that, you know, you, you absorb a, a middle class, like a, a, a domestic middle class. So um, obviously there are like a lot of aspects and nuances to this. But yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I hope that that will make sense to, to I mean, these are similar points that, um, yeah, the reviewers are making anyway. So, yeah. well, I, I think the, the pro lot of the problem is that how you classify the, the certain narratives which emerge, though, so, so we can look at the particular stories about UK gold companies uh, not being able to recover their costs out of uh, Uzbekistan, but then we don't talk about the big players like Talco selling trains and having getting paid for it, uh, massive things. You know, BASF chemical plants which exist, uh, the Korean investment uh, which is massive. Uh, ah. the, the things which work are somehow not don't arrive in academic literature because they're not a problem, and and often get completely you know invisible. Yeah, sorry, uh, Lorena. Uh, no, no, no. Sorry, just to uh, because I forgot what I want to say. There are success stories, and for instance, in especially in telecommunication sectors but through non-Western players. Southern players, not only non-Western. The Germans do very well, not, uh, uh, so, so do Swiss Spanish. do very well yeah. as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. We have plenty. So uh, there, are, there are pockets <laughs> of uh, success story, but for, for different reasons. But it's true, it's a nice thread like, to unpack those uh, issues of repatriation. Because now, I mean, on paper, by law, you can. We have a question from Ying Feng. Sorry. Hi. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, yeah. we can hear Very you. Very nice. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Just quick introduction of myself. I'm a PhD student and a supervision by Dr. Saxena, and I'm tracking BRI projects in Central Asia. So I just want to share a bit my idea about the BRI in, in Uzbekistan. From, uh, so far, from what I know, there is only one um, project, the one you mentioned, the country you know, uh, in Uzbekistan is officially um, put, and, put under the framework of BRI. And apart from that, if you compare Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, uh, like there is only one project in Uzbekistan, but there are like uh, there are 56 in Kazakhstan. And from what I know about this project, it is a project using preferential buyer credit from a Chinese policy bank. But it, uh, the tunnel is also part of the Angren Park Railway, which is financed by World Bank actually. So like the, the Chinese element is a small part in this big railway project mm, and i think you like i think so far there it is quite unclear about the scale of the belt road initiative uh, in any of its participant countries but if we want to really see 
was the impact of the initiative. Uh, like uh, we might need to make it clear if it's only one project, uh, the influence of it in Uzbekistan might be not that big. Yeah. yeah, no, thank you. I think it's a very good point because it allows me to clarify something. And this is something that in debate is really interesting. So Chinese were, are not in Uzbekistan only through the Belt and Road Initiative. There are Chinese investments that goes beyond and precedes BRI, uh, BRI. So I'm not, I mean, it's true that it's loganistic. So I'm sorry if I use the word BRI, but my focus is not BRI only. So the BRI only is, a, is something that is like, uh, and as you said, there is a small portion, although they did the most difficult one, they did the tunnel, which was the most costly. And it was like historically, like the most, the like one of the fastest, you know, infrastructural, uh, um, uh, you know, project. So, but yeah, there is a complement. I'm, I'm looking more of a, you know, like a BRI, but also as an entry point to look at more, especially manufacturing. I'm more interested in manufacturing and energy infrastructures. Um, and there is a question from the Io Higo Yat. Uh, yes, very good point. Uh, is in the paper, not in the presentation, unfortunately. The debt and um, external debt of Uzbekistan uh, doubled, actually tripled uh, in three years. Yep. All right. So uh, with that, shall we thank uh, Lorena and uh, we <laughs> thank you uh, and thank invite you. the next speaker. Uh, uh, Balihar, I don't think I'm going to take time away from him by introducing him. <laughs> so. But the floor is yours to start the presentation. Yeah. You are you're muted, I'm afraid. Yes, thank okay. you. Yes, I'm going to just share my screen. So hopefully this will work. Uh, here we go. So does that does that work? Yeah, that's fine. And if you can project it, it'll be even nicer if it works. Oh right, yeah. yes, of course. Yep. How's that? Is that is that good? Yep, perfect. Okay, and if I just use these buttons there, yep. Okay, good. Well, um, firstly, just to say, uh, this is a, a work that both, <coughs> excuse me, that both um, Amir and I have been working on for almost uh, seventeen years plus, um, and um, and what I'm presenting, uh, it is it is something that both she and I have spent a lot of time on. Uh, uh, sadly, she, she can't be with us, but she does send her good wishes to the uh, to the uh, workshop uh, participants. Um, this this um, presentation is really going to be um, uh, a summary of the book that uh, um, Amir and I have just published. Um, so this is a kind of a short plug for the book, um, uh, which really tries to discuss the nature of capitalism in Central Asia. Uh, what, are its specific, what, is, what are its specific characteristics? Um, going beyond terminologies like neoliberalism uh, and free market to, to show what are the specificities of it. And then also try to examine how we can broaden the discussion about capitalism to talking about politics, the state, and morality. So hopefully it tries to uh, deliver on those things uh, in, in this uh, short presentation. Um, so in terms of the, the, the argument that we make, uh, I think it can be captured in this slide here, um, that what we've seen over the last 30 years or so in Central Asia is a transformation that has legitimized and promoted a specific form of capital accumulation that's based on rent extraction. Um, sometimes we uh, scholars use the word rentism or rentership, but it's this idea that rent extraction 
is a specific and significant part of the regime of capital accumulation. And it's probably worth just uh, spending some time here to say that rent doesn't just mean land rent or ground rent or housing rent or even natural resource rent, uh, though these are clearly significant for the region. But it also includes interest, interest rates, capital gains, and newer forms of rent extraction, such as platform rents, uh, digital, digital uh, economy, um, rent arising from uh, natural monopolies, utilities, rent uh, arising from uh, the, uh, the media, like the spectrum rent. So it's a range of uh, uh, rents that we uh, examine in the book. And what's Specifically interesting is that these forms of income are called rent as opposed to profit. And this is an important part of the argument that what we are talking about here is wealth extraction rather than wealth creation. Uh, classical political economy would make a distinction between rent and profit. Profit arises from the creation of commodities which are then sold and the capitalists are able to appropriate the revenue to surplus value in the form of profit. Uh, in these cases here, uh, assets already exist, and, but nevertheless, they are uh, controlled and owned and controlled by uh, powerful organizations, groups that are able to extract profit so extract income, merely because they control the resources. And uh, the resources, assets, things like money, land, real estate, uh, 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 distributions, uh, platforms, and uh, et cetera. And uh, classical political economy makes a distinction between <coughs> uh, earned income, income that's based on productive capital, and unearned income, which is uh, based on a mere ownership of assets. And this is unearned income that I'm specifically uh, discussing in this uh, presentation. Following on from that, the second part is that the uh, rent extraction generates and has generated a range of harms. That's why it matters. Uh, this is just a uh, uh, an exercise in mental gymnastics. The reason why Amir and I are concerned about this is because of the harms that it generates, the damage that it produces. Uh, Quat and Ilya, uh, Ilya uh, initially in their presentation, uh, talked about the income inequality. Income inequality largely arising from asset ownership. You know, the billionaires, they don't do uh, work uh, because they are their work, uh, 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 they, they produce uh, uh, outputs, but rather because they own key assets, whether it be finance, land, natural resources, that enables them to become billionaires or millionaires. So it's about income inequality. Furthermore, it also produces social suffering, harms, in, in terms of the, because if you're extracting rent, you are doing so from, uh, a social relationship which is parasitic, in which you, you are uh, extracting from those who produce a surplus value. And we will talk uh, uh, later in, in, in the kind of the forms of distress this causes uh, uh, of, through these usurious interest rates, for instance, the incredible debt and uh, extraction of interest that this causes much of the populace. Environmental damage, I think this is something that uh, was well covered by a couple of the speakers today, in particular uh, 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 Tomaso, uh, who talked about how as a result of ownership of natural resources or key minerals, it and the, the drive for uh, um, uh, predatory extraction gives rise to pollution damage to the ecology. It also harms the 
productive capital of the economy. Because as more resources go into rent extraction as opposed to productive capital, it diminishes the growth and development of the economy. Furthermore, it also gives rise to uh, corruption and fraud. Um, and that I will kind of also explore. And finally, and I think this is key, that it also produces plutocracy, the rule of the rich. One of the interesting things in doing this book, both our mayor and I discovered, was how the key uh, political leaders and the echelon, the, the political class, how they were mostly rich individuals, people who owned key assets, whether it be finance, real estate, natural resources, or uh, uh, property rights for food distribution or other uh, uh, natural monopolies. And then I think the third part of this argument is that we just don't want to leave it there. Uh, yes, it produces harm, but it also produces a backlash. And I think, uh, I think it was uh, 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 Hassan who talked about the importance of Palani's double movement, that in the process of the commodification of key assets, money, land, labor, uh, Palani also argued that this produces a, a counter movement in which the populace asks for uh, 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 protection, social protection from the harms that have been generated. And this gives rise to uh, 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 social movements of a variety of sorts in which they seek to counter the damaging effects of commodification of key assets. Now, underpinning all this is a theoretical con contribution that uh, Amir and I want to make, is that uh, this is also a moral economy, a moral economy which is underpinned by norms, discourses, values, uh, and, and we will explore that uh, uh, as we go through the case studies. So whilst this is a political economy, it's also a moral economy in which values, uh, norms, traditions, customs are both shaped and shapes economic uh, 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 forces and pressures. And in doing so, I think we go back to Adam Smith, I think, and or Amartya Sen, more contemporary uh, uh, scholar, in how we shouldn't try to uh, uh, see the disciplines uh, in their kind of uh, silos, but try to offer a what I uh, call a post-disciplinary analysis of the region, which combines sociology, economics, ethics, uh, that encompasses, I think, the richness and the complexity of the social economic practices. And, but more specifically, how does the moral economy work? Well, firstly, uh, as you've already uh, 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 heard me speak, there, there is an important moral economic distinction to be made between earned and unearned income. Uh, income, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, based on mere ownership and control of scarce assets, land, labor, uh, uh, and hotel, is parasitic. It doesn't produce new goods. It's what some have called something for nothing. And that is a moral argument, a moral argument that people, the billionaires that we heard about in the earlier presentation, they, are, they accumulate unearned income. It is undeserved. I think the, 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 uh, uh, the second part of this moral economy is the perspective that the role of social science or social scientists is not merely to, to describe and uh, explain uh, how rent extraction works or, or part of the economy works, but also to evaluate it. Well, what's wrong with it? What's wrong with inequality? What's wrong with uh, uh, concentration of wealth in certain hands, whether it be domestic or foreign? Uh, what's wrong with uh, uh, that certain uh, labor 
uh, uh, labor, part of the labor force is gendered. Uh, and I think it's the job of the social scientists uh, to be able to evaluate whether something is unjust, damaging, or harmful. And I think what Amir and I try to do here is to offer that perspective, not merely to describe and explain rent extraction, but also to evaluate it. And in doing so, explain why it's harmful to people's well-being and to the uh, uh, development of the economy. And I think what I call the third part of this is to recognize individuals are merely sense makers, meaning makers that often tends to be characterized in uh, certain parts of the literature, both anthropology and sociology, but also to recognize that individuals are evaluative beings who have concerns, who are able to relate to others in terms of their suffering and injustice, and importantly, to seek about social change and justice. So it is to recognize that people don't, are not just have things done to them, they're not merely passive actors, uh, just the, the pushes and pulls of external factors that impinge upon their lives, but they have uh, uh, values, agency, concerns that also to bring about a different kind of world um, and doing so trying to aspire to some sort of hope. Um, and <clears throat> In terms of the, uh, the kind of research questions that, uh, that we have here, is that there are three, uh, and you can see them there in, in the slide. Firstly, it's about how uh, rent extraction is justified and normalized uh, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. These were the two countries that we looked at in Central Asia. What were the effects uh, on people and society? And then of course, the, the third part is how was it uh, 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 resisted. And in doing so, uh, in both in this presentation and the book, we, will, we offer uh, uh, three case studies of commodification uh, of money, land, and natural resources, and then explicate the nature of rent extraction or rentierism uh, in the form of interest, capital gains, and natural resource rent. So, um, so the first case study that I look at, that we look at here, is the one of money, uh, a finance. Uh, and as uh, Lorena and others have also pointed out, this is becoming increasingly important in the development of the uh, uh, post-Soviet economies. And it's also an important part of the neoliberal uh, rent extraction. It is worth noting first is that uh, usury uh, uh, or, or interest under the uh, Soviet Union was characterized as immoral and was criminalized because it was seen as part of the unearned income. Marx railed, railed against it and so did other political economists, Adam Smith, Ricardo, Keynes uh, and uh, John Stuart Mills all railed against the unearned income because they were seen as parasitic and undeserved. And this is one of the features of the Soviet Union that it did try to, to hold, hold true to that viewpoint that, we, that the economy should minimize unearned income. But what we've seen since 1991, the, uh, the, the economic reforms, is how a uh, uh, neoliberal financial institution, IMF or bank, but also the uh, uh, European Bank of uh, uh, Development and Reconstruction, the Asian Development Bank, et cetera, and the list goes on, how they have uh, promoted and expanded finance, and in particular, microfinance, something that Quatt also noted in his presentation. And uh, in doing so, yes, credit matters, and, and clearly this is a point that Hassan also made in, 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 in his presentation, that economy depends on uh, 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 credit to fuel the wheels of commerce. But what's interesting is that in doing so, the neoliberal version of finance also introduced usury, introduced interest, which allowed the lenders, whether it be foreign or domestic, 
uh, not only to, to own and control the credit, the credit money, but also to charge as much as they wanted to. And it's worth bearing in mind here that when we talk about the term free market, let's be clear what kind of free market we're talking about. We're not talking about the free market of the classical political economy, because in, 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 uh, in classical political economy, free market meant economy free of rent. That was the key issue uh, for the classical political economists, Adam Smith and Attell. They wanted to minimize the power of the landlords, aristocratic feudal, feudal uh, uh, groups that were able to extract economic rent and do so diminish the, the productive nature of the economy. We're here, what we're talking about here, the free market, is the neoliberal version of the free market, which says that the government uh, will do nothing to prevent uh, these owners, or sometimes also called volunteers, to uh, uh, extract freely from uh, uh, people who need the rent, uh, who, who need these key assets, uh, 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 and, and, and in doing so, this, this becomes a free market of a neoliberal version, which allows the expansion of uh, rent extraction. So let's be clear that uh, uh, things like interest and other forms of rent extraction are based on power. They're not based on any productive capacity, just merely on power, because in, this, in the case of money, lenders are able to control what the borrowers want but lack. But nevertheless, the rich have to justify themselves, don't they? They have to, they can't just say, well, we are powerful, therefore we get whatever we want. They have to uh, frame their, their, their world and their uh, ownership as if being fair. Uh, uh, even though, as Ilya pointed out, they can be uh, uh, called out for their fakery, they can be called out for their hypocrisy. Uh, and so that uh, people can see through their, their uh, mystifications and their uh, myths and uh, discourses as being shallow. But nevertheless, uh, the, the, the rich, the lenders do try to justify interest on certain kinds of discourses, or mark, for example, like market choice, market freedom, equality, as well as using cultural norms. And in the book, uh, we explore that. Um, the lenders also engage in uh, uh, predatory lending, aggressive lending, especially at, in rural areas and the expansion of the, uh, the, the microfinance, which were interestingly in Kyrgyzstan, all supported by USAID. Worth repeating that the key major uh, 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 microfinance institutions by Tishun, Finca, and Companion were all supported by ASID, uh, USAID, who then, actually, and these institutions report on the basis of being social enablers of uh, empowering women to go into entrepreneurship, uh, also had to be financially sustainable, and then they became private commercial banks later. And of course, when people struggle to pay their loans back, um, um, then the banks use the discourse of financial literacy to individualize uh, and to depoliticize the problems, saying, well, they just weren't educated, were they? So this indebtedness, uh, so, so one of the things that we, that we saw and the one of the things that we explore in the, in the uh, 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 book, is the uh, astronomical growth of debt or distressed debt in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, both, both uh, uh, urban and rural, that produce anxiety, insecurity, insecurity because their debt is due to collateralize, and if they can't pay, they lose their homes, for instance. The shame, the shame of that arises from debt collectors uh, publicly shaming them for not paying their debts, especially women here. And of course, economic dispossession, because uh, what you have is surplus value being moved from the poor to the rich. And what we saw is the uh, uh, grassroots local resistance against aggressive form 
for, against aggressive, intimidating, and fraudulent uh, uh, lending practices uh, per perpetrated by the uh, 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 by the banking and microfinance sector. Um, and the anti-debt movement, also worth noting here, highly gendered, largely because uh, microfinance was clearly targeted towards women to become uh, entrepreneurs. Uh, they campaigned both at the local and the, and the national level. And also, interestingly, they also picketed outside the US Embassy in Bishkek. Why? Because remember the story I told you about the British uh, Young uh, Finca and Companion? They were supported by USAID. And what the, what the protesters, the movement leaders, and the activists demanded was state regulation, control of uh, the user's interest. Uh, just no different to what the classical political economy uh, were also advocating, the old version of, of free market. And again, I suppose this goes back to uh, Ilya's uh, graph when uh, the, the, the population, uh, the, the opinions, the attitude opinions, when people say, well, they want state control or they want a greater state intervention, I think this is what they're probably asking for. They're asking for greater protection against the predatory nature of some of the key actors within the economy, whether it be lenders, landlords, or the foreign transnational capital. But what we saw, uh, sadly, uh, is just like what uh, Lorena pointed out, that the state is strategically selective in what kind of action it takes. And what we saw is how both in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan, uh, uh, the state were strategically biased towards protecting, uh, 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 protecting uh, lenders' interest over uh, 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 people's well-being. So the state was actively involved in, in co-opting and dividing and discrediting social movements, but also when they were giving assistance, it was highly targeted either to the middle classes for a short period of time because they were seen as, as, as important for political, for, for political reasons, or it was highly limited, just especially uh, 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 when the uh, new Kazakhstan uh, uh, president came to power. He had to, he had to be shown to be seen to be benevolent, and he did offer limited assistance, but very short to uh, the uh, borrowers. Sorry, um, uh, Montu, how much time do I do I do I have, please? You have exactly five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I will, I will, I will kind of speed through some of uh, some of the next uh, uh, several slides. So the uh, next case study that we also looked at was the land and real estate. What's worth noting here is that the uh, the uh, uh, during the Soviet Union, there was a version, there were a bundle of, of property rights which, which, which did respect people's private property. But what it outlawed, what it prohibited, was the right to speculate, dispose, and profit, uh, to dispose of profit and to rent. What we've seen after uh, 1991 was how the state became involved in rewriting the property relations that enabled property developers to. Uh, uh, and property owners to speculate, rent, and dispose of profit. And I think that's the key here. As I said, there always existed a version of property rights during the Soviet Union. But what happened under neoliberalism is the ability to extract rent uh, through speculation, capital gains, uh, or just because you own the property and you rent it out. That became important. And the state partly at the, uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the pushing of international financial institutions, uh, instituted and facilitated that. And it's worth saying here that uh, uh, in the book, we make a distinction between a property, property which is used for its purpose, to be lived in, to be inhabited, and in property, where it's used merely to extract unearned income and to exacerbate a uh, 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 concentration of, of, of wealth. And, uh, and, and in the book, uh, we explore how 
the uh, new housing accommodation complex, both in Almaty, Astana, and Bishkek, enabled rich investors to have in property instruments by which they could extract wealth. And in doing so, this, this regime also uh, uh, incentivized uh, city mayors, especially in Bishkek and uh, Astana uh, in, and in uh, uh, Almaty, to be involved in fraudulent and corrupt deals in which they gave prime land sites to the rich and powerful so that they could develop uh, real estate, gentrify it, and, and then enhance the rent capacity of those uh, uh, properties. And in Bishkek, what we particularly saw was how the Bishkek City Council was largely dominated by a plutocratic class, a plutocratic class of uh, councillors who were all connected to the property and construction interest. So we see how, as a result of this rent extraction, they were able to uh, capture the state and further the state for their uh, form of capital accumulation. Uh, this, not surprisingly, this causes a lot of homelessness and landlessness, producing uh, 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 vulnerability and lack of well-being because people are struggling to, 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 to have homes. And we did see in places like in uh, uh, Almaty, Bishkek, and also Nusultan, the, formula, the, the emergence of informal settlements, both through what's sometimes called quiet encroachment, but also through states sanctioned land uh, invasion, especially uh, after the Tulip Revolution. And what were these movements demanding? What were they asking for? Well, they were asking for greater land so that they could build up their own homes because the land was just not available to them and they couldn't afford the rent. Or when they did have informal, uh, informal settlements, that, that they, should not be, they should not be evicted like what happened in Almaty, Shanarak and Baikai, and that these should be legalized and improved so they have, electric, they have uh, uh, electricity and uh, uh, greater forms of uh, 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 public, public infrastructure like sanitation, education and hospital. Interestingly, highly gendered, uh, but it's also worth noting here that uh, this, uh, the, 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 the state governance, including the, the courts, the, the judiciary, largely promoted the rule of law. What does the rule of law mean? The rule of law means the rule of the rich to protect their interest. And also how the city councils uh, tried to evict uh, 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 at the informal settlements, uh, uh, evict the informal settlers from their uh, uh, sites so that it could be enhanced, gentrified, so that it could facilitate greater rent extraction. The third case is one of natural resources, and I think what our colleagues here have already spoken at length at that. But it's probably worth just making a couple of notes here. Firstly, the importance of how, uh, after the, 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 the independence, how Western transnational corporations, BP, EMI, uh, uh, Mobile, uh, and, uh, and, and, and other Western energy and mineral, company, uh, mineral companies were quick to seize valuable resources. And what they then did was to institute production sharing agreements, PCAs. This is significant because as we saw in Thomas, uh, 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 governments were struggling to get the investment that they needed for these industries to, to produce. So uh, they got private investors, uh, uh, foreign investors to give them the money, uh, but at, uh, at the cost, of effectively giving away much of the resources, much of the revenues and profits to the uh, uh, transnational investors. And what we've further seen is how this, these profit sharing agreements, which are long term, they're over 20, 20 to 30 years, they can't be changed. Once they are, once you have the contract, they can only be changed if the investor consents only if he consents. 
uh, and the legal judicial governance mechanisms are used to protect and legitimize the investors property rights and of course their ability to extract so PSAs limit the ability of, uh, 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 of governments to change unfavorable uh, and unequal PSA agreements. And we've seen that in the Comptour case, the gold mine in Bishkek. Uh, but also how these uh, 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 mechanisms also operate at the supranational level, undemocratic, it should be said, undemocratic ways through uh, things like the International Tribunal Court, which uh, uh, adjudicates when there's a conflict between the, the state and the investor. These are undemocratic elected officials who tend to invariably uh, favor the investor class. And what we've seen is the, again, and I think colleagues have, have already explored this, the emergence of counter movements, social movements, both environmental and labor, and one of the things that I was struck, uh, struck by was, 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 was when Almero showed me uh, the, 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 the list of strike actions in the oil industry had been going on for two decades or so, uh, largely against unpay and unjust working conditions, both at the contractual level, but also at the subcontractual level as well. Um, and of course, the state, and I think this is important here, that the state isn't a benevolent actor. It's not. It's not. It's not a neutral actor by any means, as as as, as Lorena pointed out. But he uses violence, and we saw that in General Gen, to prioritize the rights of investors over those of over over those of their citizens. And if I can just conclude with this, uh, and, and apologies for, for 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 taking the indulgence of, of going over time. So if I can just make three three uh, uh, comments here. Firstly, I hope in this presentation it comes across that the, the, the forms of rent that we've been looking at uh, are significant, but also importantly, they're licit, they're legal, they're widespread, and of course they're diverse, and they're primarily captured by the business elites. And I think one of the frustrations that Almir and I have in the literature around rent seeking is that it far too often characterizes rent seeking as either illicit, corrupt, illegal, or just something specific to the public sector, the state. And I think we need to get away from, from that because what that does is that it buys into the public choice theory, a right-wing choice theory uh, uh, that's perpetrated by right-wing economists like James Buchanan and others who see that uh, who see that we need to minimize the state because only the state uh, engages in rent seeking. Well, that's factually wrong. It's also the private sector that engages in rent seeking. The, the second point that uh, I think we want to make here is about class analysis. All too often, class analysis is in the uh, kind of usual way, the capitalist versus the proletariat. And I think there's a lot of truth in that and important work has been done. And I think uh, both Franco and Thomas uh, have showed the value of that kind of work. But I think this also misses a significant part of the emergence of class relations, which are not based on productive capital or productive relations, but are based on ownership and control of scarce asset, money, land, and natural resources and, and others. Uh, and, and I think we need to be clear that, and, and, I, and I have this kind of, kind of slide here, you have the distinction between the asset poor, the tenants, the borrowers, and the customers, and the asset rich, the owners, the monopolies. And what happens, this is an unequal relationship, and payments are given to enrich further, enlarge the wealth of the, uh, of the, of the rich assets, and hence why you have those billionaires and the explosion of inequality, and the impoverishment of the asset poor. And finally, about the resistance uh, element uh, of, of, of our work. Because clearly what we try to show here is the, the importance of the double movement or the, the importance of resistance in moral economy. And I think this speaks to uh, E.P. Thompson, James Scott, Polanyi and others who've shown that you've got to have 
politics and, and how people on the ground resist to the harms uh, uh, that have been perpetrated uh, in the name of, in this case, uh, a free market. But it's also worth pointing out here that what we saw sadly in our uh, uh, case studies, how, how all too often uh, the working classes, the middle classes uh, uh, tended to normalize the regime and the exploitative conditions of their relationship and tended to depoliticize them. And all too often we saw passivity and acquiescence rather than resistance. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Balihar. I'm sure there are plenty of cogs turning in people's heads and questions are jumping out and so on. But I, as we get started, I just wanted to say, but I have one thing that, that always, as, as someone who sits between the disciplines uh, in, in a drastic way, uh, is the, well, what, I, what I struggle to explain often is that, that here I, well, I agree with you like 1000%. <laughs> but at the same time, my problem is that, that when we talk about the state, the, 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 the public sector, uh, uh, and its own makeup uh, in this kind of argument, even when I make it myself, the same argument, I, my assumption is that, that it is ultimately the, made of good things and if it's gone astray, it can be made good kind of a thing. But at other times I you know, worry that is that possible? When I look at uh, the country I live in and the country I come from, those look like equally impossible tasks that the state itself is, uh, you know, the state is the corporate and the corporate is the state and that thing i you know it becomes very difficult to resolve uh and and that only applies if you're seeking how you're going to fix the problems that you are stating right so meaning where what is the purpose of the resistance and where does it lead to eventually and that philosophical point we have to still think about uh but anyway i i, I don't want you to yeah, let, let's let's listen okay. to other questions yeah if you wish to, yeah no, I stopped. Yeah, oh, go ahead. Okay, okay. Yeah. Well, well, I suppose I don't see the state as a corporate entity. No, I, no, I, 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 I don't see it either, and I, I see that you don't see it. That yeah, no, yeah, we yeah. agree on that. I'm just saying that. That, that because, 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 because what I see the state is, it's, a, it's a site of social contestation of, of various forces, in which, in which the various key forces then try to capture the state capacity and resources for their own needs, and of course, in this way. Clearly, what we see is how the rich and the powerful and the international are able to be better at, at marshalling their social forces, and and how, uh, uh, as we uh, explored here, um, how the state uses its kind of and, and how it then uses uh, violence against the 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 the, uh, the 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 poorer and weaker classes. So, so I think I think it's, it's be, 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 uh, but it's spot on. I think I think I think I think we could be, be careful how we use the term for state. But uh, but, but I'm, I'm quite clear on on, on how, how we use it. That yeah. It is it is a social force that is contested, and it is how who gets to have sure, control. Sure. I mean that th that's the government side of things, and then there is the governance side of things, and the idea of having a dispassionate, competent civil service which, you know, uh, is, is another aspect which, which fits into this story and how that its subversion and its own momentum can completely destabilize many of the things that we're discussing. But anyway, I'm hogging again. So let Ilya come in and Tomaso. So, yeah. Ilya, please. Ilya is not coming in. All right, uh, we, we'll then let Tomaso start and we'll go back to Ilya. Okay, but only if Ilya is really not coming in, but now he is, so I'm waiting. Just, uh... I think he's having internet issues, yeah. Oh. All right, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now, yeah. Excellent. So, uh, Balihar, thank you for the presentation, and I think that so that does my internet work. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid it's freezing a little bit, but let's try. Go ahead and ask your question. 
can I uh, can I give the floor to Tommaso and uh, improve my internet? Sure, no, no problem. All right, Tommaso, go ahead. Uh, well, Balihar, uh, so no let me problem. start that I'm uh, uh, really excited about your book. Um, and uh, I, I see you, you will give me a lot of homework um, and that I have to uh, now uh, more thoroughly engage with uh, the concept of uh, rent uh, as to oppose mere profit also in my uh, political analysis. And I'm, I'm gladly ready uh, to do it. And uh, besides of this, I, I, I think it, this, uh, I haven't read your book now, but it seems like really a milestone contribution into the understanding of uh, uh, how uh, uh, social uh, relations are, are, um, uh, across classes in Central Asia uh, have been evolving. And so I, it's really uh, very welcome and also very exciting, I think. This is, I'm, I'm sure this uh, will uh, open uh, new sets of, uh, of questions that were uh, duly uh, necessary to to open up, and so I and I, and, and I, I really like the outspoken and uh, uh, to the point way of uh, uh, framing the social conflicts uh, based on uh, distorted uh, morality uh, that um, um, that you you are pointing at uh, very eloquently through through case studies in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan. Um, I did not totally. Uh, uh, find myself in your um, way you, you you seem to frame class uh, discourse in, in Temir Tau, but I think it's it's rather a pragmatic mis misunderstanding. I don't I don't see there any real incompatibilities um, because um, I'm, I, I wasn't uh, so much defining uh, social groups uh, in, in terms of the relations of production and their ownership, but really in, in terms of power uh, differentials and uh, in a relational way that I think uh, well uh, talks to, to, to what uh, you, 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 you were doing. Um, um, just uh, maybe rather than top down uh, working from the uh, theory, uh, I was trying to bottom up, uh, uh, working out the making or remaking of a specific, a specific uh, uh, working class. But my observation is rather to the part where you emphasize very strongly the aspect of resistance, uh, which for instance, in my own uh, framing of the research was figured very prominently at the beginning uh, of the project. And uh, I mean, I, I had there really to, to make some reconsiderations. So the capacity and the uh, willingness and the ability to articulate resistance isn't unequally uh, equally, uh, distributed uh, among uh, uh, the, the, the deserving uh, but uh, the, uh, penalized ones. And uh, it is not just the feature of the asset poor, but uh, they have some asset, the asset rich, uh, being just, uh, if only intellectually uh, asset rich or rich in a history uh, of a particular class trajectory, like I said, the, the company workers rather than the very precarized workers that are class in the making, if you're industrializing, pro proletarianizing, are the one who can articulate uh, forms of resistance. And so when you so prominently talk about organized resistance, um, this a little bit uh, goes against the grain of uh, my uh, experience or my reading of, of Central Asia. Uh, I see the resistance still a pattern, uh, you know, of the ma of, 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 a, of a niche that is in, in fact then already a little bit better off than the uh, the one who who have not even a, a consciousness of the social situation and of the class pattern. And so I'm not so optimistic in this sense as, as your uh, book uh, seems to, 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 to entail this promise that uh, there is a strong counter, counter movement uh, coming up. Uh, the, the story seems to me a bit still more complicated, uh, but uh, also very uh, bifurcated empirically so that you have to see at the context and 
and see that uh, the forms of uh, resistance of articulating uh, class discourses uh, are only incipient. They are only mushrooming now. But thanks a lot for this great work that I will uh, surely order for our library. Good. <laughs> uh, so, so at least I will get some royalties uh, from the uh, from the book. <laughs> so, 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 thank you. So, thank you, uh, to us. Um, just to uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, respond to that. I mean, I, actually, I don't think there's that much of a disagreement in, in what we're saying. I think I think perhaps uh, we're just using uh, class uh, either in an abstract or a more concretized form. And I think I think that's the you know, uh, and, and and I totally appreciate. You know, kind of, you know, there's a distinction between, you know, like kind of a kind of a Marxist or, or, or more of a Bavarian or kind of a, you know, that goes more, that is more multi, multifaceted as opposed to this singular around the ownership of, of assets. But, but, but I think, I think, I think we, I think we more or less agree that class is multifaceted. Uh, it just, I suppose the definition of class or, or the concept of class depends on what it is that you want it, it to work uh, or what is it, what kind of work you want it to do. And clearly, there was a, you know, in the presentation, there's a certain kind of definition of class that we put forward because we are trying to uh, uh, identify, explicate, and evaluate a certain kind of uh, distribution of surplus value. Um, and and I think I, I think I also agree with you, Thomas, about about resistance. I, I think I think I think it is bearable and it's uneven. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's something that, that uh, the working class or the poor, or the marginalised don't also engage in. I think what, we, what was surprising when we were looking at, uh, at the, uh, the anti-debt movement, it actually came from the, the, the very poor. Why? Because they were the, the, the cold face of the usual interest rates, uh, which then got picked up by the middle classes. That's the interesting thing. It was actually coming from the very rural areas of, uh, I mean, in the case of uh, uh, Kyrgyzstan, the rural areas, the southern, the southern areas of, of Kyrgyzstan, because of the, 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 the distress, the anxiety, the, you know, all the kind of precarity that uh, I spoke about on Monday, resulted in that they had to do something. They were losing their homes. What do you expect people to do? I think, I think all too often we call the Marxist um, amongst the class analysis on our resistance, all too, all too often it's about class consciousness. Yeah, maybe, but it's also about how it hurts, how it damages the things that they care about, whether, you know, someone lost their home, uh, whether, and I think this goes back to the point that I was uh, making at the, at, at the start, people are evaluative beings, right? They're evaluative beings. They're not merely critical, critical animals. They're also evaluative beings. They, their relationship to their world is one of concern, and I think, and I think that's the lay morality that uh, that we explicate in the in the in the book. But I don't think there's that much of a disagreement. But yeah, uh, in fact, uh, to us, uh, I'll be if you if you were to buy if if your library was to get the book, I'd be happy if you were to do a review, a, a review and uh, and challenge me on uh, and challenge us on the on our on our ideas. Ilya. Yes, thank you. So my internet works better now, I think. Uh, and uh, thank you for the presentation again. I think that uh, the concept of rent describes like most of what's going on in post-Soviet economies. And uh, uh, what is like striking is that the whole world moves in this direction. And there are articles, uh, for instance, uh, by Joseph Stiglitz and by many others who, who say that uh, basically the global economy is now organized around rent. So in some sense, uh, our region sort of anticipated this transition and now, now, now the whole world, including, you know, developed world is, uh, is moving towards this post-Soviet situation of rent dominating uh, everything else. And uh, this would be interesting to develop. Like uh, how come our countries became pioneers in this transformation of uh, capitalism? But um, I'm a little bit concerned that when we talk about rent and in particular the moral economy of rent and uh, this sort of criticism of rent, 
we might fall into, into this uh, trap, I think, in which a lot of liberals in Russia have fallen because uh, they are very uh, apt at criticizing uh, like this parasitic bureaucratic class, for instance, the politicians, the rent-seeking elites, but uh, they turn a blind eye on, uh, well, exploitation, right, which is not the same as rent. And uh, uh, so, so, so what I'm concerned about is that if we focus too much on, on rent, then we might overlook uh, what, what makes capitalism, capitalism, exploitation, and uh, this type of uh, very traditional way of uh, appropriating surplus value. And after all, there is exploitation going on uh, in, in, in post-Soviet countries is like people are underpaid and they're exploited and they create the fortunes for uh, for big business and uh, so uh, wh wh why I describe this as a trap because um, for instance Navalny that I was talking about he criticizes the rent seeking businessman the, the bad you know the bad among the business but he always says that there are good businessmen and one of the good businessmen is the owner of the largest retail store chain in Russia, Sergei Galitsky, uh, who clearly made an enormous fortune out of exploitation. So yes, we, could, we would not call him a rent-seeking oligarch uh, who used his political connections. What he used was uh, paying very small wages to a huge, huge army of uh, you know, store workers and uh, their average uh, salary is something like uh, $300, $400 a month uh, across Russia. And uh, Galitsky's own uh, fortune is uh, around $5 billion, right? So it's, it's, it's a very clear example of exploitation. So I wouldn't call it like rent extraction. I would call it exploitation in the Marxist sense. So uh, maybe we should have some kind of integral critique that tries to um, combine these forms of uh, surplus extraction, right? So rent and exploitation, they go hand in hand in most cases. And uh, there are some hybrid forms, probably, when you have an oligarch who exploits, exploits the workers in Temirtal, for instance, but also uses this for some kind of offshore tax uh, avoiding uh, tax evasion activities, and this constitutes a form of rent. So, so uh, Tamas's example, I think it's a combination of exploitation and rent in some sense. So what do you think about that? Yeah. Um, no, no. Again, some 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 great points there, and of course, uh, by uh, clearly uh, um, in in offering an analysis, an analysis, one is always uh, uh, mindful that one's offering a, an abstract, an account, and where you have to be very selective about what it is that you're looking at, um, and and clearly the focus here was was was, was on rent, but you're quite right to focus on the, the exploitative labor conditions as well. I think, I, and, and, and by no means uh, do I mean, and I want to diminish that. Um, because, I mean, uh, and, and, and of course it's also bearing, bearing, bearing worse in mind that the, the, the exploitative labor conditions that the worker finds themselves in a factory or, or a retail store uh, is, the surplus, the, the, the income that they produce is one that they use to pay off their lenders or their, or their uh, uh, landowners, right? So it is, it is interconnected and I, and, I, and, 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 and I think you're right, but I think it's about trying to identify the mechanisms and the justifications around these different uh, circuits, as it were, but to recognize that they are clearly, as you rightly point out, they are inter, inter, intertwined, uh, and they and they, and they have to be because the the volunteers, because they don't produce the income, they don't do anything, right? They, as uh, John Stuart Mills once said, they make money in their sleep. Uh, they, you know, the lender, the 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 uh, the uh, uh, the landowner uh, can sleep and do no work and yet still get monthly payments. Well, someone has to produce that income. Well, who does that? And you're quite right to point out it's the exploited class, the property loss class, the, the, the exploited asset poor, who are then get a, another bash of 
uh, uh, in this case, exploitation as opposed to uh, appropriation. So where it's a relationship between the asset owner and the and the and the, uh, the asset the asset rich and the asset poor is one of appropriation because it appropriates surplus value. It's thus created. Um, the one between the, the 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 worker and the and the and the capitalist is one well, exploitation. So I think I think I think I think we just have to be, be kind of uh, kind of. But 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 I think uh, it's 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 totally fair point that you make. And uh, I suppose well, my my only kind of and and we, and we do discuss this in, in in the conclusion of the book uh, about the moral economy. Well, what is a moral economy? Moral economy isn't just trying to understand how capitalism is justified to, um, and and uh, and and, and legitimised, but it's also trying to then say, well, what kind of a different, what kind of different, what what would be an immoral economy which serves the well-being of the populace, right? Uh, and and I'm reminded of you know Aristotle. Aristotle saw wealth as an instrument uh, for people's well-being and not merely something that uh, becomes uh, a, an end in itself. And I think, and, 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 and I know, Ilya, really, you're, you're quite familiar with this, that what also happens is that wealth becomes an end in itself rather than a means to an end. Thank you. Uh, now uh, we're coming to the end of our allotted time. Uh, however, I think, uh, uh, and, and of course, in Central Asia and further away, uh, uh, it's uh, way beyond uh, any kind of reasonable time. But given, uh, is there any, any further point people would like to make uh, or ask Balihar something? Uh, I think we can make a little bit of wiggle room <laughs> for a couple no, of no, minutes. No, no. No. I think I think I think I think people people are tired. I think I think I think this is fine. This is the, the graveyard shift, right? Where people are home. <laughs> especially especially so, especially for our colleagues uh, in, in in Central Asia who probably kind of you know, oh, no. <laughs> uh, look, looks like Nazi does have a quick question. So Nazi, please go ahead and ask. Um. Yep, we can hear you. Go yes. ahead. Thank you. You unmuted me. It was a fascinating session. Uh, all of the subjects are really uh, bringing back hope to uh, some of the ideas and discussions which uh, have not seen the light of the of the day for for many years in all um, circles. One quick question: What will happen to the questions? Because everyone has added some comments or queries, including myself, to various speakers, but obviously because of the limitation of the time, it hasn't been able, uh, it hasn't been possible to answer. Is there a way that this could be responded after the sessions in some way, uh, just to keep the dialogue going between people who are interested in certain topics? That, that was a general question. And the second question is that if you're talking about ownership, as, a, as an instrument, it is very complicated. Is it the public ownership you're talking about, private ownership? Private assets also have to be put into work in order to create some income. So those are, these are all fascinating topics. Um, and, and for that reason, it would be very good to see a way, a possibility of keeping the dialogue going on beside, you know, beyond these sessions, if, if possible. Well, on the organizational side of dialogue going, uh, there is no silver bullet uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, and, and anything we have tried and we continue to try different, you know, we have all the social media platforms, we even have a Slack channel on development we did, but they run out of steam after people have got answers to their questions <laughs> uh, and then it ends there. So the only way is that we will continue to organize events, uh, uh, seminars and talks in which these questions and, and we have a number of the people you see here, you know, up here, uh, and we add every time we organize more interest and interested parties to the to, to, to the table, and that's the only real way of going going forward. So, uh, 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 Balihar, do you have any last words uh, to add uh, there? Uh, um, no, no. I mean, uh, of course, if if if, if uh, people have uh, colleagues have a specific question which they weren't able to ask speakers, I would invite them just to email them. And then maybe record it, but I mean, it's on, 
it's not a great solution, but but, but, but that's the only one that I can I can I can I can immediately exactly exactly that's on, on only kind we can have yeah uh, yeah uh, but really just to say uh, 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 my thanks to Montu uh, for uh, for hosting uh, this uh, this workshop, but also uh, 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 my thanks to Prajati who also helped to uh, uh, arrange this and uh, do a lot of the work behind the scenes. Uh, so really, just uh, my my gratitude to 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 Montu and uh, and and Prajati. And then finally, just to my my thank to the wonderful speakers. And I do mean wonderful speakers. When I said I, uh, my 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 praise are genuine. Uh, I don't give credit easily. Um, um, and they are they are, they are well meaning. Uh, and uh, and when Monto and I we were uh, uh, thinking about the structure and who to invite, we wanted this to be a high caliber, rich workshop, uh, not the kind of usual meal. Uh, that we often get you know, on studies on Central Asia. We wanted quality over, over form, substance over form. And, and, and I really do want to thank uh, 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 the, the, the speakers here. I think some of them are here, Tomas is here, uh, Kwat, Franco, uh, Lauren has had to go, uh, Hassan uh, and, and, and uh, others uh, for, the, for the richness of, of their analysis uh, and their commitment and their willingness to give up their time the whole day for this. So thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I, I just like to share a couple, couple of thoughts as a, as a parting thing and a bit of information. Uh, the first bit of information is that that uh, I'm really happy that this this one fantastic contribution, you allowed us to record them. So now we'll have them hopefully for posterity uh, and, and continue to inform, uh, uh, you know, students and, and, and researchers alike. Uh, the second thing I would like to say uh, is that, uh, which I mentioned briefly earlier, that uh, please watch our uh, social media channels for the next meeting we're organizing. That would be in December. However, our regular seminar series uh, 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 on Fridays, uh, uh, 11 to 1 UK time, is going to kick in. Uh, uh, within two weeks uh, when the term starts and we hope that many of you can attend because it will remain uh, in some form hybrid uh, uh, for time for the time to come and, uh, and, and and the very very last thing I wanted to say is that what I really like to say from from a from my own thinking point of view that the ghost of uh, behind a lot of what we say is that the the particular na the, the development nature of the Soviet uh, um, state uh, and the, the key question that Balihar have brought up that how it's sought it was sought so passionately to minimize unearned income uh, uh, and 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 other notions around that is an important factor that we we need to keep in mind but but also the fact that how this development model which was interconnecting this huge physical space uh, its dismantling has led to specific kinds of inequalities because of production uh, went in lost value and relevance uh, uh, in very drastic senses in specific geographies. You know, we have many examples of that, like the, 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 the Tashkent aircraft plant, you know, those kind of things. Uh, of course, mono uh, industrial cities we talked about. Uh, and unless we reverse that trend, and then this is what the work we have been doing together with Chokan and many others, that unless we bring back creativity and science at the local level, which adds value, not, not adds value for some global supply chain, but adds value for, for local understanding of the value, what it means to them, we're not going to reverse that. Uh, and, and that's really where the work is needed uh, in many, many ways. So I hope we can come together to do that, that, particularly, that, that particular endeavor. So with that, um, I, I will stop talking, and I really hope to see you all again. again. So not, not like 10 years will happen with Thomas <laughs> today, but more often. So thank you. Uh, and we, we will remain connected as best as we can. Bye for now. Cheers. Bye. 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 Nice.